Welcome back, guys. It's an honor, man. I'm very, very excited uh, to have my uh, next guest on here. When I started this podcast, one of the coolest things that I never thought I'd get to do was interview some of my favorite authors. And I've had the ability to do that recently. This man right here, he's got all, almost 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. In 2013, he wrote a book called The Rational Male, which was very, very controversial and changed a lot of people's lives. There's a, a, a great debate about this book. Also, uh, Preventative Medicine, Positive Masculinity, and Religion, three following subsequent Rational Male books. In April, he just released the Player's Handbook, and he is known as the godfather of Red Pill, and we're very, very happy to have him here, Mr. Rollo Tomasi. How are you doing right, today, sir, you. man? Thank you. Thanks for having me on, man. This awesome. is great. Awesome. All right, so let's start off. So a lot of my audience might not mm -hmm. be familiar what it, with what it is that you do. Let's start off with the idea of Red Pill. When you say the godfather of mm -hmm. Red Pill, what that means, oh, going all the way gosh. back to like uh -huh. remedial. Uh, sure, yeah, about yeah. We got to go back to the fundamentals. I always, I, whenever I'm on a new show, I'm always having to like, you know, run back through the template of what I have to talk about. Um, I started writing in what would become the Manosphere, or what we call the Manosphere right now. Um, back in 2002, really, I was part of the forum community, the seduction forum communities back then. Now, was I a pickup artist? No. Was I a dating coach? No. I was just a keen observer at that time, and I was also studying psychology. I also happened to be in, uh, I was at UNR at the time, so uh, I was studying psychology, um, and uh, I was just fascinated by the... Um, uh, mystery method, and I was fascinated by the, the early pickup artists of, yeah. of the first, you know, the very like the, the the proto manosphere, proto red red pill kind of thing, and um, I, uh, I I saw a lot of uh, a lot of parallels, I think, to what I was studying in behaviorism at that time, mm. and I would have probably got more into evolutionary psychology at that at that moment uh, had it been offered at that time. Like I was, it really, it really it, wasn't. A, it, it wasn't a of, hot field at that. Isn't it one of the strangest time. things? Like forty years completely ignored. Yeah. And like really, like one of the most testable models of psychology that's ever existed. Right. And just m the majority of, of universities. I have a friend of mine. He's a he's a professor at an Ivy League school. I won't say which one because I'm going to get him in trouble. But he's like, if I talk about evolutionary psychology here, I'm going to get buried. Mm -hmm. And so that that is really interesting because behaviorism is the thing that's pushed a lot. Oh, yeah. a lot of times yeah it's and now it's I it's much more in vogue really with uh, like dr. David Buss mm -hmm. um, but these guys were quoting um, guys like uh, uh, Matt Ridley from the Red Queen of course. Uh, they were uh, quoting uh, Dawkins of course they were uh, uh, quoting a lot of the uh, the people who were doing the research at that time and you got to remember during that period during the or like the early to mid 2000s things weren't as woke as they are now so like actually doing research and studies of that nature wasn't something that was you were worried about getting funding for mm. Um, or worrying about whether or not it was going to get published in a peer-reviewed, you know, journal of some sort. Well, there's another, there's another component. Back then, it was just dudes trying to help each other. Yeah. There wasn't. Yeah. There was wasn't comparing notes. Yeah, it was just comparing notes. There wasn't a sales funnel, right? There wasn't. Right. The, there wasn't the mass email blast, mm -hmm. and there wasn't the say these seven words to fuck this stripper bullshit that mm -hmm. that that came later, like say right. post 2005. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that's what happened. Again, mm -hmm. we, when you're talking about a manosphere and we're talking about pickup, there is pickup and then there's pickup. There's pickup and then mm -hmm. there's what ended up as mm -hmm. that car crash that happened a couple of well, years there's, ago. There's what I call okay, so there's pickup and there's game. Yeah. And so, well, we'll probably discuss game yeah. a little bit. For, so, anyways, I, I'm I'm in the I'm in those forums. I'm having these conversations all the time. Um, I'm also I also happen to work in uh, uh, casino marketing at that point. Uh, later on, I would get into uh, wine and spirits and the liquor industry as as a result. So. Not only am I, you know, going to these forums and having these conversations, like you said, comparing notes with guys all over the world. It's the first time in history that men were able to get together semi-anonymously and be able to say, here's what's happening in South Africa. Here's what's happening in Mumbai. Here's what's happening in, you know, Paducah, Kentucky, right? Here's what's going on. And so, of course, guys being guys, they're like, okay, well, let's compare notes and see, you know, what, what are some consistencies here? Um, and... So the conversations that were going on in the, in the seduction community at that time were actually, I, I consider it the earliest research for like intersexual dynamics sure. because they were doing, they were field testing ideas and theories that you couldn't do in a laboratory and you sure as shit couldn't get it from, um, you know, get, uh, you know, research people to do the kinds of, you know, to go out and run game that, because it was unethical for them to do that. Yeah. So, um, so I was in that, that community from uh, 2002 until about 2011, and that's when I started my blog, The Rational Mail. And everybody said, you need to turn this into a blog. We, need you. we really need your voice out there. And so I became one of the, the first three R's of the Manosphere, which was uh, Rolo, Roycey, and Roosh. Mm -hmm. And um, both of those, I'm the last remaining R, I guess, of the, of the Manosphere now. But um, 
the that's when the blog years started yeah so we went from forums to blogs and that's when things the social media started to ramp up and that's when you start seeing all of these courses and knowledge products and it was no longer a dvd and a seminar it was take my teachable course and so right. it sort of scaled up was, from there it was a dude who spent 17 hours with mystery started a course like a week later yeah and then all of a sudden he's teaching this shit and yeah, like exactly. and i meet the guy and i'm scared as shit when i'm talking to him like who who is this dude mm, yes. yeah it was back it then. draws a certain and, element and the other thing let me say something Mm -hmm. about when, when back in 05 and I've never been a pickup coach but I, I'd met a lot of these guys living in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and I just remember I remember being like these guys don't hate women they don't no, hate women there are dudes in this community who do hate women mm -hmm. but that this at this point this was it's not what's going on a fraction of one percent I would I yeah. would say from my experience yes yeah. so uh so anyway so there, then there's the blog years so yeah. now we're in 2011 up to about 2013 and uh, I had so many people asking me to put all of these essays into some sort of like compendium some some kind of book and then I went through the process of going back through, okay, if I was going to write a book, only one book ever, what would it look like? And mm. so I went through all of my backlog of, of essays and all the conversations I'd had for really up to that point, about 10 or 12 years. And I'm like, okay, this will go, this will go, this will go. And then in 2013, I published The Rational Mail, which was based on the essays and the conversations that we had over the course of about 12 years. And then... I had to become an author like overnight because I had to actually turn essays and blog posts and, and what really amounted to uh, forum posts uh, into something that's intelligible in a, in, a, in a book form. And so I put that out there. I thought that The Rational Mail was going to be the only book I would ever write. So yes, I know that the print in the print book is very small. I thought I would cram as much crap into it as I possibly could back in 2013 because I thought that that was the only I was going to shoot my load on that one, one book. Well, turns out that that ended up becoming the Bible of the Manosphere, what the red pill is right now, and that's the it's what everybody refers back to. Um, if you look at guys like Kevin Samuels, if you look at guys like uh, like Andrew Tate, if you even even uh, Justin, uh, pretty much anybody who's been Myron from, from Fresh and Fit, yeah, uh, it's either you know quoting out of that book or it's a derivative of that or it's constant. I'm not saying that they haven't taken it and, and built upon that. Yeah. They have because that's what we do as human beings, right? But it's uh, that's what that was the starting point was right there. And so then I I produced a. Uh, preventive medicine, which was a timeline for what men can expect from women throughout their, you know, their yeah. lives and stuff through phases of maturity. Um, simply because I had so many guys come to me and say, Rolo, we really need a book because I, I wish I would have known then what I know now. So I wouldn't have made those stupid mistakes back in the day. And so that's what's prompted. I, I really think preventive medicine is kind of like the sleeper hit of the, of all five of them. Uh, and then I did positive masculinity because I had people asking me, um, I've got kids, I've got sons, I don't want them to fall into the same pitfalls that uh, I did. Uh, when's the best time to uh, introduce my, you know, my 12-year-old, 15-year-old, 18-year-old son to the rational male? Okay, well, slow down. Um, so then I wrote P Positive Masculinity, which was really like the first two thirds of that book is about red pill parenting, mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better term, you know, like in, you know, in, in understanding intersexual dynamics and understanding the social nature. And, and, and then so it scaled up from there. Religion was for guys who prompted me to reconsider, like thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm a Muslim. I am a, 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 an evangelical Christian. I don't believe in premarital sex. Everything I read in the rational mail is 100% true, but how do I apply that or how do I sort of process that as a person who has religious convictions and I'm not going to have sex before marriage? Okay, that's what's prompted the very first part of the, the religion side of things, and then it snowballed from there into what religion is. And then, most recently, I did the player's handbook because I had so... I took three years, by the way, to write religion because I had to be bulletproof of course. in everything I did in that. It is the most sources-cited book I've ever done, and so I had to be absolutely just dead nuts accurate on that one. And then, right about the time that I published that, they're like, well, uh, what's the best book on game? <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like, oh God. And so I, and I didn't have an answer except for maybe like some of the guys that I know, like uh, Troy Francis or James Tusk or some of the people that I are sort of run in my peer group. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, but there's not really a textbook for like understanding the principles behind you, why a neg hit is a thing. Do you know why what? is the, why do these things work from a psychological yeah. perspective? So it's a, it's not a, it's not a how to do it. It's why those things work kind of book. So one of the best books I've ever read on game is called how to win friends and influence people. Mm -hmm. I love that book. That book is, I, 
actually helped it's me. Napoleon so much. Hill, right? Is that? Uh, no, um, that's that's uh, Think and Grow Rich. That, okay. That's another. That's another great one. Mm -hmm. How to Win Friends Influence People by Dale Carnegie. 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 Yeah, that that's mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. parts in there uh, about because I I do believe like your ba your ability with intersexual intersexual dynamics, it does relate very much to mm -hmm. my ability as a businessman, oh, my yeah. ability to network in general, my mm -hmm. ability to show status because status is status is status, and that's one thing. Mm -hmm. It's like it's not just one thing I've noticed is that it's not just the women who notice the status; it's the men too, mm -hmm. and so that's uh, it's just a really interesting uh, dichotomy when I read that book and just related it to my life and, and mm -hmm. changed a bunch of things. Well, it's I and that's you've just made a really good definition, I think, or a good illustration, I think, of the difference between PUA, pickup artistry, yeah. and game. Mm. So in uh, if you read the, the very first introduction of uh, the player's handbook, I, m I mentioned this, that everyone has game. Everyone you know has game. Sure. That nine-year-old kid in, you know, in grammar school has game. If you go and ask Johnny, Johnny, what's, Johnny, what's the best uh, way to get uh, Susie to like you? He has a very complex comprehensive like idea of like you know carry her books home for you treat her rights you know respect i respect women you'll hear nine-year-old boys say i respect women because their moms or single moms yeah. told them that right they have a concept of what how to go from single and sexless to being like you know to becoming intimate with a woman kind of thing now not at nine years old it's yeah. like how do i be nice and how do i get her to like me whereas um, everybody has a certain degree of game. How effective that game is of is course. really where we have to draw the line well, because it's based on like bad data. Think about the statement though that it makes that from an evolutionary standpoint that every guy you know has a theory about something. Yes. Like, every guy I know does not have a theory about making a co chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. Every guy I know does not have a theory about how to kick a soccer ball, but every guy I know, <laughs> how every to single <laughs> one, men that have no experience <laughs> with women whatsoever, mm -hmm. every one of them has, he can tell me a dot, just in, in, 15 paragraphs on exactly how to get women and mm -hmm. it's just very interesting whether or not it works or not the fact that we all seem to as a human as mm -hmm. a species yes. it seems to be a it's ubiquitous an thing it's you an exa existential imperative for sure it's a, it must be an imperative if as a species it's mm -hmm. so ubiquitous amongst men and here's another thing that i thought was really funny uh so my my course men of action mm -hmm. Um, we just talk about you know improvement, and there's a few women in my course, but it's mostly men. Mm -hmm. And in the course, one of the things that I noticed, I was looking at the other day, and I had the like the, I was on Zoom, and I could see 50 people at once, mm -hmm. and the diversity, like the Indian men, the Chinese men, the, like there was no there was no necessity on my part to make my course diverse. It is the most diverse group of people I've mm -hmm. ever been around because yeah. this is ubiquitous right. amongst. 23 chromosome homo sapiens. <laughs> this is ubiquitous yeah. amongst us. Uh -huh. This is not a thing. This is not, but for any of you believe this, this is not a cultural fucking phenomenon. My heterosexuality is not cultural. My belief, my desire to date women is not cultural. It is mm -hmm. fucking genetic. It is and not that, a social construct. It is not a social construct. It is something that, and it can't be, again, we had Jen, Jen Rufo on here a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Huge controversy. Some of the stuff she said, yeah. like, like evolve <laughs> and just learn to be cucked. And I was like, and I was just <laughs> trying to explain to Jen is like you because because it's really funny Jen likes to she's a swinger mm -hmm. and she she's but she's not bisexual she does not like having sex with women she likes having sex with multiple men at the same time and I was like so you don't want to have sex with women right it's like you understand mm -hmm. you were born like this mm -hmm. just like I was born heterosexual so you can't tell me that I'm gonna evolve right. to enjoy Into and then, and then my second mm -hmm. part, part was from an evolutionary standpoint how would it make sense for me as a caveman to watch my my woman be with some other dude. Mm -hmm. From a genetic standpoint, this is suicide, mm -hmm. right? And then from her standpoint, it's like, no, we can evolve. And I'm like, we, if there is what is and what ought. We can't evolve. Again, once, <laughs> once Homo sapiens become the apex predator, the selection pressure is over. That's mm -hmm. why people with, thank God for it, type two diabetes can live. Mm -hmm. That's why we have people with motor neuron disorder who can, who can end up having children. Mm -hmm. That's why you know the trope about the woman who's overweight who lives in the trailer park has 17 kids. It is not a function of like things that would have killed her in an ancestral environment mm -hmm. don't kill her anymore. And they don't exist. It, it, right. Mm -hmm. So when people are like, are we smarter or dumber? We're both. There's eight billion of us. There's eight billion humans and 400,000 elephants on the fucking planet. We won. So mm -hmm. for, there is no selection pressure, which is why Idiocracy, you remember the movie? Yes. I, we, as yes. we move closer and closer to this mm -hmm. like average, where mm -hmm. the average becomes dumber and dumber, of course, because why would humans have a necessity to get smarter or stronger or in better shape mm -hmm. or better financially if there's no selection pressure to do so? Right. You don't die if you're poor. You can still have fucking kids and live below poverty. So mm -hmm. of course there's no selection pressure. So that's the reason why I, I wouldn't, I, I'm sorry yeah. to get way no, off no, topic. No, 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 that's socio fine. No, it's like, you see, this is why I wanted yeah. to yeah. come on here. This is like a socioeconomic commentary, but people are always like, how can we evolve? 
evolve. No, there is, this is a real controversial statement. There is no more evolution for homo mm -hmm. sapiens. There's no more, as far as, as far as natural selection is concerned, because selection is over. Mm -hmm. You will have children with whoever you want. You can mm -hmm. live to be a hundred and have multiple, multiple medical disorders that mm -hmm. would have killed you not even a hundred years ago. Even uh, the very fact that you brush your teeth increases your life. Of course, dude, how about the fact that dental, dental health, has has contributed to to yeah. lifespan, you know, like something as simple as a freaking toothbrush, right? Yeah. Like that that contributes. There's there's so many factors that go into that. Yeah. Um, what you just described to me is something I actually uh, I, I think I started out in the introduction of um, of religion, where I said we're at a point right now in really kind of with the rise of social media, but I kind of peg it right around the year two thousand when the rise of the internet and we had this uh, interconnect connectivity where we can be on YouTube and we can you know broadcast to God knows how many people or we can talk to more and more people like in a global sense um, so we're we're disseminating these ideas and we're disseminating memes and we're disse and I don't mean like memes like the cute cat videos I mean like you know like ideas you know um, people don't know a, that's what memes an, mean yeah exactly they don't even know that's what I know memes they don't mean. know what memetics are <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the, the very fact that we can broadcast ideas now on a global scale is we've never been able to do that in in human history right and so the what I the way I, I I looked at it now is all of the things that were prior to like the 20th century like way of thinking the old order way of thinking versus like 21st century what we're seeing now is because we have access to all this new information we can like a guy like me I don't have a degree in, in evolutionary biology I have a degree in I have a bachelor's of fine arts and I have a a, a bachelor's of um, uh, behavioral psychology that's yeah. it okay so. I can, but I can still have access to all of the research data of Marty Hazelton, of, of uh, David Buss, of uh, gangs. I mean, all the people who I quote or who I'm, I'm using as sort of influences for like connecting dots. Mm. Everybody can do that. Anyone online can do exactly what I've done. It's just, you have to have the interest and you have to be, the, I'm, I'm just good at articulating it. I'm good at connecting those dots there. But what's happening now is we have this old order um, belief set or these old order memes that were founded on dead ideas sure. that were that were based on bad information or no information. Or, so or, it's or information that was relevant during a, a time period right. when we had sort of a, sort of like again the idea of of one to one monogamy. When I live on a right. farm and I, my survival is dependent on my family, some of those rules made sense. Go hunt, kill, or you're not going to eat. Or, or or have multiple children with this woman and stay together no matter what. Fucking stay together no matter what. Mm -hmm. Or th those kind of things they made sense back then, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we. And then again, using religion in order as the basis for our monogamy. Of course, we have to say things like soulmate and right. believe those things that you say. Mm -hmm. I think. There was a point, like for instance, like feudalism. That doesn't make sense now. We'd be like, feudalism, mm -hmm. that's incredibly... Uh, Although that's, neo feudalism yeah. is becoming right. a thing now. But we we but say no. that's cruel to mm -hmm. have a monarch and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But back then, we didn't have the internet. You had to have some centralized form right. of control. So what I'm saying is, uh, well, I agree with you. The, we didn't have antibiotics back then. Survival was very difficult. So I do think that some of these ideas are outdated. I don't know if they were right. wrong back at the time, but they're definitely outdated. They but, need to be updated, if exactly. nothing else. Be so, updated. I was gonna, So what I was saying is that we have we have four generations. We got the Boomer generation, Gen X. We've got uh, millennials, and we've got the uh, Zoomers now, the Gen Z, right? <laughs> um, so, so from about four generations long, we have generations who have been sort of in the 20th century versus the, in the 21st century. So, in the 21st century, we have access to data and education, and, and uh, you know, just a research and everything that really conflict with the old order way of things, how we think like mm. men and women ought to get together, how we ought to do politics, how we ought to do religion. I mean, just think of any theater of human, of human endeavor. Now we can go, well, is that really right? And now we're having this conversation on a global scale that we're not ready for as human beings. Like that's of why course, people yeah. hate each other because they either hate Trump or they like, you know, Hillary or some shit like that. They, I mean, like people, family members hate each other because of Facebook yeah. or, you know, Twitter. Well, so you said this, I can't believe you. Well, it's because of that access to this new access to data. Now, in no other arena, when you were just uh, um, bringing this up, in no other arena are we more invested than in reproduction. Yes, we want to. Guys want to get laid. Surprise, ladies. Guys actually want to get laid. And so how are we going to do that? I have access to all this new information. I've got this form right here. We can compare notes. What about this? What about that? How about we go out and we field test this stuff? And so what you're seeing, I think anyways, is you're seeing this old emotionalism and this old emotional investment in the way we think things ought to be, they mm. should be, 
versus how things are. Yeah. And so in every goddamn debate I've ever been in with Ruslan or whoever else, you know, the one thing I try to stick to is the fact that I don't deal in shoulds, I deal in is. is yeah. You get to deal with whatever the shoulds are. You can decide what's the best practices for you. But when you say something like, um, uh, you know, we need to evolve past our, uh, our, our jealousy instinct and we need to eroticize our jealousy instints so we can be cucked or we can yeah. uh, have a, you know, these we're promiscuous animals. And like, I don't know what, what her name was, but yeah. like you will, we'll make up these like really emotionally invested, like rationales as to why this really ought to be. And you go, no, when you go and you look at the data and you can see that in, in societies where there is like poly polyamory, poly sure. polygamy, there's way more violence in those societies. So yeah. I've got the data here that kind of confounds that. But yeah. if you're really emotionally invested to the point where it's part of your personality, you're, that's when you get those real online conflicts. Listen, that, that may be right for you. If you believe that as, as far as the cuckolding thing, mm -hmm. that, that may be right for you. But the point is, like what you said before, I, I'll give a great example. The thing that you talk about where sexual market value peak for women being at 23 and for men being around mm -hmm. 38, that's not, I, I had heard that from you, but I'd also read Dataclism. Dataclism yeah. talks yes. and shows irrefutable, <laughs> unassailable proof that what you said mm -hmm. is true, separate to that. So if you have a problem with this idea, when mm -hmm. women are 29 and they hear that, what we, uh, Rollo Tomasi said that it was 23 years old when you're at your, or 23 to 25, and my, my whole thing is like, no, you're not arguing with Rollo Tomasi, you're arguing with statistics. Mm -hmm. that, that If you're offended by that, you're offended by the truth. And if the mm -hmm. truth is ugly to you, then it's ugly. If I'm an oncologist and I study cancer, that doesn't mean I condone cancer. Cancer. It doesn't mean I don't condone cancer. Mm -hmm. I deal with the fact that it is the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the ugly truths. That whole situation. Can we I, I get that all the Go time. Ahead. Like I get that from like guys like Chris Williamson and some of these other dudes who would, they, I don't know, if maybe I've got a fan club or something on, on their channel, but they constantly try to get me on with Chris Williamson. And Chris has been on his show and he's, you know, he's interviewed guys like David Buss. He's interviewed guys like, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson and everything. And I'm there essentially delivering the same kind of information from the same research that they're quoting from. Yeah. But it's cool if they're on, it's not cool if Rolo's on because Rolo yeah. seems like he's going to connect the dots in a way that's going to alienate 50% of his audience. Right. And I, it's just, it's basically who's good, who's the messenger right now? So when Tate goes and delivers the same kind of message that I do, you know, he's, it blows up the internet. It's, it's still the same information. It's not the delivery, it's the actual data that you can't process because it conflicts with your ego investment. You want to know something funny about Andrew? So, uh, so okay, I, we're gonna talk about Andrew. Uh, now. Hold on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I host that bikini competition, right? Mm. And so, I would tell girls, I'd be like, they, the conversation would turn to Andrew Tate. I was like, you guys know I know Andrew. Like, we've been because we were texting way before he <laughs> before he was famous. Uh -huh, uh -huh, we were going back uh -huh. and forth because we were going to plan out him coming on a podcast. And we text back and forth like, oh, you don't know Andrew. And the same girls who'd be like, I hate Andrew, would be like, can we send him a message? Yes. It was so funny. He's like, can do you have his? Him? Do you have? Mm -hmm. you, I hate Andrew Tate. Do you have his number? Do you, can I can I call him real mm -hmm. quick? Uh, you can ask Andrew. I, I would send him these messages. Be me and these girls, and the girls would be like asking him questions. It is really funny how that whole that whole uh, dynamic works. We'll, we'll get to Andrew mm -hmm. here in a little bit, but I do want to talk about this uh, central tenet. Okay, mm -hmm. the tenet of hypergamy, mm -hmm. and that statement by Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, about date. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, and lean in. Yeah, lean in. Oh, man, yeah. you have read my. Yeah. Thank you for reading my yeah. book. Son of a bitch. Somebody's sure. actually read my book. For sure. I, I personally, it's very little, very little that offends me. That mm -hmm. statement that she made was offensive to me. Mm -hmm. The idea that I am supposed to like. You are, as a woman, supposed to sow your wild oats, go have mm -hmm. fun with the bartender and the male stripper, and then, which is fine, do I that if you want. Up, yeah. But then at the end, I'm supposed to wait for you. Oh, at, yeah. When you're when you're <laughs> done with the male stripper, mm -hmm. my job as as your later on male, your boyfriend, your husband, or whatever mm -hmm. your provider is, I'm supposed to wait for you to be done with the male stripper, yeah. and then. Thank you. It's my turn now. Mm -hmm. And as a man choosing, the, again, that's why I think David Allen Curry chose the, the title, The Beta Male Revolution. That's what mm -hmm. he was talking about. Mm -hmm. As a man, I, I don't want to wait for you to be done with the male stripper. Mm -hmm. I would rather be with someone who didn't choose the male stripper in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's what, um, gosh, there's so much that goes along with that. There's a, you, you have to throw in the uh, alpha widow dynamic for into sure. that. And you also have to throw in the war brides dynamic into that as well. Yes. And those, of course, are in the first book. As, uh, but uh, no, uh, you, what, you're, uh, what, you're, uh, what you're referencing is the Ross and Rachel uh, gambit. <laughs> And if you ever watched that episode of Friends where Ross and Rachel are breaking up because Rachel says, oh, Ross, you're the perfect boyfriend, just not now. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know, in their early 20s, I guess we're supposed to presume that. Yeah. But let's make, it, let's make a deal. 
if we're 30 and we're both single, then we'll get married when we're, you know, yeah. and we haven't found anybody else. We'll, you know, you'll be my consolation prize. Yeah. And the laugh track explodes. And yeah. if you watch Friends with a Red Pill Lens in 2022, it's like a horror show. And you're seeing all of these things happen. And remember what I said is in the 20th century or the old order way of thinking. We laughed. That was that was a hit show. That was sure. funny as hell. You know, it's, you know, Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer going yeah. at it. Right. Um, but now we look at that and we go, oh, my God, you know, wh what guy would sign up for 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 essentially his own cucking? Right. Yeah. That, 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 I mean, in logistically cucking. Right. Yeah. And it, it was funny then because we were get, just sort of getting a ramping up into this idea that uh, women needed to have a hoe phase. Right. Yeah. Not my words. I said party fa yeah. party years in my my book. But it's the hoe phase where it's like you're going to go and explore your options and have your journey of self-discovery. And then right around 29 years old, 30, 31, that's what I peg as the epiphany phase. And that's when women want to get right with God. And that's when they want to like settle down and they want to have, you know, uh, two, 2.5 kids and a golden retriever in the yard. And that's when you'll hear women say, we're all the good guys. We're all the nice guys. But they were left back in your 20s when you didn't want to sort of put a bet on a guy who had some potential. And now yeah. you're kind of ass out at 33, 34 um, as far as your selection is concerned. Meanwhile, men at about 30 are on their ascent to their sexual market value peak because it takes longer for a man to achieve the things that makes him maximally attractive and maximally arousing. So the guy might have, if he's played his cards right and he's maximized his potential, by the time he gets to about 36 years old, that's when he is the at his peak sexual market value and has, if he's done, every, done everything right, you know, money, muscles, and game, he has the same selection, or if not better selection, than the girl who's 23 years old who was on top of her game. Can, and then can you talk about, so supply and demand curve, can you talk mm -hmm. about as a woman, you believe as a woman comes to that realization mm -hmm. and a man is becoming more and more attractive, this is where the supply and demand curve hit, and around 29 mm -hmm. is when you see most first marriages. Yes, it's uh, exactly. And so if you look at the uh, age of first marriage in the United States, and even in like the UK and, and Western European countries, it's even later than that. Uh, we are delaying marriage like further and further into our 30s. Mm. Women, uh, I think it's like 50% of women in the UK are have, uh, aren't are having a kid until after 30 years old, mm. which is net, like they track these things. Again, we have access to that data. A schmuck like me can go and figure out what that data is. I don't have yeah. to be a demographer to do that. Yeah. But So I can quote those stats. But when you look at um, uh, divorce rates, when you look at marriage rates, when you look at uh, fertility rates, uh, everything is sort of this downstream effect of this idea that, well, um, I'm going to play the field a little bit longer. I'm going to wait for the one. I'm going to wait for, you know, for women anyways. It's like, yeah. it's not about your career. It's about you can't, you, you're spoiled for choice, right? It's the, it's the choice paradox. In a global sexual marketplace, women ha believe, the perception believe that they have more choice than they actually do. So I, I think you got, you covered this with Justin at some point. I, I, I talk about in my books the difference between, say, the local sexual marketplace and mm. the global sexual sure, marketplace. Yeah. Everything is globalizing. Uh, currencies are globalizing. Uh, you know, at, nations are becoming a little, you know, the national lines are becoming less bur blurred. We have an international economy. Everything's becoming globalized. Uh, why wouldn't the sexual marketplace be globalized as well? So when we look at how we used to date back in the day before we had the Internet, before we had um, cell phones, you, women were sort of, um, you know, stuck with whatever their local sexual marketplace was in whatever town they happened to be born in, whatever high school they went to, whatever college they went to. And that was their, their you know, most immediate circle of local people that they had to select from as a pool of suitors. And that was that. Now, every woman has Instagram. Every woman has access to uh, Tinder, Hinge, Bumble, uh, seeking arrangements. If you can't find your soulmate in you know, uh, you know, Reno, Nevada, then you, maybe you can find that guy in, you know, Dubai. Maybe you can find him in, you know, Tokyo. Uh, so I have a term for this. It's called the Judge Avon Sothi effect. There's a girl mm -hmm. that I grew up that was uh, in the military. Her name was Judge Avon Sothi. She was from Wichita, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are on Instagram, you might know who Jojo is. Jojo and I were friends when she was 19. Nobody knew who she was. When she was 19, she was working at Hooters in Wichita. Then one day, she gets called out to go to Los Angeles, and she mm -hmm. blows up. She ends up in a, a, in a bunch of magazines. Uh, this European magazine publishes her. She is the first woman I know to hit a million followers on Instagram. This is a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Jojo Von 
Softy was supposed to, like destined, if this was 1985, to marry the guy who owns the car dealership in Wichita or to marry the doctor or the dentist mm -hmm. in Wichita. Instead, she's at Bolzarian's house with me, literally standing between Machine Gun Kelly and fucking mm -hmm. Logan Paul, and her and I are looking around like, holy shit, look at this life that we created Where for ourselves. Where are we at, yeah. She was, there is no middle class anymore. The JoJo Von Sothys are now sucked out of Wichita or mm -hmm. Des Moines or wherever, and they're, yep. they're at the Playboy Mansion. That was the thing that, that, that changed the whole dynamic is that all of a sudden everyone is discovered now. Everyone mm -hmm. has access. And these men who are despots, there's no limit. Like there's no point where it's like, you know what? I've fucked enough women. I'm going to stop messaging hot girls on IG. It never stops. No. It never, there is, no, there is always room on their roster for more. Right. Always. Right. And you just see, like I remember sitting next to a girl and seeing a message from Champagne Pop fucking Drake to next to her and I was like god damn dude Drake like Drake bro it doesn't matter mm -hmm. and she didn't go off with him but I just remember thinking Drake fucking Drake I gotta yeah. deal with Drake bro this is fucked <laughs> this up this is your competition this is my competition <laughs> bro what the fuck am I yeah. like this is crazy right yeah have you and let me let me say one other thing um I have some of the f most fun nights of my life in hot tubs mm -hmm. in fucking Jamaica and Mexico with some of the wildest women. Shout out to Mike Tang. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Mike <laughs> Tang. Is that Paradise yeah, yeah. Challenge? Paradise Challenge. Uh, <laughs> some of the wildest women I've ever met in my life. And I love them as friends. And I don't judge them for their behavior. But I also know I don't want to marry them. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is the thing. Like, every for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. I know that because I host two of the biggest bikini competitions in the world, there's a lot of women who don't want to date me. Mm. I understand there's a, there's a consequence for my behavior. Mm. Well, for, for some women, they're like, well, you know, I did all this wild stuff and I did porn and I shoot guy, girl, OF mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff and I have a bunch of money and I don't judge you for doing that. But when later on you have trouble finding someone who wants to marry you, please understand these things are correlated. Damn and I'm not, effects. I don't hate you and I'm not judging you, but I am telling you, this is going to be a difficult thing mm -hmm. that you're going to have to deal with. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Just like mm -hmm. if I take steroids my whole life mm -hmm. and all of a sudden my liver and kidney failed, it's not, I don't blame the doctor. It was mm -hmm. my fault for doing right. this, right? right. Go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is uh, that's, a, that's a conversation we've had. I actually, I think I did a whole episode with uh, Myron and Fresh about uh, female promiscuity and why your uh, sexual past matters. Even more so in the digital age, mm. because every every one of us, I can't just point this out at women as well. Every one of us has a digital footprint. So, ladies, what's your digital footprint? Is it OnlyFans? Is it amateur porn? Is it uh, you know? Is is it like uh, catfishing guys on in Instagram? Is it just like you doing like yacht parties that you put on your your Instagram that your potential you know new husband is going to have to consider when he's like really trying to figure out whether or not he wants to get with you or not. And so there's this digital footprint and there's downstream effects from that, that I don't think we're, again, we're in this, we're in the new frontier, man. It's the wild fucking West here. And so when you point out and you say, ladies, there's going to be results, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be, you know, uh, but, but accountability. But, but they're, not, for Mike, they're not Rolo's they don't, consequences. They don't want it to be. They want not, to blame it on you. Yes. They want to say you're insecure for pointing that out yes. to me over and over and over again. When in fact it's true, but the fact that you, you are even like have a question about it makes you an insecure could, man. Could you imagine pushing someone Shut off? Shut up, please. Could you could yeah. you could you imagine pushing someone off of a balcony and then charging Isaac Newton with murder? Like that's that's <laughs> essentially that's essentially what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you this is gravity. That's essentially your there's mm -hmm. a physical a reaction that's gonna happen. Have you seen <laughs> the Netflix show mm -hmm. uh, Sex Life? Have yes. you heard about this? Yeah, yeah. I, How, did, I did a full episode on I was, it when it first came I out. I was stunned they even mm -hmm. made that show, and the mm -hmm. ending of it was like, holy fuck. Fuck! Yeah, how how did we They're get a, in your face? With this? Just right in your face. Like, right there. I love mm -hmm. my husband. Where's that man with the big dick? I'm gonna go fuck him at the mm -hmm. end of the movie. This is not gonna change anything about my marriage. Now fuck me. Wait, That's what he says at the, the end of the, the movie. Last the last line. Bro, of that movie, bro, yes. this shit was crazy. What did you think about that? All? <laughs> I I think well, <laughs> I got a copyright strike for putting that on really? my channel. Actually, yes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it's it's what I, I I refer to as open hypergamy. And yeah. I picked the, I picked up on this right around 2014 with uh, the Sheryl Sandberg yeah. uh, quote uh, where I, I I call it Sandbergian hypergamy. But it, what it is is it's this open embrace embracing of women's evolved sexual strategy, mating strategy, which is hypergamy, alpha fucks, beta bucks. They're looking for the best of the best, but they also have to remember it's dual. So they're looking for the hot guy in the foam cannon party. They're looking for the guy who is like, who's built and looks like Jason Momoa, who they really want to fuck. But that guy's not always the dude who is uh, good at protection, provisioning, and parental investment. So it's the classic cads versus dads. And so that's the, that's the, the natural, you know, way of things. Now, again, in the 
20th century, women, it was in their best interests to keep that hush hush so that men, w so that they could have more selection. So if it didn't work out with Ross, maybe she could go bang Joey, right? Yeah. That was the, that was the sort of, you know, okay, ladies, keep it down. So when we used to call like gold diggers, gold diggers, gold diggers are just like, it's like all women are opportunistic in their mating strategies. The gold diggers are just the ones that were like open and overt about it. Mm -hmm. They were just the ones who said, you know what? It is what it is. I want to get with a rich guy. And that's how, that's who I am. The reason why even women hate gold diggers is because they're giving up the game. They're giving up the now, game. Now in 2014, no one cares about yeah. giving up the game. In fact, it's, <laughs> in fact, I hope you have a good hoe face. We got, uh, you know, uh, shit. We got, uh, what Cardi B talking about, you know, you know, getting what you can get and, and, and essentially talking and, and popularizing and popular media uh what amounts to hypergamy and guys if you have a problem with that you're an insecure dude I mean, and you're not high value enough to fuck a, a girl like, like me it, it's just like I, I again i like cardi b i like her music but she says fuck them then i get the money and first off cardi b you got it backwards you get the money first you don't fuck them mm -hmm. anyway but the the whole thing was like when you hear that and she's like joking about yeah when i was a stripper i used to drug my clients I roll and, my clients and roll yes. my <laughs> clients and then rob them and it was like yeah cardi b women empowerment and i was confused bro by the way i'm also confused when i see machine gun kelly dre wearing pink dresses mm -hmm. dating megan fox i know a lot of dudes who want to date Megan Fox what is the lesson I'm supposed to take out of the pink dresses and mm -hmm. the hair that he like I don't I don't know if Machine Gun Kelly's homosexual or not what I do know is that he wants us to think he is so I don't mm -hmm. know what the fuck to think about this and mm -hmm. I'm very and it's very confusing for me yeah, he's a dandy That's but, why. Th there you go but I will tell you this Roland 25 years I've been dating for 20 I'm 45 years old mm -hmm. I, in 25 years I have never had an easier time dating more beautiful women than at this this point in my mm -hmm. life and it might be because I'm in Las Vegas and it might be because I have a you know pretty cool podcast but I really do and think everybody in the chat's gonna say he's jacked he's <laughs> a natural <laughs> fuck this guy <laughs> but, uh, but but I actually think it has more to do with my competition which I don't feel like I have any when I mm -hmm. talk to because I do have a lot of female friends we're gonna get into that d discussion and mm -hmm. I, I'm always asking them like why did you like this dude? What, what caused you? How long was it before you met this guy and you slept with him? Mm -hmm. I'm always asking mm -hmm. these academic questions of these women. And when I do, I listen to them and I just realize, I just see men qualifying themselves. I see men doing these things that are clearly wrong. And it's just very interesting to me. I feel like I have no competition now. Like mm -hmm. I actually, like the, the, the female imperative order that you were talking mm -hmm. about before, I have found it personally, selfishly, mm -hmm. to be an advantage for me. Yeah, you can right? leverage it. Yeah, I have found it yeah. self For selfishly. guys who can leverage it and guys have the knowledge of the sexual marketplace and have a good understanding of male nature, with female nature, and intersexual dynamics, man, it's, it's never been a better time. Yeah. Especially now in the, in, in the internet. And if, if there, even if there's something you don't know, you can go and get the information Bro, and figure it it's out. It's the truth. Can and I you talk can network like hell now too. Like you couldn't, again, even mm. that gets globalized. I would never have, have been on this show or even known you had I not known Justin, Justin sure. Waller. Yeah. Had I not known Fresh and Fit, had I not known, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, had I not known, you know, I wouldn't even be talking to Miguel over here. And, it's a, it's <laughs> incredible. Know. So, yeah, one of Andrew's people reaches out to me. Then me and Andrew start t texting. And then Andrew recommends I have Justin on. Mm -hmm. Then Justin comes on and then recommends you. And then Fre mm -hmm. uh, Walter from Fresh and Fit, mm -hmm. he messages me to come on there. So mm -hmm. you're right. It's the globalization, Definitely. the way to connect it. And I learned that from a guy named Dan Fleischman. I don't know if you know Dan is. I'm, I'm introduce you to him. Sounds at some point. familiar. Dan though. Fleischman is like he he pays. He, he has a company where he gets brand deals for influencers. So those mm -hmm. girls, when, you know, when they make 300 grand a month or mm -hmm. whatever, like a lot of them are coming from brand deals. He's the one who sets up those brand deals. So his parties mm -hmm. are insane. Mm -hmm. It's every big IG girl you can ever imagine. And they're all there just lined up. It's pretty, pretty mm -hmm. amazing. You know, you know, real quick, just yeah. real quick, because I'm also live casting yeah. this to my stream. Like, can you like introduce to my audience, like what it is you do? Because okay. I'm, I'm sure people are like, who the yeah. fuck is this dude? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, so uh, for me, the, the, probably the thing I'm, I'm most known for is I, I host for like, like the last 10 years I've hosted uh, the Maxim parties, I'm the red carpet host for the mm -hmm. Maxim parties, for the Babes in Toyland charity events. I'm also the host for Smash Global. I'm also the host for the Model Citizen Fund. But, mm -hmm. I, but the, may, the other thing is that I host the, big, the two biggest bikini competitions in the world, which is the Playboy Presents Yandy Summer Search and Swimsuit USA. I also host uh, Miss Brazil USA, and then I used to host a rehab bikini invitational with Crystal Hefner, Hugh Hefner's wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I hosted uh, the Dre Swimsuit Showcase. So basically what I, I am a recruiter for bikini competitions and pageants, and I'm also mm -hmm. the host. I also, I work at a hedge fund. I was a military officer for seven years. I flew a yeah. KC-135. Mm -hmm. I, I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I started about uh, 
I've been coaching for 14 years. Mm -hmm. I started a professional program two years ago called the Men of Action Mentoring Program. Mm -hmm. And it was, for me, it was like, I didn't want to teach a pickup course because it was, really wasn't, I, I don't really believe in pickup. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted was, how can I make these men the most attractive versions of themselves? Mm -hmm. And how can I teach them the leadership qualities that Jocko Willett and, and mm -hmm. David Goggins talk about? And, the, the, and then also the entrepreneurship mm -hmm. section. So my Men of Action Program is social networking, entrepreneurship, leadership, and mindset. And then we also go heavy into evolutionary psychology Mm -hmm. Which one of the funny things is when I had Bolzerian on here. That's why I like what you do. Yeah, exactly. You stay, you stay, you stay based and grounded in like sure. nuts and bolts. For sure. When I had Bolzerian on mm -hmm. here, it's really interesting because his book, the setup, I use it in my course because mm -hmm. I agree with everything he said. And it was funny because we never had a discussion about any of this, especially like you know, meet as many women as you can. Don't hit on any of them. Don't hit mm -hmm. on any of them. Again, women are attracted to you because of your status, not because of your intent. And it was very difficult for a lot of guys because pickup teaches intent. They mm -hmm. don't teach status. Mm -hmm. They say stay in your mom's basement and a woman into sleeping with you whereas the status studies mm -hmm. uh the like true social but by the way pickup artists say they coach social circle i mm -hmm. don't know any pickup artists who really I can do only social think circle. of i can only think of one who was i think it was was it papa i forget the guy uh, um the guy from rsd who was teaching that he's the only papa. one i've ever even oh nick, ever nick even, yeah, nick yeah nico yeah never it, it i've, I've never heard anybody else about that but i will say this but, yeah. but also by the way like just, i i cannot believe we're still having a conversation in 2022 about mystery or neil strauss or like owen yeah. owen cook or 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 julian blanc or any of these guys who are like sort of the classic uh pickup artists of yeah. the mid-2000s because when we're talking about game today mm -hmm. it's like no one is no one is teaching like old school pua oh there's anymore. still some there's still some guys that do well it. i mean yeah there's yeah. the grifters certainly are still yeah. trying to you know hanging on to loose ends there but when I refer to game, I don't talk. To, I don't talk in terms of like say pickup artistry. Yeah. I, I talk about the social skills that are applied to that because I think PUA developed and evolved. If if you move from like just aping behaviors into why does this work and why, how can I internalize this and why am I such a nerd and why am I going to be how am I going to be able to interact and present myself in a better way? How am I going to change my mind about myself? That that develops into game in a practical sense. And so I think one of the I've heard you talk about this with with Justin on here. If your impression of like a guy who teaches game or a dating coach looks like mystery mm. from 2005 with the freaking, you know, feather boa, and the top hat and the elevator boots and the black nail polish. If that's your image of a, of a guy who teaches game or is a, 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 a dating coach and so on, you are, that was 2005, man. Yeah. That was 17 fucking years ago. Okay. That is a lifetime ago. Yeah. And we still use that as sort of this caricature of, well, I don't want to have anything to do with PUA. And then I, cause I, I, I hold Justin's feet to the fire on this occasionally. It's like, it's the same stuff you're saying is stuff that the PUAs figured out way back in the day. Yeah. You just think it's more legit because it's like gentleman game or it's like I'm authentic and I do I do this anyways. Well, they're they're aping that behavior already way back in 2002 and maybe they were inauthentic when they did that, but the behavior is still the behavior. So so the way I'd like to explain it is if uh, for those of you who watch soccer, you know, European football, the mm. inbound, right? The inbound mm. is a skill that you need, but it's not all of soccer. Cold approach is a skill that you need. Yes. Cold approach is taught as if it is game. Cold approach is 2% of let me say it one more time. Two percent. Yeah. Go ahead. If send, that. Send the if hate that. my way. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Send the hate my way. Cold approach is two percent of game. It is like I'm really good at shooting free throws. Shooting free throws is not an NBA basketball team. The get cold approach is one. Is two percent of game. Social social circle, which includes social media, is ninety eight percent of game. If we want to talk about being attractive as a man, the, my ability to break rapport, my ability to connect with the other people, mm -hmm. my ability to lead a room, my ability to, to be charismatic, my ability to connect other people, my ability to take what I do and and project it on social media mm -hmm. to be ostentatious or not ostentatious or to project a certain image on social media. These are actually the ma major parts of game. When I talk about the three things that pickup got wrong, number one, the main thing was social media. They fucking completely missed the boat. Yes. Because I personally think mm -hmm. this, I think a lot of pickup coaches knew their clients were weird and did not want their clients on social media look, exposing their weirdness. It's, it's churn and, marketing. Keep exactly. The, churn. Mm -hmm. uh, the, second thing, uh, the second thing I think they got wrong was logistics. I do not want to teach you how to meet women from your mom's basement. 
basement. I want to teach you to start a seven figure business. So we mm-hmm. leave your mom's basement. Get out there. And the third thing that was the female teammates, the teammates having women introduce me to women pre selection. Like it was just, it's just this one of these things where it's like whenever I talk to pickup artists, they're like, let's remove the obstacle. The obstacle. That obstacle is the reason she's going to go home with you. Mm-hmm. The obstacle is the one who's got the driving. The obstacle is the way, she's, right? Yeah. She's driving the fucking <laughs> car. There's no mm-hmm. obstacle with me, bro. I'm, mm-hmm. They're all going to love me by the end of the night. That's the way I want to be. And if we don't, if nothing happens between us, I still want to know you. Dude, you know how many beautiful women I meet sometimes and they're like, I, I can tell they're not interested. That's fine. Do you want to come on the podcast? You have 4 million mm-hmm. followers. Fuck yes, I'm going to have you on the podcast. Crystal, this is one of my favorite ones. Crystal Hefner is Hugh Hefner's wife. Her and I mm-hmm. hosted a bikini competition back in the, like 2014, 15, 16. Mm-hmm. When we hosted the bikini competition, she would be like, we would text each other memes, funny memes. Mm-hmm. And she'd be like, hey, Michael, do you want to come to the Playboy Mansion uh, for Midsummer Night's Dream? Fuck yes, I do. Mm-hmm. But, but pickup artists would be like, why didn't you game her? Hugh Hefner's wife, motherfucker? Yeah. Hugh Hefner's Just wife? Yes. Bro, <laughs> whatever, you, Crystal, whatever you, I love Crystal. Shout out to Crystal Hefner. She said, there's a beautiful, wonderful, charitable woman, a fucking incredible woman. And she would invite me to the Playboy Mansion. Of course, I'm going to be fucking friends with her, bro. Of course, this woman is high status. You know, I have a friend of mine, Toy Hardy. Shout out to Toy Hardy. Her birthday's on Sunday. This woman has introduced me to so many billionaires. Billionaires, bro. Of course, the, the, this ability to connect. But we treat women like they're the enemy. And I don't. I love mm. them, man. I love being no, no, in a no, hot no, tub no. with 12 yeah. women at the same time. Women make life beautiful. Women get, make life worth living. I get that constantly. And, yeah. and, and, of course, Andrew does, too. Yeah. He, made, he made a big deal out of this. Everybody thinks Andrew is like this misogynistic, you know, fuckwit, right? Yeah. And I'm like, no, no you... He would not be doing what he was doing if he was truly a misogynist. If he was truly hate women. Yeah. Men who truly hate women aren't online. Yeah. Men who truly hate women aren't going, oh man, she fucked me over. Like, because they care of their outcome dependent yeah. on what that on that rejection. Yeah. Right. And so I, I I've been doing this for about 20 years. I have met a handful of guys who I would say are genuine misogynists. But the reason why we keep saying like, oh, those guys are incels, those guys are uh, misogynists, because it's the easiest 20th century definition mm. that we can give to a guy who women wouldn't want to fuck, mm. right? And so when I get called a misogynist, it's usually because I'm connecting dots or I'm asking uncomfortable questions and that they think they don't have any counter argument to those things. So the next thing out of their mouths is who hurt you, right? Right? Or what was your growing up like? Or then they want to turn into you know armchair psychologists at that point and to reframe the the you know the debate at that point because they don't have a comeback to the data or the connections or the correlations that I'm making from the data. And then it's like, well, only an incel would have that question. Only a um, uh, a misogynist would try to connect the dots that you're connecting right now. And it's like, no, the data is what the data is. Yeah. What do you think about that? And when it conflicts with their belief sets and it conflicts with their convictions, that's when I, you get, there's no other recourse but to turn you into an incel. By the way, there's no such thing as an incel, an involuntary celibate. Yeah. In 2022, if you want to get laid, you can get laid. For sure. Come to this state. Come to, <laughs> come to fly go into to, Reno. Go to the Buddy Ranch. Fly into Reno. I'll take you to Mount House, Nevada. I, you, you give me, uh, let's see, uh, finder's fee. So get uh, 700 bucks. I'll take 200 and I will get you laid. You want to have a threesome? No problem. I will teach you <laughs> brothel game in Reno, Nevada. You 100%, Bro. you know, user satisfaction guarantee. Okay. Bro, have you seen these dudes who go to South America? You can get laid in the 21st century. Have you seen century. these guys who go to South America or Central America or someplace in like Eastern Europe and they start talking about their harem of like girls that they got? And I'm like, bro, like they just, it's a, what is it? A sexual arbitrage or whatever. Uh-huh. I don't, I don't really, I don't, I'm sorry, man. I, I don't, I don't blame you. I don't want to go too far in that, but like mm-hmm. that whole thing is just kind of, kind of strange to me. Let's talk about this. Your my two favorite quotes that you have, ready? There's mm-hmm. two of them. Well, actually, well, there's a third one. I'm going to get to that in a second, but the first one is women make rules for betas and break rules for alphas. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to tell you this. If you find that to be offensive, I won't even debate this with you. This is mm-hmm. absolutely unassailably, irrevocably true. I have cannot tell you how many times I meet a woman who says I am going to make men wait five dates to have sex with me and mm-hmm. go and have sex with their ex okay. or go have sex mm-hmm. with some male stripper or fucking VIP host that they met or some bartender the first night. Mm-hmm. It is absolutely Un- irrevocably true. Can you talk about this yes, and how it fits in yes, hypergames? Yes, absolutely. I can. Um, so this, like, there's like kind of th- three parts to this. The first one is my Iron Rule of Tomasi number three, which is any woman that makes you wait for sex, the sex is never worth the wait. Now, that is not about ba- oh, you know push for a same night lay. That has nothing to do with right. it. It has everything to do with what I call the desire dynamic. 
genuine desire. Own your soul, fresh. Own your soul, genuine desire, right? And what it comes down to is I don't want, uh, and I don't think men should, okay, here's, we're going to deal with the prescription. I don't think that men should want to have sex with a woman who doesn't want to have sex with him. For sure. Or has some sort of mitigating factor in there. Like, well, if you jump through these hoops, then maybe I'll fuck you, right? That's not, first of all, on a woman's part, it's contrived and it's, uh, it, it becomes an obligation, mm. right? I always say this is uh, you cannot negotiate genuine desire. For sure. And when you do negotiate genuine desire, whether it's with the girl that you met in the club or it's your wife in, at you know, marriage counseling, when you're negotiating genuine desire, the only thing that comes out of that is obligated compliance. It's not like I really want to fuck you. It's, oh, I owe you a fuck. That's what it comes down to. Mm. That's what that rule is really about is genuine desire and getting to that point so that you're not wasting your time with women who are less than, you know, 100% interested in you, which then comes back to the quote you're saying, which is um, women will make rules and uh, make more rules even for beta males than, and then break rules for alpha males. And the reason why I say that is because that woman will be so into you and want you so badly with genuine desire that she'll be like, I'll, 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 I'll call in late. I'll call in sick to work today to, to come and see you. Right. Because that's how invested and how interested I am in, in having sex with you or getting, or getting you like getting into your Receiving world. Your validation. Yeah. It doesn't even necessarily have to be like sex per se. It's just like, I want to be in this guy's frame. I want to live in this guy's world. I love this guy. I want to bang this guy. I want to have his babies. I think it was a, what is it? Um, uh, I forget what her name is. Uh, it's Ryan Gosling. And who was the other, who was the chick that was, that was with him? Uh, it'll somebody in the chat will give it to me. But she, I forget the name of the actress. But Emma she, Stone. Uh, no, it's not Emma Stone. It's uh, somebody give it to me. Somebody give it to me. I know Is they're it gonna. Is a notebook? It. No, it was uh, Ryan Gosling and who's who's she with right now? I think they got just got married. Anyway, she was saying she didn't want to have kids mm -hmm. with anybody. She had no kids, no no children at all. And then she met Ryan Gosling, and she's like, "But I want to have his babies. Right? I want to have his. Oh, uh, sorry, there it is. Eva Eva Mendez. Okay, perfect. Eva Mendez, Ryan Gosling. She didn't want to have kids, but she wanted to have Ryan Gosling's yeah. children. That's what I'm fucking talking Did, about. So when it's like I'm going to break my rule of not having kids, but you're you're worth breaking that rule for. So that's so, what it comes down. So you know, Bulzarian lives here, and mm -hmm. one of the main one of the main things that women tell me right before they sleep with Bulzarian, you want to know what they tell me? Mm -hmm. There's no way I'm going to sleep with Bulzarian. <laughs> it's the same thing with Vegas Dave. Dude, I can't tell you how many times me and Vegas Dave used to hang out like 2013, 2014. And I would always hear these girls be like, I would never fucking sleep with Vegas Dave. And they would mm -hmm. sleep with me. It was like they would literally make, whenever I hear a woman make these rules, my first thought is something in you, first of all, you already broke this rule. At mm -hmm. some point in the previous path, there's no reason to have, we don't have speeding rules unless people crash from, mm -hmm. from speeding. You didn't make this rule about the sleeping on the third date unless you slept with someone on the first. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is what you're saying, you're emphatically saying this to me to prove this to me or yourself, but it's not real. And mm -hmm. I, I just, how many times I hear women say, I'm not going back to this guy and they go back to him. And I'm like, no, you're, you're telling me the rule that you made because you got hurt by this guy who was mm -hmm. cheating on you, but you're not going to, and you're going to try to follow that rule with other men, but not him. Because the opportunity to get with you and hopefully like, well, for, first of all, have sex with you. And then second of all, like lock you down mm -hmm. in the, in the foreseeable fear, you, you catch feelings for her that is more of an imperative than anything else. Like if you're like high, high value guys, trust me, nobody flakes on, <laughs> flakes on Drake. Nobody flakes on, uh, on, you know, high value, high value rock stars or high value athletes, right? They're like, I'll be right over, you know, that because it's whatever your motivation is. And if that guy is confirmedly high value, pre-selected, social proof, has fame, the, uh, by order of degree, now not everybody has that, right? But by order of degree, up that sort of hierarchy of getting to the top of the top, you know, apex fame, um, that's going to motivate genuine desire in women to break rules rather than like make more rules for betas. And um, the I want to ask you one question though, because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put you I'm gonna ask you the question that everybody asks me. But, sure. But uh, as far as the beta side of this, of the, and this is where people get stuck. It's real easy to see why women would break the rule for an mm -hmm. alpha guy. Yeah. Why would they make rules for a, for a beta guy? Okay. Well, the reason why they do that is because women have to convince themselves that they really want to. Maybe this guy could work out. Maybe I want to get with him if he did these things. So when we talk about hypergamy, if you have a woman who's like a six and you have a guy who's like a six, right? That is like a lateral move for she, Like hypergamy sure. never seeks its own level. It right. always wants something a That's little bit better. That's what the hyper better, means, yeah. A little bit better than that. However, 
if that guy's a six and she's a six, just figuratively speaking, that guy better have some value added that makes him worth being with rather than seeking the seven or the eight or the nine that's above him and yeah. wanting to get with that one guy. So he better be rich as fuck or he better have make her laugh or he better like in some way have some sort of emotional connection or financial connection or whatever it is that, ha that is value added to that guy. So it's not just a lateral move. Now she's gonna get with that guy, but that's where the rule making comes into, into play. When women make rules for guys, it's usually in the epiphany phase. Mm. It's like, well, I can't lock down Chad, so uh, I'll get with with this guy over with Brad over here, and he seems like he'd be a good father, and he would really, you know, but uh, he's not as fun, he's not as exciting, he's not as spontaneous as the guy that I met in Cancun in this in the foam cannon party. But I can't lock him down. But he's kind of he, he'll be good if he can convince me that he can do these things that convince me, that qualify to me. That's where the, uh, the, the rule making comes into play for women because they have to say, does he have value added? And I have to confirm that value added by making sure that he's going to jump through these hoops for me to see if he's really into me. Whereas she would never do that for the guy who was opportunistically, she would bang in Cancun on spring break sure, yeah. because he was, a bit, he was uh, an eight, whereas Brad's only a six and he better, you know, better have something else going for him besides that. Or, or he made himself scarce or he made himself seem high value or yes. whatever reason. Perceptually, and, and, he and, was and, high value. So, so Chad made himself seem scarce and Brad made Perception's himself Perception's everything, seem, by the way, himself, too. Yeah. So it's, it does, it, you know, the guy, the hot guy in the phone cannon party could be just as much a dickhead I've as Brad. I've literally been so to phone perception. cannon parties and watched people hook up in phone cannon parties. That's why I wanted to come on your literally show. Literally <laughs> watched it at my, like I have This the is the hot guy in the phone the cannon party. The craziest stories I've ever seen. There was one time I, was, I had the microphone and I'm like, oh. I'm like doing play by play. It's like, and Jill is going down on some guy over here. I was remembering that we were in Jamaica with that. It was hilarious. Um, let, so, me ask, let me ask yeah, you this question. Though. Okay. So when, when I get, when I'm on shows and yeah. at, I, mean, I get interviewed about like uh, the, uh, you know, uh, third, uh, the Iron Rule of Tomasi number three. Yeah. They always say, well, so you want to have, so you would want to get with a girl who's loose. You would want to get with a girl who would just bang you on the first date. Is that, you know, because most women no, bang me on the first yes, date. Yes. Bang me on the first and date. So what they, what they ask me is this is like, so what you're saying is, um, you should, uh, look for loose sex, loose women all the time because, uh, you, you want to confirm genuine desire. And that it, usually that's coming from like very, you know, women who don't care one way or another. You do, and then they'll say, well, most men want to like sort of at least vet a woman and don't, not to think that she's a slut on the first date to get with her on the first date. So I'm like, oh, well, I always answer that back with like, well, when is it okay? Is it on yeah. the third date? Is it on the second date? Yeah. Is it, on, are you even having a date at all? Right. I mean, it's just, is it just a hookup? Um, so my question is always this is like when people ask me like, well, what would you say to that? If somebody said, well, uh, if that you, you yeah. date non-exclusively, you yeah. spin plates and I would presume that you're like, well, you know, this seems to work for me. Uh, I'm not saying you're giving prescriptions, but you say this seems to work for me. Uh, any woman that uh, makes you wait for sex, there's obviously something that's mitigating her decision to have sex with you. Um, so m most of the time, like people say, well, then those women are damaged or they must have something wrong with them or they're loose or they're sluts or they're whatever like that. And so it's like, what would you say when somebody says, well, you're just interested in loose fucking club sluts and they're all skanks? So I have a ma macro answer and a micro answer. The mm -hmm. macro answer, like from a sociological standpoint, would be, um, for, for instance, I had a girl that I dated for a while and she didn't sleep with me on the first date legitimately because her best friend wanted to sleep with me. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I don't want to piss off my best friend. It, if she is going out of her way to not sleep with me in order to increase desire, then you're right. I think that's incorrect. Like, I think mm -hmm. because I... Most of the women I know when I'm like, hey, your boyfriend, how, how long did you make? Like, how long do you make guys wait? They're like three dates. Your last boyfriend, how long did you make him wait? No, it was the first date, right? They, they, mm -hmm. they always leave that out. Mm -hmm. They always leave out the time that they went, you know, hooked up with some guy at the backstage of a concert mm -hmm. or they hooked up with some dude in, in Mexico. They never count those on the body count, right? Mm -hmm. So from a, a macro perspective, for the most part, I, I agree from the idea, the idea that like her deliberately trying to use this as leverage in order to make me wait doesn't work. From mm -hmm. a micro perspective, meaning from my standpoint, specifically, anecdotally, I don't care because I'm seeing so many other women. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I've so actually, that, I've yeah. definitely had women make me wait More seven dates, but I didn't notice. I was like, after the fact, I was like, wow, this girl made me wait seven dates. And I was like, you know, I will definitely wait seven dates. You're amazing. The problem is you understand I'm seeing four other girls. Just as long mm -hmm. as you understand that I'm seeing four other Dating girls. Not I, exclusively. And mm -hmm. because my dates are so fun for me, I go to I only go on dates that are fun for me. Meaning they're so fun, Rolo, if she just up and left, I'm throwing axes at fucking Area 15. I love throwing axes. <laughs> I love Area 
15. Yeah. That's and like one of my favorite places. Place in Vegas. Shit. I'm, yeah. I'm at, I'm at uh-huh. Omega Mart in area yeah. 15. If you want to go, Hey, go. Was, just yes. fucking go. I, there have definitely been girls make me wait, but I don't even notice they made me wait because mm-hmm. I have so many other things going on. Mm-hmm. So from that standpoint, I do agree uh, about, about what I, what I do tell women is this is like, if you're intent, cause here's the problem, right? I've had women disagree with me with this, but it's the truth. The quickest way for me to get a girl to be my girlfriend is what? To have sex with them. Mm. It is. If people, you have a problem with that, just look up. Like, there's no way to argue that. That is absolutely the truth. So if I really like a girl, see, this is where women get this part wrong. If I really like a girl, they're like, oh, you just want to have sex with me. And I'm like, no, I want to have sex with you because I really like you. And I need other penises to stay out of you. (laughs) And so for me to do that, I need to have sexual intercourse with you quickly. It's not out of insecurity. Mm -hmm. It is an emotional urgency. urgency. Mm -hmm. It's an an evolutionary Mm -hmm. imperative for me to do that because I want to lock you down with me because I really like you. Women don't think about it like that. They don't think it the other way. They they think it the other way. It's like, Mm -hmm. I'm making him wait. He's waiting to prove that he, that he likes me. No, I know I like you real quick. Man, it doesn't take me that long. Mm-hmm. I know I like you real quick. And so in order to do this, I need Chad Thundercock to stay the fuck away from you. Mm-hmm. So we need to have really amazing sex as soon as possible so that you are at my place all the time because that's what I want. I want to lock you down from these other people. Mm-hmm. And women think it like, oh, no, you're just trying to have sex with me and you're going to lose respect for me. I've never lost respect for a woman because we had sex quickly. I've never. It's mm-hmm. never been the issue. I've lost respect for a woman because she's lied to me. Mm-hmm. Because she's said, I'm making you wait and then didn't make other dudes wait. Then I lose respect for you. Mm-hmm. That's when I lose respect for you. So I'll tell you what, I'll tell you where I learned that lesson, by the way, the uh-huh. uh, the uh, the making rules for betas mm-hmm. and alpha. I was uh when I was working in the liquor industry, I would have to be the one who would select women to go to do, you know, booth candy, right? To select the ones who are like the poor girls. Yeah. Right? And um, I remember the conversation between two of these poor girls and they were saying like, uh, would you ever or have you ever had sex with a guy on the first date? You know, because they're kind yeah. of getting, they don't know each other, right? So they're getting to know each other. And, um, and one of them says, oh yes, of course I have. Ha ha, you know, <laughs> but not if he was boyfriend material. Right. And I was like, so the, and I, I, I took mental notes at that time. So you'll have sex with a guy like immediately as fast as you possibly can if the guy is hot, uh, is very hot and he's the hot guy on the phone can. He's a, a good opportunity yeah. to bang right then and there. But if he gives you cues and he gives you signs that he might be like somebody who's a good protector, provider, parental investment, d- dads versus cats, if he seems like that guy has to wait, that guy has to have a higher burden of performance than the guy who's the alpha guy who you wanted to fuck immediately that same night. And I'm like... That may, like that's chick logic, right? That makes no, bro, that makes bro. no sense. No, I, it makes every bit of sense because she can't get Chad and she can't get Brad in yeah. the same guy, and that's why that guy has to jump. Oh, I'll tell things. you where it gets even worse. It's mm-hmm. I used to have threesomes, but I don't do that anymore because mm-hmm. you're my boyfriend. Oh my god, ladies, you want to piss mm-hmm. your man off? Do that. I was yeah. so wild in I my so college wild days, and used, I don't do that I anymore. I used to have threesomes, but I'm in love with you, so I would never have a threesome with you. Like, mm-hmm. and it's just like women think that that makes sense. No, it mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. It mm-hmm. is like the worst. Um, I'll tell you this. My and the, and the other thing is your digital footprint when you say that, ladies. Mm-hmm. Your dig- if you have like Instagram that proves that no, you were really into it on that yacht party way back, you know, back in 2018, yeah. that's when guys kind of go, hmm. <laughs> I've had situations where women I used to date, they start seeing new guys and they're in, the, and they're, they're in a monogamous relationship with a new guy, but the guy knows she, that I could see other women when she was with me. Mm-hmm. And so he gets very frustrated. He's like, why is it that he had these rules and I had a second set of rules? Mm-hmm. I've also heard Bulzarian talk about men uh, women he used to date and then they would go get married to someone else and the guy literally had to go seek counseling mm-hmm. because it was constantly this this problem of like, you were willing to have sex with Dan Bilzerian and nine other women at the same time mm-hmm. and I married you, but you would never do this with me. Yeah. And it's like, there's this I'm, suppo- I'm supposed to be the one Correct. you would do all the crazy shit with and not those guys. Correct. Whereas I get the watered down version of your sexuality, whereas Dan Bilzerian got the anything goes, you know, off the rails sexuality because that's, that, again, the difference between genuine desire and mitigated desire, desire is exactly that. It's somewhere in between those two, those two points. When I had guys that I counsel all the time. They were like, um, you know, uh, my wife and I used to have sex so all the time. It was great. Uh, I lost the frame roll. How do I get the frame back? And I'm like, well, and I, I go and I say, I through you know, questioning the guy, I will say, well, you know, did you, when did you get married? I was always ask about logistics, like yeah. you know, age and everything else. And she's like, oh yeah, and she had a really crazy past, and she has a, a ex boyfriend or something like that that she can't get over. And I'm like, that's the alpha widow dynamic is like women pine for the one that got away, but you're the guy who'll do. 
and she will do you know sexual gymnastics with him but she won't do it with you so she, there has to be a rationale there has to be some reasoning as to why she won't do that and so she's like well i did that for him back in the day and but uh, uh you know what we have is more special we yeah. have more of an emotional it doesn't connection. feel special it feels it's, less like, special. it's like well if that's the case like you your performance with this guy is is completely different from your performance with me so I'm the one you're going to spend the rest of your life with and have kids with, and I'm going to support you. Yeah. Yet I don't have access to the same sexuality you when you were on spring break in Cancun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my definition for hypergamy it's a little different. It's not the best woman he she. It's not the best man she can get. It's the best man she can't get. Yes. Hypergamy yes. to me is women looking for the best. It is the. Uh, it's an algorithm in their mind looking for the best man they can't get. Mm -hmm. Right. Be because th if that wasn't the case, you wouldn't see so many women going after men that would normally never be monogamous. I have some female friends. Well, this is re it's a really interesting thing because we talked about this before. I introduced, I showed you a, a friend of mine. She's 37, looks like yeah. she's 22. Yeah, by the way, we had great barbecue the yeah, other night yeah, too. The place is awesome, <laughs> yeah. right? Rolling smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, this thing, when you get to the very, very top, you do mm -hmm. find women who are so physically attractive that they mm -hmm. can get men who are complete despots. Totally, mm -hmm. to even Blazarian talks about his girlfriends that he had, mm -hmm. where he was monogamous for a whole year with with Sophia Beverly, and like so in those in those situations, um, you see these women that are so attractive and they can get these men to like settle down because they're so fucking attractive. Mm -hmm. Most women I see, they're like, I need to get in front of this famous person. We had Mickey Mace on here; he was talking about that before. Where these women are like, I can change him, I can make this guy different. Lock him down. That is, by definition, to me, her getting with the the highest status man she can't, can't get. get. Mm -hmm. Not the highest status man she can't get. The highest status man she can't get. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that now there's this there's this push and pull where she's dating you know the NFL quarterback, thinking she's going to lock him down, but can't quite. Like I'm, I'll just be honest with you, I don't I don't know Patrick Mahomes. I have a hard time believing he's just sleeping with his wife, his girlfriend. <laughs> I don't. You heard the rumors about Steph Sorry, Curry. Pat. <laughs> no rumors you, you, allegedly. You, you remember the Steph Curry shit yes, with yes, Steph Curry? That like, I do. Remember. I I mm. I've really hard time believing that Steph Curry has not put his penis in another woman since he met, since he married Aisha. Yeah. I have a very very and very very you, and then you have Aisha on the red table talking to Jada Pinkett Smith yeah. talking about I want to be feel sexy. How come I can't can't be on Instagram yeah. as a wife yeah. of, a, and like you're married to fucking Steph Curry. Curry. Yeah, who is better? Who are you going to get? Yeah, that's seriously, higher than he this? only got a half billion dollar contract. Hopefully that works <laughs> out for you. And then the, the other thing, like just a bunch of these guys, like LeBron. You want to? One of the things I, I I've been always wanted to ask you about this was Tiger Woods versus Jer Derek Jeter. Tiger mm -hmm, Woods, mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. is this. You know, he's purported to be this high status person. I think mm -hmm. he got bad advice from people in the golf community. Mm -hmm. You need to be. You need to look. Uh, to appeal to a white Protestant crowd, you need to mm -hmm. be married and look squared away. Mm -hmm. And so he married this woman and then ended up cheating on her with Denny's waitresses mm -hmm. and Rachel Yucatel. And where is, where is, <laughs> I what, got stories for you. <laughs> where is, what, what happens with, what happens with Derek Jeter? Mm -hmm. He fucks Jessica Biel and Jessica Alba and Mariah Carey and nobody says shit mm -hmm. because he's not married and because he's in our minds we're like well he, of course he's a shortstop for the fucking yankees of course he's worth sleeping with all those women mm -hmm. nobody complained when hugh hefner would like have multiple girlfriends well, some women complain but most people were like because he's hugh hefner of course he's gonna have multiple girlfriends you, this this whole <laughs> yeah. paradigm we're like we saw tiger is low status because he lied mm -hmm. and Derek jeter we didn't even care i don't care yeah well, it's like uh the same thing with that's going down with uh leonardo dicaprio right for now. sure i did a full episode on this uh no we did it on uh, rule zero um which is my panel show on saturdays um and we talked about uh and by the way this has been going on for a very long time at least since 1999 and yes i finally do understand that his first girlfriend in that rotation of his yeah. you know monkey branching or whatever um, yes, that was Giselle, who yeah. is uh, Br Giselle Brady. Or, uh, yeah, what? Giselle Munchen is her Munchen, name. Munchen, yeah. yeah. Thank you for correcting me, yeah. chat. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, so looking at, you know, how he goes from, from women who are like, say, you know, 20 to 25, and he, that's, the, that's the cutoff point, like it's, it's expiration date hits. Is he doing that because he's like, yeah, I, I do that on purpose. I, that's my intent. Or is he doing that just because it's just like, well, you know, after a certain time, that's when things kind of get stale and she's not as hot as she used to be or she's not as fun as she used to be. I think I'm going to trade her up for a different model. Women love Leonardo DiCaprio, but they hate Leonardo DiCaprio. It's like yeah. it's love-hate relationship with him because he's the dude who you can perpetually never never lock down, yeah. but he's a high value dude, but they, they, they want to give him grief. There's still that love hate relationship. And then what I did was I contrasted that with a guy like Keanu Reeves Yeah. and Keanu Reeves is with a, a well, I don't know if he's still with her, but he was with a, uh, his girlfriend, I think it was his PR woman. And she's like 46, 47 years old. She yeah. looks like she's 67. 
Wow. She looks like his mom. And women came out of the woodwork and they're like, oh, I love him that much more now. He's dating somebody who's age appropriate. And, and it's like, yeah, she's like two years away from menopause. And, and I'm like, like there, you know, that yeah. doesn't enter into the mind, but it, it's just this sort of like what's socially acceptable and what's not socially yeah. acceptable. And it's usually in a sort of a gynocentric framework where it's like what, what, what benefits the interest of women's mating strategy is always what's going to play and what doesn't, what benefits a man's mating strategy, such as Leonardo DiCaprio and he, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio, I mean, to my knowledge, isn't like going out and banging random hoes. Yeah. He has one girlfriend that he sticks with for four or five years yeah. and then he gets up to the next one right there. Women hate that even more, I think, than if he had just like he was banging random club sluts all the time yeah. because it's a loss of equity. It's a loss of investment because when women between the ages of 20 and 25 years old, yes. they're hitting that sexual market value peak. That's when they're at their peak agency. That's when they have their most like in the sexual marketplace. That's when they have the most equity to certainly to a guy like Leonardo DiCaprio, right? And so they're giving away their most fertile, sexually youthful, vibrant, you know, vivacious years for a guy who's just gonna cycle her out for the next model four or five years down the road. That's a, that's, um, uh, was it a cost, cost, uh, opportunity cost. Mm. That's, that's a loss of, it's a loss of I, investment I, on the, on women. I think he started off not thinking about the 25 year old thing. And later on, someone probably pointed out pointed to him like, and psychologically he probably was like, wait, is this a real, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he probably I think, didn't know I think until after, like the third one. After like a dozen, <laughs> he's like, oh, wait a second. Maybe this is a real thing that I really like here. You yes. know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that, that is, that, that is an interesting, uh, another mm -hmm. Uh, quote that I love. This is the second one I love. Is women don't care about a man's struggles; they wait at the finish line, bro. That is that's Richard awesome. Cooper, by the way. Yeah, I, oh, I, I got to give up, give big ups to, to yeah. him for that. But um, yeah, it's uh, and I um, I halfway agree with that. So yeah. um, the the quote is this: It's women um, don't care about men's struggles; they wait at the finish line and they bang the winners. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think a certain caliber of women can do that. So those are the women who you see who are gunning for high, high value, high, high status guys. Who have who themselves are the bikini models? Who themselves are a product, you know, that is meant to pair with that other product, right? There are a, a select few of those men. There's very few high value men, so there would stand a reason that there are very few high value women who could get with that high value guy. Yeah. Okay, so there's the uh, there's the uh, the supply and demand side of that equation. But the reason why I say I only halfway agree with that is most women can't get that they sure. can't get the high value guy so what they have to do is what <laughs> what all the girls who date leonardo dicaprio think they're going to do um is they get with a guy who they think they can lock down who has potential yes who has potential to be the winner who crosses the finish line and they were with him they jumped in the car at the beginning of the race and they're there at the finish line with the checkered flag so they have to invest <clears throat> their most fertile sexually valuable, have the most agency in their life from like 20 to 24, 25, somewhere around there, in a guy who could potentially be a, a, a good bet for their future, and that's the potential. So it's, it's not so much about caring about the struggle, it's that they can't, be, they're, they can't be the one who is the one who's waiting at the finish line. They would rather get with the guy who, who is gonna be the winner, who crosses the finish line. Now, yeah. that involves a lot of a bet, it also, a betting, it's also, uh, in, uh, it's also it depends on a lot of intuition, on a lot of understanding this guy's nature, uh, emotional investment as well as physical investment. Is this guy actually gonna be uh, a partner in the law firm? Yeah. Is this guy actually gonna be uh, a, a, a multi-million? I think Gary Vee is a good example of this. Like Gary Vee, when he, he's just recently getting um, divorced here, his wife was on board with him back in his 20s. Now that he's in his 40s right now, if you look at the chick that he's with, she is a much younger model and she's a much hotter model than, than the one that he was with, the, yeah. his wife, who got with him in his 20s, right? So the, the greatest fear and that is so, so, so exaggerated right now is, um, well, I don't want to invest all of my sexual capital from my 20s in a guy who's just going to turn into the guy who goes and bangs his, you know, gets a trophy wife or bangs his secretary. And then all of my investment that I put in to him becoming a winner and yeah. being a ride or die girl, all that goes out the window because now he wants to fuck his, his trophy wife or he wants to fuck the secretary. Well, what is that? Kanye said, he, like, and then at the end he goes and fucks a white girl. You remember talking yeah. about gold digger? He said, <laughs> leave your ass for a white but, girl. But see, so it's an investment cost loss. And when we talk about evolutionary psychology, yeah. when we say that women have, a, well, women have a higher reproductive cost than men do. Of course, yeah. So for women to, to sacrifice that and invest, it's like taking, Myron Gaines always talks about, you know, women are born with a million 
bucks and they have to take that money and they have to invest it wisely or they blow it on hookers and blow throughout their you know their 20s or yeah. whatever so that when they get to like the epiphany phase or in their early 30s um, you had better made a good bet on a guy who had a, was a potential winner or you better be the chick who's at the finish line waiting for the winner and you better be able to be of the caliber that can compete with all the other bitches that are waiting for that winner to go across the finish line. Okay, when you say the 23 to 25, one more time, I want to reiterate this. I said this at the beginning of the program. Go on, read the book Dataclism or mm -hmm. look at the statistics from... Uh, he specifically, let's just stick to who gets the most. It doesn't right even swipes. have to, you know, I was right going to say, those are, those are old stats too. Yeah. I, I quote those often yeah. enough, yeah. right? The, but there are, are more current stats that point that out as well, yeah. that that's the, the prime demographic, if, prime if, age if, for If women. you disagree with it, again, we're not talking about your personal internal value, about the value you have as, mm -hmm. as a, as Sexual a business. market value yeah. and personal worth. Yes, personal worth, two different things. Your, your, uh, the feelings that you have when you meditate. Your, inner, your relationships with your friends and family, how much money you make, how many grad, graduate degrees, that's a separate thing. When we're talking about sexual market value. Volunteering on the soup line. For yeah. sure. <laughs> that's, that's defined, that is defined in some ways, several ways, but your sexual market value is defined by how many men are attracted to you at different points in your life. And if we go by dating apps, it is very, very, very clearly defined 23 to 25. So don't yell at him. Don't yell at me. Go read the book Dataclism. Yell at them. Go, Don't, be, go be mad at God. Go be mad, yeah. go be mad at statistics. Well, so, it's, I, and of course, the joke is this. I, is they call the store Forever 21, yes, not, not Forever, forever 41. 41. <laughs> oh, There's funny. a reason for yeah. that. It, embrace it. It's okay. Lady. And I, You know what's funny? is like when I go and I, I, I present that and I say, look, your prime sexual market value, your peak years are going to be right around 23 years old. I yeah. tell my daughter this, right? Yeah. I say, look, that's going to be your peak years. Yeah. And... When I point out, you can point out like stats and statistics and all this other shit, but what really I think sinks in for women is when you say, okay, if you know that, if you see this coming, how are you going to plan ahead? If you're going to look for a guy who's a good bet, now's the time to look for that guy that's a good bet. Yeah. Not when you're 33, when you're 23. So look for, you know, look for the guys who, and then also don't be so full of yourself that you're like, you don't take anybody else's advice. Or you don't t talk to your dad or talk to your brothers or talk to any positive masculine influence in your life to say, Hey, do you think this guy's a good bet? Yeah. Do you, do you like this guy? Do you think he's a, he's a cool dude, right? Do you think he's going to fuck me over? Or do you think he's going to be a good, do you want to be related to this guy in the future kind of thing? And I think that most women are so full of themselves and they don't trust men to such a degree that that wouldn't even be, be a concept that would be in their heads. The Richard, uh, Richard Cooper quote is, women don't care about a man's struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, they wait at the finish line and they fuck the winners. Mm -hmm. Now, if anybody has a problem with that, here's the problem. Uh, here's why, that the first part I completely agree with. Women do not care about a man's struggles. Mm -hmm. If you think women yeah. care about even a man's struggles. Even if they're investing you in yeah. their 20s, they still don't they care, don't about, care about, about your struggles. <laughs> if you care about a, a, a man's struggles, I want to see you guys dating the stalker, the guy who does the stalks of shelves at Walmart. Mm. You're not dating him. He's struggling more than I am. The sandwich he, artist at the Subway. The sandwich <laughs> artist at Subway. If you care about a man's struggles, let me see you dating him. You aren't dating him. Mm -hmm. But what will happen is a man will struggle, and at the end, he has a million dollars. And you're like, oh, he struggled. No, you care. I'm sorry, ladies. You do care about the money. But we'll get to the, mm -hmm. the money muscles in the uh, game. Uh, you do care about the results. That is the case. Regardless, if you want to say what, when we look at who you date, you date the men who have the it's results. There's so many men who are struggling. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I, I made a statement before women got so mad at me. Women do not care about your feelings. They don't. The fact that your ex cheated on you is not going to make her vagina wet to sleep with you. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, she's not going to pity her. You're not going to pity your way into having sex with her. You're not going to reason your There's way no into having sex. There's no such thing as a pity fuck, especially sure. in the 21st century. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, well, and then I, I would say this is like women want to, that women don't want to marry a man. They want to marry a lifestyle. Interesting. It's, uh, you, you hear all the time like, oh, women didn't, they, they don't want a marriage. They just want a wedding, mm. right? They just want to have that. And you can see that confirmed because women will go and like marry like a bridge or themselves or their dog or something they just want to have that process well i'm such a, i'm a self-fulfilled woman so i'm going to marry myself and they yeah. have a ceremony for the whole you don't see dudes doing that guys don't go get married to bridges they don't marry a chandelier man yeah. they don't care about that they just you know it's it's that's the difference between the two i think but it's the lifestyle it's the this this um uh i in, in book one i talk about this it's in uh i think it's a uh, iron rule number six which is um, uh, women love opportunistically, men love idealistically. Yes, women we fundamentally want to, We capable. want to believe that, we want to believe in the, I think men more, men are the romantics pretending to be pragmatists and women are vice versa. And so when you point shit out like that, women go, but I love my, my, my husband, I love my boyfriend. Yeah, I'm sure you do. But that dude had to meet a list of criteria 
before you would emotionally invest in that yeah. guy in the first place. That's what I'm getting at. I'm not saying you're some opportunistic, you know, evil, malicious, you know, bitch who's going to go and a gold digger, right? Who wants to get with the, the top shelf guy? Women want that, but they won't allow themselves by order of degree. They won't allow themselves to invest emotionally in a man, to love a man, unless that guy checks off at least some of those things on the you know, 436 bullet point checklist. Going, going back to what you said before, from an evolutionary standpoint, I ask women this all the time, or I ask men. And there's so. nothing wrong with that, yeah, by, that, the that by the way. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hating for yeah. that, I'm just, uh, that's an observation. For, from an evolutionary standpoint, mm -hmm. does it make more sense for a woman to give her undeniable, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, unmitigated, unmitigated genuine love, desire. Genuine, uh -huh. oh no, no, mm -hmm. but her, her, her unconditional love to her children or to mm -hmm. her man? Unfortunately, it, it, for our species to have existed through multiple near extinction events, mm -hmm. different points throughout history, through the anthropological record where there were only 60,000 homo sapiens on the planet, mm -hmm. near extinction several times, the propagation of the species was priority. Mm -hmm. A woman gives unconditional love to her children, not to her mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, by the way. I'm yes. not complaining about that. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, you understand mm -hmm. that a woman, her love for you is Conditional. It has to be conditional. Mm -hmm. That's why, uh, personally, if I'm a, a husband and the, uh, my wife has a, a choice and there's a train coming and it's me mm -hmm. or the kid, let me die so that my kid can live. Right. I get that. Mm -hmm. But as a result, I understand love for me is conditional. It is mm -hmm. conditional. Conditional why? What we said before. It's not conditional on my struggle. It is conditional on how I finish. Your it's conditional on my performance, mm -hmm. and I will be judged on performance until the day I die. Performance, your hierarchy, your status. Correct. Like said. And by the way, your status in a hierarchy mm -hmm. is directly, or should be anyways, directly relatable to your performance. It's For directly sure. relatable to your competence. For sure. So uh, I, I'll give you the evolutionary side. Okay, I'm going to put the Mr. Wizard cap on here. Um, the reason for that, of course, is you've probably heard this saying before, which is eggs are expensive and sperm is cheap. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, that's I think that's straight out of like uh, it's the, the red it's queen. The, it's I the think. parental investment yeah. hypothesis, exactly from evolutionary psychology. Exactly. So, and I don't know if like I I know you follow David Buss. I know there's uh, God Sod is a really good friend. I, you know, I'd like to I would God Sod. If you want to be on my show, please come to my show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, he would probably be the only guy I would ever be like starstruck by. Yeah. Is, is God Sod? He's but, so funny. But man. I follow I follow guys like Rob Henderson, Steve Stewart Williams, uh, David Buss, uh, all these guys. Yeah. Um, but across the board, and I don't know if any of these guys are talking about this, but it's the big head babies theory. Yeah, okay? of course. So the big head babies theory is this. is are useless. Women are the vulnerable sex. Yeah. Men are the disposable sex, or the sacrificial sex. Maybe I should say put it in those terms. Because whenever you put it in those terms, people think that I'm making a judgment call. You're not disposable. You're sacrificial, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, and men have an innate protector dynamic. And the reason for that is because human babies have huge heads. Yeah. Because... Human spe the human species is, is uh, dependent upon our intelligence. I know it's hard to believe in this day and age, but we're dependent up, up upon our intelligence. And so to create uh, an intelligent uh, animal, we have to have a lot of neurons, we have to have a big head, and we have to have like a large brain, and we have to be able to, you know, complex, you know, computer in our heads. Well, first of all, that takes time to gestate. So you've got nine months right there for a human, human to gestate. Uh, and then once that baby comes out of that woman's hips who are like unusually large because you have to birth that baby technically premature because you can't get that big, huge head out of the birth canal if, if they're not giving birth right at that, at that point. So what happens is then there's an investment cost that comes as a result of that. And the, now you have not only a vulnerable female, but you also have a vulnerable, very fragile child. Yes. And throughout our ancestral past, women were carrying around one to four or five of these things at the same time, you know, because we we're the, when we were breeding and in, in back on the Savannah and hunter gatherer days. Right. Yeah. So women were in a very vulnerable state, evolutionarily speaking. So men, of course, were built for combat. We're the, for, there for defense. We're there for the three P's protection, provisioning and parental investment mm -hmm. and hope, hope to God that the kid is ours. Right. Yeah. So the, because human babies have big heads, um, like for instance, I, I, I made this example in, um, in my, in religion, in my religion book, um, that like, if you look at like, say a baby horse, when a, a horse is born, like within an hour or so it can run and it's somewhat exactly. self-sufficient. Babies are, are completely helpless for anywhere between like the first five to seven years of their lives. And the women are also effectively helpless as well. Um, because they are simply the weaker, the vulnerable sex at yes. that point. So how do you survive as a species like that if you if the female is vulnerable and the man is not well you've got to have some sort of psychological mechanism that is imbued into the man 
to protect the vulnerable female and the vulnerable baby, right? Mm -hmm. So what you just said a moment ago is the women are fixated upon the survival of that child. That's why they have, you know, the, the oxytocin and everything that goes into the nurturing side of everything. Um, they are primarily, you know, focused on protecting that child and they, that's, there's a relationship from the mother to the child. Well, what happens is from the man to the woman, there is like when you'll hear like pickup artists or you're in the red pill community, you'll hear guys say, well, women are like children. Yeah, yeah, they are because there's an innate part of us that wants to treat them like that in a protector dynamic because we want to protect the vulnerable woman and the vulnerable child because the big head babies. So what happens then is you've got this innate protector dynamic in, in women and I'm gonna throw some, blow some doors off here. Um, when Andrew Tate talks about how um, uh, women are, are, are weaker in you know, combat and everything else or when um, women uh, must obey men, like when you have that uh, like, uh, obedience factor, that's, he was, he'll, I think I've seen him on uh, several interviews where he said you know, women want to obey or want to submit to a worthy man, to a guy who's, you know, who's muscular and, and can, you know, has, is dominant and is a, a good, a high value guy. Mm. They want innately to submit to that guy and women lose their shit whenever he says that. But from an evolutionary perspective, it's true because if they didn't in our evolutionary past, they would die, the species would be dead. So we've got the protector dynamic on the side of the man. We've got this sort of obedient deference side on, on the women. And now you, and that's how down the chain, you know, it's, it's, it's God, man, woman, babies, puppy dogs, right? Mm. I mean, that's the, that's the chain right there. What we've done in really, I would say since the sexual revolution is we have evolved past all of this stuff and, and because of social conditioning or social conventions or whatever, you know, social construction theory kind of thing, we've convinced ourselves that that shouldn't be the way that it is. And so what we do is we have taught women to subvert the male protection instinct. So you'll see trad cons do this and you'll see liberals do this as well. So for feminists of, of you know, whether you're, ladies, if you're a conservative feminist or you're a liberal feminist, they do pretty much the same thing. They will use the male protector dynamic against men. Your responsibility is this. You don't get any authority over us, but you have this mm. responsibility to us, which is innately sort of imbued in us, right? And so, for men to, to want to um, protect women is an innate desire to put themselves in front of like, especially in survival situations with like a mass shooting kind of thing. Uh, guys will put themselves in front of bullets of uh, women that they don't even know. They don't like, even here, know, in Las, yes. here in Las Vegas, like when the Las Vegas shooting was going on, um, there were incidences of multiple incidences of guys putting their bodies in front of women and getting shot and killed of women that they didn't know because it was just simply like gut instinct that just clicks in and they did, they, they wouldn't be able to tell you why they did that. They just went and did it. Now we call that no, a noble death and honorable and everything else. So we can give names to it later, but the instinct to do that is part of the male protector dynamic that has been leveraged against women or excuse me, against men uh, in the sense that um, women don't want to obey. They don't want to, they don't want to be obedient. Like who are you, who, who the fuck are you to tell me what I can do? I'm, I'm my own autonomous androgynous thing and I'm not going to do what you have to tell me, but they still have that innate want to get with a guy mm. who is a, a worthy man to submit to a worthy man's mission. And so that also ties into the child, the big head baby side of things as well. So when you've got the red pill, the red pill analyzes all this and it tries to, t it tells men, this is the way things are and don't get rolled by Cardi B. Don't think that you have to, you know, don't, yeah. you know, this is the dynamic here and look for the women who are deferential to you. That's why you, that's how you get yeah. an Andrew Tate. For, for a woman who would disagree with that, just think of the Eva Mendes thing again. I don't mm -hmm. want to have babies. But then, I want his but I, But then she meets Ryan Gosling, but I want his babies. If, if, if you think about it from the standpoint of your, whatever, whatever lady is watching this, your version of Ryan Gosling, mm -hmm. would you want to submit to him possibly? Maybe you think you wouldn't, and again, mm -hmm. try and brain theory, right? From a mammalian, yes. from a mammalian standpoint, mm -hmm. she does. From a, from a neocortex standpoint, she does not. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where the, the dissonance comes from. Let me say uh, something else. 5,000 mm -hmm. species of mammals on this planet, 3% of them pair bond, only 3%. Mm -hmm. Pair bonding for homo sapiens is an evolutionary adaptation. I knew you were going to get to this topic Derby. today. <laughs> yes. Pair bonding for homo sapiens is an evolutionary adaptation because of what he said. In order for our craniums mm -hmm. to be bigger, we had to be born prematurely. Our bodies, mm -hmm. everything below the neck, prematurely. That's why children are born without the ability to walk. If you talk 
to any quadruped mammal. So uh, talk to them. Sorry. Talk to them. If you if, if you study talk any to my my greyhound. Yeah, if you if you study any quadruped <laughs> mammal, they're able to walk quickly uh -huh. because that's an, an innate thing. And if you look at them, their brain size compared to the rest of their body. So mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, you know impalas. Mm -hmm. or gazelles horses, or, or horses or whatever, even, yeah. their brain size compared to the rest of the mass mm -hmm. of their body is smaller because a cognitive ability like you know, to speak and, and do mathematics and Sudoku puzzles was not necessarily for, for their evolution. Mm -hmm. So they were able to walk. They were not born prematurely. They were mm -hmm. born able to walk, whereas Homo sapiens were not. And so mm -hmm. that's what he's talking about. So in order to protect these people, in order to protect these smaller, useless, fragile, fragile people, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't mean to say useless, but children are vulnerable, fragile. Vulnerable. Yeah. The, the, I heard the term one time, children are born useless. And I was like, that's horrible. And then I thought, that's kind of true. Like they can't really do anything, right? They're fragile. They're fragile, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when they're born that way, you have to have some mechanism in evolution in order. Remember, rule number two in men of action, anything that exists amongst Homo sapiens must exist somewhere in evolution. So mm -hmm. it, the, in order for us to protect them from an evolutionary standpoint, that's where pair bonding comes in. And then think about this other thing. Childbirth sucks. From every woman I've talked to about it, it's not mm -hmm. like playing basketball and spraying an ankle. It's fucking terrible. It is one of the, like, from a pain standpoint, is one of the most horrific things. And childbirth before, pre-1850, 50% 50 of homo sapiens that have ever born died before the age of five. More than, like, we're talking massive amounts. 100 times the level of, uh, of uh, ch mother mortality uh, women dying in childbirth back then. Okay, mm -hmm. this is another reason why it's an evolutionary adaptation for women to pick the right man because mm -hmm. if she doesn't, she's going to have died for it's nothing. An investment cost. It is a yeah. massive mm -hmm. investment cost. Ch childbirth was deadly, deadly yeah. before antibiotics. Okay, so when you when you consider that as well, why in the world would women women put themselves up to this for three hundred thousand years of Homo sapien evolution? It's because after childbirth, mm -hmm. this in flood of oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Again, another evolutionary adaptation. Yeah, right after orgasm is a flood of oxytocin. Ex exactly. Uh, evolutionary adaptation mm -hmm. reward center reward you for having sexual intercourse mm -hmm. reward center reward you for having a child with someone else mm -hmm. for the man and the woman and then there's the reward center rewarding you for the pair bonding that happens mm -hmm. i don't the most desperate fucking male whore i've ever met has fallen in love with one girl it, it, mm -hmm. it happens to every dude there's no there's no dude who it doesn't have, unless you're a complete mm -hmm. psychopath it doesn't and by the way there's another evolutionary adaptation for why psychopathy exists we could talk about that later oh yeah yeah but psychopath next door but but <laughs> uh, but when we when we discuss those things you have mm -hmm. to understand this is not good or bad. Because I'm an oncologist and study cancer, it doesn't mean I condone cancer. It means cancer is, exists, therefore I have to study it. Mm -hmm. In this type of situation, I know I call homo sapiens hairless murder apes. I stand by that. We are hairless murder apes. You belong to the most violent species that has ever existed in the history of the fucking 3.8 billion years that this rock has been floating around the sun. Mm -hmm. This is, we are violent. And so when you understand that, that kind of thing, then, then it, what I'm saying is, if you understand this truth, your decision matrix becomes much easier. Right. You can't be aware of anything mm -hmm. like, in your situation, mm -hmm. the red pill. I cannot be aware unless I transcend the Disney paradigm mm -hmm. or even the natural paradigm I have. I can't even be aware that there is another paradigm unless I understand I did not come from Disney. I came from my species only choosing to th do things that were evolutionarily beneficial for them and the massive selection pressure that they had to fight in order for this fragile, fra think about Homo sapiens compared to gorillas, homo sapiens compared to tigers, homo sapiens compared to alligators. In mm. every one of these cases- At least they have weapons. For sure. <laughs> name, name all the mammals that yeah. you can outrun, a, York, a Yorkshire Terrier. Name all the mammals you as a human being can outrun. I can't outrun, outrun Ned. You Ned's my greyhound. Yeah, you can't outrun dogs. You can't, most cats you can't outrun. You can't, mm. like, do you guys know that elephants can run 35 miles an hour? You can't outrun the majority, a bear will outrun you and it weighs a thousand pounds. You mm. can't outrun most of these mammals. And every one of these mammals, almost all of them is either faster, stronger than you or has fangs. As a, as a species, we're actually kind of a weak, fragile species. We, yeah, exactly. We got a big ass brain though. We got a big ass brain and that's yes. the evolutionary yeah, we're smart enough to, We're smart enough to fuck you up. Correct, it, it's well, exactly right. I, I was gonna say this is, and cause I'm looking at this right now and, and this is a, a conversation I think I got into with like Jedediah Bila and some, I, it's usually like conservatives will throw this at me mm -hmm. and so I'll be like, um, do you think that the human species is, is uh, naturally monogamous or naturally I mean, this promiscuous? Is a, this isn't even and I a question. said, I said both. Yeah. I said both. I said because it's in men's uh, men's when you look at men's sexual strategy, men's innate mating strategy, it is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Yes. Uh, you, of course, you and and Justin talked about this all the time. You get the win button, and you, you could fuck any chick you want to. That's you know that you would put, you would press the button. Well, most guys press the button, and that button is porn. Yeah. That's if you want to know if you have any disagreement with my assessment that says unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. That is exactly what online porn provides men in a vicarious, you know, in a vicarious sure. way. That's why it's free. 
Yeah. That's why it's 4K. That's why it's streaming. That's why every technological advancement we've ever made has been used for porn first. So, <laughs> so, every one so of them. men want to use that as, as, a, as sort of an outlet right there. And, and there's, a def, I think now in the 21st century, there's a, a real, very real downside to that. However, um, so as our nature being, um, our innate promiscuous nature as men uh, would be unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, um, for women, of course, it's hypergamy. They're looking for the, the next best thing. They're looking for the big, bigger and better deal, you know, and scales by, you know, where they can, what they can get. Um, but when you look at those things from an evolutionary perspective and a mating strategy perspective, men are R selected and women are K selected. Mm. So men, it's in men's like DNA reproductive interests to bang a lot of women. To have multiple partners, to to spread the from seed. a genetic standpoint, For, absolutely is a yeah. From a genetic standpoint, we are promiscuous. So you can make the case and say, yeah, we are promiscuous. We're innately that way. There's a great book that I don't know if you've read before, but it's uh, it's by Dr. Tim Burkhead, one of the best reads I've ever read. It's called Promiscuity. Okay. And it goes through uh, the animal kingdom, including human beings, about uh, exactly what you said. There are only certain, like maybe two species on planet Earth that actually. M monogamously pair bond for life. And I think one is a swan and another one is like some field mouse, you know, sure. somewhere like that, right? And so with that in mind, what are, the, what are the adaptations, what are the strategies that evolve from the fact that pretty much everything on planet Earth is promiscuous? Well, for men and women, for human beings, it is in our evolutionary, um, our survival best interests to be monogamous because of big head babies. Yeah. So we have to say, well, we have to have some sort of natural propensity to want to be invested in our offspring. Women are more nurturing. Men want to ascertain that the damn kid is theirs. They want to make sure that For paternity sure. is a thing. Because up until 1975, when we could get DNA testings, we didn't know if the kid was ours or not, unless you're white and it comes out black. I mean, maybe that you might be yeah. able to figure out. But um, that's why we had things like uh, we would uh, had a stigma for bastard children. That's why we had a, a single mothers up until the sexual revolution were shunned because it was it was a, a shame mm -hmm. to, to do that. Well, the reason for they're, they're very real uh, evolutionary reasons for those uh, those traditions and what we would call traditions anyways, but the, for those practices and those belief sets that were now in the 21st century going, hmm, maybe we get married because we are compromising uh, my my innate mating strategy, which is unlimited access to unlimited, to unlimited sexuality, I'm compromising that by saying, I'm only going to fuck you. I'm only going to be married to you. I'm, I'm going to protect, provide, and be parentally invested in our relationship. So I'm going to give up an aspect of my mating strategy. And the deal is this. I have to be the one that you're fucking. Only, you're only fucking me. I don't want to know that there's been any other penises in you, yep. like you were saying, right? And I need to know that the fucking kids are my kids. For sure. That's the deal. So when you have marriage, and you, even when you think of the marriage vows, like, uh, you know, till death do us part, and for richer, for poor. So if I fuck up, you're still going to stay, you're ride or die. Um, uh, forsaking all others in sickness and in health. And you look at all the, the traditional marriage vows, those are like insurance policies against some very real evolutionary realities that could happen. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tell my friends, do you have to pass laws in order to get people to eat carbs or fat? No. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have pass laws in order to get people to go to sleep? No. But in Saudi Arabia, if a woman cheats mm -hmm. on her husband, what happens? She gets Stoner. stoned to death. Yeah. You so, so again, if things were na a natural state of, of, of homo sapiens, you don't need to stone people to do things that are natural. The real, the real answer is homo sapiens live a life, a life of polygamy interspersed with periods of monogamy. Mm -hmm. That's generally what happens. People get married, have the starter. That's why they mm -hmm. call it a starter yeah. wife. We, we do, we do what's, uh, I mean, I've been married to my wife for 26 years. Yeah. I've never cheated on my wife. Okay? Yeah. I have a notch count of 40 women that I, 41 women yeah. when I was in my rock star 20s. Okay? Sure. So, um, you know, they always say, you know, sow your wild oats, get it out of your system sure. kind of thing. You know, and then the women are now have the hoe phase. So they're pretty much like have become the men that we we used to be, I guess. So women think that for, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander because we believe in this blank slate bullshit where it's like, if a guy can do it, then I can do it too, right? Well, no, there's, there's consequences and there's downstream evolutionary consequences to that. Um, but we have conditioned ourselves to sort of... Um, to believe that we're above that or we evolved above that through social, uh, social constructionism, 
um, and through the blank slate and really through emotionalism. And I, I, people know this is a quote from me as well, is that if you kick out the legs of emotionalism, social constructionism, and, uh, and the blank slate out of any like woke ideology, it crumbles, it falls apart, it just absolutely collapses. Because if you have to give an objective empirical definition of what is a woman, right? Like when, when Matt, Matt Walsh is talking about that, um, if you had to do that, people would have to reassess their identities in not in emotional, subjective, relative terms. They would actually have to you know, say, uh, that's a woman and I'm not actually a woman, even though I have lipstick on and I've got long hair and I got a you know, you know, blush on, you know, on Dr. Phil or something. So that questions and puts into, uh, puts into question a lot of ideologies if you can say empirically, you're not a woman, you can't give birth, uh, and yes, there is a genetic component to gender. I don't give a fuck what you say. I can yeah. show you the studies for that. You can look at the four laws of behavioral genetics, and I can show you that right now. Um, but so when you, when you encounter a woman who's saying, or a, a teacher or something uh, advocating for uh, gender reassignment surgeries because you were born the wrong way, you're born the wrong gender, or uh, gender is a social construct. I'm like, well, if gender is a social construct, then why do I need gender reassignment surgery for that? Why do yeah. I need puberty blocking drugs for that? Um, if that's if it's just you know, and when you put that kind of those belief sets um, in the light of empirical data, they fall apart. They just crumble. Sure. And to, and when they crumble, what happens is uh, people are so ego invested in it, they live their entire lives, they've developed their entire personalities around that, that when you present them with that data, you get canceled, just like, like Andrew Tate. You get, you yeah. get, we don't want to hear what you have to say it, because we're happy in our little cocoon. If someone over the age of 18 wants to change their gender, I support that because I'm a U.S. military officer and we're su supposed to support and defend the Constitution mm -hmm. of the United States, and that's your expression. I have no problem with that. I have friends that have done that. I don't have an issue with that whatsoever. However... If I express to you, hey, just to let you know, even though you have changed your gender, you, you still have mm -hmm. two, an XY chromosome. Mm -hmm. If you feel like what I said is hateful, mm -hmm. there's a problem. I'm not, I'm not going to respond with hate, but here's the problem. Where does this stop? Because now you denying that you have XY chromosome, like mm -hmm. you are biologically still a male. What happens now is what else do we deny? Why do we even believe in evolution? Okay, now we don't believe in evolution. Now there's other biological constructs we don't believe in. So at this point, like I know this is going to sound like a real big stretch. Do you know 4% of millennials don't believe that the earth is round? Did you oh, know yeah, this? yeah. Flat this, earthers this, hit me up all the time. Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. But, uh, and, but, oh, and we never landed on the moon either, yeah, by the way. Kind of stuff. But, but do you understand? <laughs> this continues to yeah. rise mm -hmm. when, we, when we teach the zodiac signs, Mercury, Mercury in retrograde, that's why I didn't sign this contract. Mm -hmm. When we allow that the science denialism, mm -hmm. what happens is, Magical they, 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 but, but, they, mm -hmm. but they start, they, when I make the, cause I debated these flat earthers for three and a half hours. I'm telling you that these things are correlated. The idea that we can't, uh, like all of a sudden, I don't believe in science when it doesn't, when it doesn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. That leads to, I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in biology. biology I don't yeah, believe that yeah, there are dinosaurs. A slippery slope, yeah. And it's a slippery mm -hmm. slope that leads right to, I don't believe the earth is round. I don't believe anything anyone ever taught me. And then I don't believe we landed on the moon. I don't believe there is a moon, and I don't. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, that the Earth is, uh, you know, is the Earth, the earth is, a, is a disc. And you're like, Michael, that is such an extrapolation. Just because mm -hmm. I believe in Sagittarius and Virgo, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean I think that the Earth is flat. And yet, four percent of millennials, that number mm -hmm. is rising, believe that the Earth is flat. There is a correlation. When you decide that there is no objective truth, you have your truth and objective mm -hmm. truth. OJ either did or did not kill Nicole, and it doesn't fucking matter what Rollo or I think about mm -hmm. it. He did or he did not. There is not our truth, there is the truth. Mm -hmm. If you cannot identify a the truth, the problems start coming mm -hmm. from there, and now I have family members who teach their children, you know, teach them, uh, teach their children, that biology isn't real, evolution isn't real. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just thinking like, now I got family members who can never get a job in any scientific field mm -hmm. because we, we've chosen to, to do this. And so that part is scary to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, I have a friend of mine, he's, um, he's, I'm not gonna say where, but he is a professor at a Ivy League university. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Michael, the stuff that you talk about, of course mm -hmm. it's empirically true. But if I were to say this kind of stuff, lose your I would lose my mm -hmm. tenure and so mm -hmm. I can't. Now let's, let's go to one other thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Obviously Dr. Buss and I, I feel a kinship because we're both Longhorns. Mm -hmm. And you had a problem with the name of the beginning of his book, which is When Men Behave Badly. Do you remember this? I read the, I, I got, uh, let's see, I read that book, what, three months ago, four months ago? Yeah. Um, my own, okay, so my problem with is, and, and, and Dr. Buss is just 
one of these guys, by yeah. the way. It's, I, could, I could also make a case for Jeffrey Miller. I could make a case for even uh, who I really uh, admire, uh, uh, Steven Pinker. A lot of people hate him because I think he was on Jeffrey Epstein's like photo list or some yeah. shit like that, right? When he wrote The Blank Slate, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Also, I, I often quote Marty Hazel, Dr. Marty Hazelton. Yes. She's an a evolutionary psychologist who uh, really stu- her, she's, you know, put her mark on the map for uh, ovulatory shift, right? Um, and so she's hated by feminists because she exposes like the, the nuts and bolts of female nature and, and, and uh, the ovulatory cycle and everything else and, and the behavioral aspects of that. They hate her, but yet in her book, uh, Hormonal, she'll still try to uh, get her feminist street cred, right? She'll be like, I, I'm really a feminist, I'm really for, for women's rights and everything, but here's the studies I have and they're kind of unflattering, you know, and then yeah. try to soften the, you know, sugarcoat the data. Um, so when I, when I see some, or even, uh, Dr. Hector Garcia wrote a great book called alpha God. I suggest you, yeah, I bought one it of my, I, my favorite I books of all yeah. time. Um, even Dr. Hector Garcia, it's the same thing. I have such a, a respect for them as statisticians, as research guys, as, uh, you know, c- of collecting the dots, but connecting the dots is something they don't want to do because if they do, they will lose their tenure. If they go out and they become uh, in any way popular, saying, or even uh, I think it was a P- Stephen Pinker has done uh, TED Talks where he said, men and women are different. Here's, the f- here's, what, here's what the data says. Uh, men are interested in things and women are interested in people. The reason the gender pay gap uh, exists is in, in the collective, in the whole, is because women choose these careers, okay? Because yeah. they are more nat- they have a natural proclivity to want to get into careers that are people careers because that's the women are more interested in people and men are more interested in things. And so that was just one aspect of a whole bunch that he went into. Very long, very great uh, dissertation that he gave. I believe it was a, text, a TED talk at a college or something. And then at the end of it, it's like, but I'm still a feminist and uh, don't, please don't cancel me. Right. Essentially was the sort of the disclaimer at the end of it. And I'm like, these guys can't say what they need to say. Or so but, what but happens they, is they, they try to they try to force fit yes. the data to fit their ideological mold okay, so, or what their personal lives so, mold is. So so I, I love this discussion. Satoshi Kanazawa, do you know who he is? The guy who wrote uh, yeah. uh, Why Beautiful People mm-hmm. Have More Daughters. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. talked to I I text him, yes. we email every once in a while. Satoshi Kanazawa was was canceled. He's now in Europe. Uh, fantastic evolutionary psychologist. He was canceled and is very, he's probably gonna be upset that I'm even bringing him up right now. He posted a study which basically showed which genders and which ethnicities had the best uh, time on dating apps. Mm -hmm. And he showed that in this one study that black women had a harder time on dating apps and published it Mm -hmm. and got fucking crucified for it. Mm -hmm. He just published numbers, okay? He also, Mm -hmm. the the study also showed that black men had an easier time on dating apps. Because he published this, he was fucking destroyed. Now, uh, your mm-hmm. uh, UT uh, Dr. Buss is at UT Austin. The other guy who wrote Alpha God, where, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Hector Garcia. He's at UTSA, mm-hmm. University of Texas San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Those are not like the rest of Texas. They, these are as blue as it gets. Mm-hmm. I do not blame Dr. Buss. First off, for writing a book called Why Women Have Sex, he better have a female co- co- mm-hmm. uh, co-author, it's Dr. Cindy Meston, number one, number one. Number two, I've been on that West Mall at UT Austin. Bro, they are liberal as shit. So I, I understand, doc, I want Dr. Buss to stay as a professor at UT mm-hmm. Austin. I think his laboratory is useful to the I world. I use his stats and research of course, all the time. His, his laboratory yeah. is useful for the world. If he's mm-hmm. gotta say whatever he's gotta say, I love David, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm all for it. So I understand. And also, the, the, the name of the book is Why Men Behave Badly. If you go into the book, they go deep into why women cheat. It is not a one-sided book. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. Second thing, I totally understand the first chapter. He goes hard on incels. He mm-hmm. goes hard on the manosphere. So I totally understand where that came from, too. Mm-hmm. And I asked him about it. I don't know if you saw my interview with him. Mm-hmm. I specifically talked about you. I asked him about specifically, like, like, do you understand a lot of the seduction community, red pill, manosphere stuff revolves around your work? And he's like, I didn't know anything about this. He's like, mm-hmm. oh, this isn't really, isn't really my uh, mm-hmm. battleground. But he's, his work, he's one of the most cited professors in the world. Uh, there's a study, oh, I can't remember which uh, magazine came out. He's the 19th most influential uh, oh, yeah. psychologist on the planet. Mm-hmm. To me, that's only because people don't understand evolutionary psychology. To mm-hmm. me, he's one. He's made a statement on my podcast that <laughs> you I- You have to actually read. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, he made a statement on my podcast that I stand by. I'd said this previously, but he put it better. There is no such thing as a non-evolutionary psychology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, All psychology sure. is evolutionary. There is no such thing as a non-evolutionary psychology. And so it's a, like, uh, you know, I, I like David personally, but in addition, I think his work is so important. Mm-hmm. It is because, because here's the problem. When you're like me, you know, I'm a political moderate. Mm-hmm. When you're like me, the right hates me because they don't like evolution and the left hates me because they don't like gender, gender roles. Mm-hmm. Evolutionary psychology has gender roles. 
in it and it has evolution in it. And so bo like I'm damned either fucking way. And so I understand <laughs> the, the right it. hates me because I'm about evolution and yeah. the left hates me because I'm, I'm about, about evolution. evolution. Well. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's the thing. There's no political dogma here, right? You guys have heard me criticize Biden and Trump on this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the, that's the thing that I thought was just really interesting about that. The first thing in the first book you wrote mm -hmm. that really hit me, I wrote it down, I still have the notes on this, is there's no such thing as a soulmate. I don't know if you've heard me yeah, talk yeah, about the, the, soulmate. Yep, nope, the soulmate. Yep, yep. So the soulmate thing. But how about this from a statistical standpoint? It makes mm -hmm. no sense. How about all the people we had? From a religious standpoint, I can prove it scripturally. Per, per, that doesn't it make doesn't make sense. No. But again, <laughs> again, we had Nick Santonastaso on here. He's mm -hmm. missing, he was born with missing two legs and one arm, right? Mm -hmm. He's, he only has a left arm. Uh, he was born that way. He's dating a huge social media influencer right now. Mm -hmm. Now he's in a, a unique position, but there's a lot of people born with deformities. I see him like all this. the time. Everybody goes, doesn't that just prove your, your yeah. theory? Yeah. So, so th this, this issue, no, but the, my, my point is, well, mm -hmm. my point is there's so many people born. If you're born with spinal bifid, I don't know if you guys know what this is. The lower spine does not form correctly. And so there's a, a flooding of, of spinal fluid that has to be dumped back into the brain. Mm -hmm. And these children usually don't live past the age of 17. Don't tell me they have a fucking soulmate. They don't have a soulmate. They were born with a deformity and they're probably going to die. And that's fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are children born in third world countries that die virgins that get blown up when they're young, hunting for, mm -hmm. hunting for diamonds. Those people don't have a soulmate. So you don't get a soulmate because you were born middle class in North America and you watched fucking Mean Girls and Moulin Rouge. That doesn't mean you get a Moulin fucking Rouge. soulmate <laughs> because you have a pumpkin spice latte. You don't mm -hmm. get a fucking soulmate. Mm -hmm. You get what you deserve. You remember Christian Okoye mm -hmm. led, led the League in Russia in 1989? Yep. Christian Okoye didn't wait for a hole. He didn't wait for a soulmate. He mm -hmm. made that motherfucker. He mm -hmm. ran people over. He put people in the dirt. Bo Jackson, mm -hmm. guys like that. You remember? You know what I'm talking about? Michael exactly. Allstott. Ma Marion Barber the third. Yeah. Marion Barber the third rest in peace. Those guys made a hole for themselves. That is how life actually works. Mm -hmm. That's the part when you said there's no soulmate. It wasn't to me. It wasn't about one. I just, it was right. mathematics. Uh -huh. It was mathematics. It didn't make any sense to me. That'd be yeah. a soulmate. Go from, ahead. From a pragmatic perspective. Yes, it does not make any difference. Yeah. And I, I, I had to learn that the hard way because, uh, and I'm, I don't want to get into too much specifics, but I, I remember when uh, someone very close to me committed suicide and it wasn't the actual suicide per se that affected me. It was the aftermath and all of the things that happened after it, right? So now that he's dead and gone, who's your soulmate, right? It's mm. the same. And I, the reason why I brought up the scriptural thing is like, you know, there's that part in the Bible where they try to get Jesus and they say, you know, uh, so and so had a wife and then his brother died and then he died and he died and he died. And there's to like seven, seven of these guys married the same woman. Who gets the woman in, in heaven as the. As yeah, the wife, right? Yeah. You probably remember that, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, Jesus says, you know, uh, well, there is no giving in marriage, so screw you guys. You know, yeah. you, you, don't, you just don't know what you're talking about, basically, is what he said. Um, but even from, like, sort of that sort of poetic scriptural thing, it's, it tells a greater truth, which is it's because you're fixated on this idea of having a, having a soulmate or having somebody. If you marry someone, then they go off into heaven with you, and then you're with them in heaven kind of thing. That is a, the reason why I put, if you read my first book, the very first chapter of that, I thought, okay, if, if people read this book and they get through one chapter and they throw it away, what's the most important thing in that message I can you know, leave them with? And it is, there is no one. There are some good ones and there are some bad ones, but there is no one. So statistically speaking, if uh, you know, the, the, the second son or third son or fourth son or fifth son or whatever, who's, who's soulmate? is the, the original wife at that point. And so I got into this uh, sort of, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's philosophical, but like even a statistical thinking about it. I'm like, why is the soulmate myth or the idea that there's some one perfect girl or guy out there for you that you're destined to meet and you'll only ever be with that one and that one's the, gonna be your most satisfying sexual experience and your most satisfying lifetime experience and that's the one you're going to marry, and that's the one that God preordained you from birth to, to meet. And you'll have women who are like 45, 50 years old who are saying, I'm still waiting for the Lord to give me the one, you know? And what it is, it's, I think it's the single most damaging mythology yes. that we have yes. ever perpetrated on humanity. Because, like, like I said, there's, there are, like, I love my wife dearly. Is she my soulmate? Yeah, okay, fine. You can, she, you can make a case for that. But the thing is, is like, there are a lot of other women who you can click with, right? There are a lot of other good ones out there. And just because you didn't get with the, you know, Susie at the homecoming dance and you thought she was your one, maybe, you know, it's not that you can't develop and build another relationship. It really comes back down to is 
it's, it's, a, it's a mythology that we have perpetuated really since, uh, it's called the romantic ideal. If you read my religion book, you'll, there's a whole chapter on it. The romantic ideal is this, is that there's only one perfect person for another, for another person. It's a derivative from courtly love, from um, uh, chival- you know, people say, oh, women say, oh, there's no such thing as chivalry anymore. No, what you're referring to isn't chivalry. You're referring to courtly love, which got added to the chivalric mm. code way back in medieval times, right? So, but how do we get a species who is innately promiscuous to be monogamous because that is the the foundation of Western society. How do we make it so that the majority of men are going to be able to reproduce? And whether they do successfully or not, we can't just have a society built on alpha chads who are sharing this pool of women who are only fucking these girls and putting out all their Abraham Abraham of old, like the the patriarchs of old, where they have concubines, they got three wives or whatever else. How do we... As, as the 80% of guys, the beta males, how do we stop the top, you know, four and a half percent, you know, 20% of guys from tyrannizing or dominating the sexual marketplace? Well, we make monogamy, the socially enforced monogamy. And mm. the, by the way, that's not something Dor- Jordan Peterson came up, pulled out of his ass one time. There's uh, Go look it up on Wikipedia. We create a society that reinforces and rewards monogamy and stigmatizes fucking around. Yeah. That's why we're still, you know, when people say, oh, you're, you're 45 and you're not married yet, Mike? Oh my God, there must be, are you gay? When are, you, when are, are you, you gay? When are you going to grow yeah, up, Yeah, Michael? exactly. When, when are you, you going to grow, grow up? up? That's why that stigma exists because we're still in that monogamous sure. mythology. And so how do we reinforce that with magical thinking? How, because most people, I could go and explain to you why monogamy makes sense. Big head babies. I just did a moment sure. ago. Yeah. But I can't, if, if you're 18 years old and you want to get your dick wet, and I go, you know what? Monogamy might be the best thing for you. And if I can convince the alphas to do that, and I convince all this, you know, the vast majority of males to believe that God said that monogamy is the only way you're going to be able to, you know, that's the only way you're ever going to have sex. Well, now we take that and we build, build upon that. There's, there's religious mythology and then there's secular mythology as well. The, soul, the uh, soulmate myth is secular mythology that sure. reinforces monogamy as an ideal to say there's only one for you and you know you it's you'll have this one beautiful you know we we hear it in you know 80s power ballads you know you know uh we hear it in uh we see it in in disney movies we see it in romantic literature uh hell even katie perry had the one that got away you want to know why the al- the um the alpha widow dynamic is so endemic for women is because of the soulmate myth. Sure. He's the one. He was, I really feel he was the one. I'm going to divorce my my great husband with who I had three kids with, and I'm going to go and get... Sex life. Stella got her groove back, man. Eat, pray, love. I'm going to divorce this loser, and I'm going to go back and see if I can find the one... And really what she's saying is she says, I want to go back and have a good time with the alpha Chad that I fucked in the foam cannon party back in college, but I got to have a rationale that says I got to leave this perfectly good guy with three kids so I can go to Jamaica and find some dick swinging dude to go and have, that's my one, right? I got to go to how Stella got her groove back. How eat, pray. It's, it's what we call divorce porn, right? Convincing women that they, it's okay and they're incentivized to divorce a guy for cash and prizes and they're going to get a better dude because right before, uh, it's called sticking the landing, right? Right before they hit 40, so they're still hot enough to get the guy that they think is their soulmate from way back in the in day. In two weeks, I am actually going to be in a foam cannon party in Jamaica. In Jamaica, and Paradise I will, and, I will, <laughs> and I will be taking videos and sending them to Rolo Tomasi. 100% I'm going to yeah, be Yeah, and Mike Tang, you better be in those videos. Yeah, too. for sure. Mike, for sure. Uh, no, I mean, go back to what you said before like um uh with when when we talk about the divorce uh you know people wanting to be with somebody forever monogamy as a social construct was something that happened because we wanted again you understand this idea that we pick who we marry for the first two thousand three thousand years let's say m- marriage is eleven thousand years let's put it with the sumerians it's eleven thousand years old we're, <laughs> we're we're fucking we're taking two groups of wealthy landowners and marrying their children together and now we have a tax-free ability to transfer wealth mm-hmm. and we keep them together and we make sure that genetic line works. This idea that they fell in love with each other, we're talking the 16th century maybe, mm-hmm. something like that, Romeo and Juliet. It was That's before what, the romantic ideal. Yes. Shakespeare. And, you know, it, was before, yeah. it was before the idea that, um, that it was men's chivalric duty 
to uh, defend Milady's honor. Like yeah. that was a reason to have a joust, right? Yeah. That was a reason to have a duel. Um, did you ever see that movie, The Last Duel? It was no. basically over, okay, well, I, I don't, spoiler alert, but it was basically over a rape, essentially, yeah. is what it was, and defending Milady's honor kind of thing. And it was a fascinating, it, was, I, 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 it got panned, but it was actually a fascinating uh, uh, story, because it's a true story, it was a real story. Mm. And um, so, like, looking into, like, how they, how we did things with respect to, like, you know, defending Milady's honor, and like, it, you got to remember, like, right then, that, that shit was new. It was a new concept yes. for them to do that kind of stuff and to like really get so pissed off that you would kill another man for the honor of, you know, for you, the honor you, of a you, woman. Have you read The Murderer Next Door by Dr. David Buss? Like no. something like 78% of murders are men killing other men over women. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, 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 what was it? Uh, is it Claire Lehman who said, uh, she, I think some of her stats were, um, yes, yeah, like something like that, 90 yeah. some odd percent of, uh, of, of deaths or violent deaths between men over, in the past were over sexual access. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, so I was just going to say is that the uh, the idea of uh, monogamy as a social construct or it, it, it serves a purpose. I'm not uh, I'm not against monogamy. I'm mm. not against like spinning plates. Clearly, I'm not against necessarily uh, promiscuity per se because I understand that it's part of human nature. But I think that for a, a how do you build a society? How do you build a you know how do you organize a society in the most efficient way? Well. How are you going to have all these horny motherfuckers running around, you know, wanting to get laid? And you're saying, well, you can only get laid if you have a dowry and if you have like seven heads of cattle. And but uh, but but, you know, even Fadlan over here can can have four wives and you that means three of you ain't getting any wives. And that is going to be something that's going to, you know, cause a lot of, of violent deaths for sexual access. Yeah. So when you look at countries that are. Uh, primarily based on polyamory or polygamy, um, you'll see that they are far more violent. Yeah, we're uh, talking about Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern countries where Middle you Eastern, That's why yeah. the Arab Spring happens, right? Because yeah. you have all these guys who are between the ages of 18 and 29. They got no, pr they got no pr prospects. They can't get laid because they're not supposed to get laid because they, they don't have a job and they can't marry anybody. And so yeah, they're, they're, are they going to rebel? Are they going to go fuck things up? Yeah, the, pro the likelihood is there. The probability is certainly there. So when I, when I, when I look at things like that, I got I to gotta sort of balance or reconcile human nature as promiscu promiscuity versus monogamy being something that organizes society. Because when you look at like Western society, the success of it being founded on socially enforced monogamy um, it, it provided at least the idea. The, oh, there's a soulmate out there for me? Sure. I, I'm, I'm, this I'm Quasimodo, and I might be able to get that, that cute little girl to come into the bell tower with me. Like, that story means that I, there's someone for everyone. Like, yeah. uh, was it Kenny Rogers, you know, the coward of the county. There's someone for everyone, right? That narrative gets replayed over and over and over again to the point where we say, okay, well, that's the proper way, the right way that we should be doing things. We don't really understand, we don't question the, the mechanics behind that. Why, is, what's the latent purpose mm. of that? But we will have this, this very big discussion about why you shouldn't be banging a whole bunch of women because mm. that is, it kind of goes against the idea that there's someone out there for me and if you're fucking all these chicks, one of those chicks might have been my soulmate, yeah. and you fucked her up for me, exactly and now right. I gotta untangle her head. And uh, I think it was I did a show called uh, "Licking the Ice Cream," right? It was uh, Hafiz from the Roommates was talking about like how guys would go into an ice cream shop and they would lick each flavor of the ice cream, you know, like each one of these is a chick, yeah. right? And so when you get in there and you find out that all these flavors, you, you know, you want to pick a flavor, and suddenly you look and see some other dude has been licking your ice cream, kind of thing. It goes back to the alpha widow dynamic. It goes back to the idea that now if guys who are alphas who can break out of that monogamous, socially enforced monogamy, right? If they can break out of that or if we have like some uh, social imperative that says, yeah, go ahead and fuck around, right? What that does is it crushes the soulmate myth or the, even the perception of the soulmate myth because the ice cream you licked or the, the, one of the chicks that's in your sort of sexual history, that might be that guy's future wife. For sure. And now you're the alpha that he is widowed from, and he fucking hates Bro, I am you actually, or anyone that looks like you. I am you. actively yeah. on today's date experiencing mm. this, like today right now experiencing this. Uh, let's go to, to, to another explanation from a socioeconomic standpoint, mm. what you were just trying to explain before. If I am a government and mm. I want to increase the population of, of, of my community, it is 
I have two advantages for enforced monogamy. Number one, um, if you go to the Macomb School of Business at UT Austin, there's a the family unit is standing outside. It's a, a man, a woman, and a child. The family unit is sort of the basis of consumerism for a capitalist nation, mm -hmm. because the 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 um, the family unit consumes. It buys two cars, it buys two televisions, it buys two cell phones, it has mm -hmm. a mortgage, it does all these kind of things, and it runs up to levels of debt. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the reason why you do that. The other thing is, as like you said before, uh, we have fewer and fewer men that has zero options. If we are arranging marriages or enforcing monogamy, mm -hmm. now you have men at the bottom of the evolutionary scale or the bottom of the status scale, and they're having sexual mm -hmm. intercourse as opposed to strapping bombs to themselves and blowing up a coffee shop in Tel Aviv. That's, that's the reason why we uh, force monogamy. But here's the trick. What I do now in order to encourage these things, the monogamy, which allows for me to have a higher population, allows me to you know r have more socioeconomic advancement and allows me to uh, have less violence. What, what I do is now I try to convince you it was always like this. So I make up movies mm -hmm. like Cinderella because then it was because it was always like this. Mm -hmm. I show you Hallmark cards because it was always like this. Mm -hmm. But then you take two seconds to go look at our evolutionary past, our anthrop anthropological past. You find out Genghis Khan was not interested in the soulmate. He was raping Definitely everyone not. who was in front of him, yes. and and that that that's the case that that was happening. So we don't talk about that. Whenever people talk about soulmate, I just think about like what if you were <laughs> if you were some living in Tibet like back in mm -hmm. you know in the fifteenth or the 13th, I can't remember, uh, Genghis Khan lived at the end of the 13th century, I believe. When, when you're living in Tibet and then all of a sudden this gang of raiders comes in and rapes mm -hmm. all, like kills all the women there. Are they, where's your soulmate? Wait, what happened Which to your one soulmate? was your soulmate? Which one was your yeah, soulmate? I'm that sorry, Genghis that Kansas one did or this one did? This one, which here. one was your soulmate here? Uh, 60 <laughs> yeah. million people dying in 1919 from the Spanish flu. Which one of them was your soulmate? Were they, did they all have soulmates? The little kids who died? Like mm -hmm. again, it's just, the, the, when you it's use- It's a mythology the, that's used to reinforce correct. socially enforced monogamy. I would just rather know the truth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And again, uh, here's, here's the, the main question, the big question for the red pill. Would you rather be happy or would you rather, rather be right? Rather know the truth. Yep. I tell people, when you, when you join an MOA, you paid me for the fucking truth. If it makes you unhappy, I'm sorry. And people outside of mm -hmm. MOA or people who don't watch my podcast, I don't care if you know the truth. You get to learn the truth when you come on here. Mm -hmm. That is my responsibility. If it makes you upset, don't watch. But this is, you're only going to get things that are, very rarely do I express opinions on here. I express mm -hmm. things that are based in science or either in something anecdotally where I've seen numerous people I know, experiencing. it's like banging your head against For the sure. wall too. Because so, I, I tell you that every time I try to, I, I try to make this a, a, a point, it's like, when people come at me and they have criticisms of the red pill, one of the most common one is, it, well, first of all, they're, they're arguing from a position of ignorance. They have no earthly clue what I've said in the past, who mm. the fuck I am, never read my book, don't care. They just heard a few, you know, 30 second clips. You know, Andrew Tate has talked about this as well. It's like, that's the, your total assessment of, of who I am in this capacity. I've been doing this for 20 some odd years. So I can't expect everybody to be 100% up on everything I've ever done. However, I've always expressed this is that the red pill is not an ideology. It is not a philosophy. And that's the first thing out of anybody's mouth because they can't interpret it or can't process it in, in well, really anything, but like the red pill in particular, because it conflicts with a lot of their beliefs, but they can't interpret it through any other lens than philosophy, ideology, or belief or religion or whatever. Like it's a cult. Roland Tomasi's a cult leader. It's like, no dude, I am connecting dots and you can tell me what you think about those dots. Am I equipping guys? Am I helping guys um, with uh, giving them the tools to live a better life? Yes, yes I am. I hope I am. I hope I'm saving lives by giving you access to information so that you can go and build a better life. But it all comes back to one thing. Would you rather be happy or would you rather be no, right? Yeah. And so I don't deal in shoulds, I deal in is. And so when people say, well, well the red pill philosophy is this, I like click. Because yeah. if you say philosophy, I already know that I'm dealing with a guy who's seeing this through a, through a, a, a filter or a lens of belief. And what, the reason why they do that is because they, for they can't see it through any other way. But also if they can say or they can turn the red pill into a belief or a cult yeah. or a philosophy or an ideology, then they can attack it in just in the same way as we would attack like uh, social constructionism or anything that the woke wants to make subjective or relative. Now it's a belief set. Now you're a televangelist. Now you're a cult leader and that they can, they can argue with. They can't argue with the facts. They can't argue with empiricism. They can't argue with objective sure. reality, but they can say, well, it's an ideology and I can, I can, that's, I can argue against that. Yeah. You're a really bad man, Rolo. When Johannes Kepler came up with the laws of planetary motion, 
that was not an ideology or a philosophy. And then later on when Isaac Newton came up with the laws of motion mm -hmm. from, from Johannes Kepler's uh, observations, that is not a philosophy that he came up with. Those are laws of motion. Later on, the, the laws of thermodynamics, though, that is not a philosophy. Evolutionary psychology is not a philosophy. Evolutionary Study. psychology, yeah. evolutionary mm -hmm. psychology, they're, they're, and, and again, a lot of people are like, well, why should we trust these studies? I'll give you a couple reasons. Number one, most of them are done anonymously. Like for instance, why women have sex? The women are surveyed anonymously. And number two, and this one I really love, when you look at people's uh, porn searches, when you look at people's Google searches, you actually get a much truer uh, understanding of who they are and what they believe in. Mm -hmm. And so there are different ways uh, of surveying these people. But the problem is what should happen is if any of these uh, evolutionary psychology studies are incorrect, you, they should be falsifiable. Mm -hmm. And you, what you should do is have an, an alternate study that mm -hmm. shows that they're falsifiable. And that never, ever ever happens. The best way, Dr. Buss, he, uh, or actually it was Gad said who said this, evolutionary psychology is falsifiable and has never been falsified. The same thing mm -hmm. with like the, the uh, pr parental investment hypothesis, mm -hmm. basically in any two gender species, the gender that has more parental investment is going to be the select, the more selective of the two genders. There is no mm -hmm. example where this does not exist. Even when you deal with like seahorses where the males carry the children, mm -hmm. the males are more selective. It's just the way that it is. Evolutionary psychology is not a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Evolutionary psychology is a study of science mm -hmm. and that's what that's what makes it so difficult and mm -hmm. why people hate it so much mm -hmm. is because of that's that whole why thing. i always harp on the idea that the red pill is like the chilton manual mm -hmm. uh you know what chilton manual is like when you know what chilton manual no. is okay yeah. like if you're an uh, auto mechanic it's okay, a manual yeah, yeah, for, for sure. the car like we call these it, are the parts numbers and here's how you put together I, I, yeah. a v you know 69 we, we call it a, we call it air force tech order with yeah the okay yeah. yeah it's the chilton yeah, manual for sure. that's what it is it's not meant to tell you you know question your belief in god or, or, or you know, your, your uh, convictions of, of how you think men and women ought to be. These are, th this is just what it is. That's why I harp on the word praxeology. And yes, God damn it, it is a praxeology and it is based on empiricism. And what happens is people, when they look up praxeology, they think of it in terms of economic terms because yeah. I, yes, I, I know, I do know this, but if you go back and you look at the, def the original definition of praxeology, it is the study of human behavior from the perspective that human behavior has a purpose and has a function behind it. What's the latent well, interse function? Intersexual That's why yeah. I call it a praxeology. For sure. In, well, intersexual, fuck's sake. <laughs> in, intersexual yeah. dynamics mm -hmm. has an economy to it. Obviously, there mm -hmm. is a supply and demand, so it is an economy. Like I, I don't have mm -hmm. a problem with that. There's only so, again, as I make more money and I get more social media followers, you'd be shocked. I'm let you guys know this. More women seem to want to date me. It's fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it, but it seems to happen because it's an, it is a function of it's economics. It's crazy how that happens. It is crazy how that happens. Let's talk and about the, this. And the more jacked and juicy you get. It's crazy <laughs> let, how that happens. Let's talk about this. Uh, Washington Post post uh, posted these studies a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You show them sometimes these uh, these graphs. One of them is 28% of men showing zero sexual partners between the time. Uh, GSS studies. The, yeah, uh -huh. the GSS studies. Can we go over some of those? Because mm -hmm. a lot, I show these to women and they're just like, I don't understand. What are you talking about? Every got, guy knows sure a whore. Make Every guy knows sure fucks. Make sure you get all every, of them. Make sure you got all of them. What are you talking them. about? The, the, mm -hmm. the, the fucking VIP host I had sex with. He's He hasn't had seven sexual partners. He's had 700. What are you talking about? And, and I'm like, Hey, did you look at the guy who gave you your hamburger at Wendy's? Who's fucking him? Did you look at the... Who's at, his soulmate? Who's his soulmate? <laughs> did you look at the, the, the person, the cashier at Walmart? Would you have had sex with him? No, not only would you not have had sex with him, you didn't notice he existed. Mm -hmm. So invisible. when I show you this whole thing, 28% of men having zero sexual partners in the last year, and you don't believe it, you do, these 28% of men, you legitimately don't recognize they exist. You wonder where Andrew Tate came from? is because you ignored that they existed. Let's say everything Andrew Tate said is wrong and everything Red Pill is wrong. Let's just play devil's advocate. All of it's wrong. You st you think that these people just don't exist? You're gonna wave your hand as a feminist and be like, well, fuck you, I don't agree with your opinion, therefore you disappear? Do you think they disappeared? Do you think that they, they don't have internet access? Mm -hmm. Do you think that they don't vote? They have no mm -hmm. economic uh, guidance whatsoever. Do you think that they don't have feelings, that they don't have testosterone, they don't have muscles, they don't have the ability to work, the ability to type? Sounds a lot like Female solipsism, doesn't it? I mean, it's just it's just a situation where like you have to admit that they existed. Now, let's go over these studies specifically. The two, the one had to do with virginity, twenty seven percent of men. Mm -hmm. What was that? It was like between the eighteen and thirty. What was? Do you remember? Do you remember those studies? Okay, so between okay, so the study was between I want to say it was two thousand eight and twenty eighteen. Yeah. So and it was part of the general survey study, which is like an American. It's so this is the United States here, mm -hmm. okay, and it corresponds with uh, the census at, at the time as well. Yeah. So they take that every ten years, as we know. Um, so the, 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 the stats basically show this is that, uh, it was like 28% of men, 
uh, between 2008 and 2018 are literally having no sex, zero, yeah. like no sexual partners. And it has astronomically risen since about 2010. Well, 2007 is when you, you first see the, the hockey stick spike. And that mm -hmm. is the year that the Facebook app was introduced to, right. was introduced to the iPhone. It's also the year when women started taking, white women started taking uh, antidepressants uh, at astronomical numbers as well. If you look at the spike in that, and you, what I've done, by, by the way, I have used that. Everybody in the manosphere has used that, yeah. that, that, that stat. But what they don't do, that's one data point, yeah. okay? You have to take those data points and you have to like correlate them with other data points. So from the, even from the same study, you can see that, uh, and that's just 18 to 29. If you go and you look past 29 up until 45, men are still having less sex even in of those course. other demo. We don't care, you know, once you're past the 29 demographic, who gives a shit, right? But we, we see that and we see that astronomical spike because those ones are the people who are, those are the guys who are gonna have the Arab Spring, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but then when you look at women, and you see that they're, it's jumped just a little bit. They're having less sex, but not nearly as much as like young yep. men between the same demographic cohort, right? So when you look at that, how do we correlate or how do we interpret that one data point? I interpret it as this, is that we have, of course, we're you know, in a social media environment right now. There we're in a, in a sexual marketplace that is globalized sexual marketplace. Yeah. Uh, we can literally see statistically hypergamy right there. Okay, so what happens is, it depends on what your ideological bent is, so when you rep when I have heard like uh, Matt Walsh or PragerU report these exact same numbers, you know what they're saying? Oh, it's because young women are fucking older guys. It's because they're having sex with older men who are uh, more more uh, made and they're more mature and whatever. And what that does is it feeds into the personal responsibility grift that they all promote. So it's like, well, if men would just take more responsibility and get off their asses and, and start being you know better, then women would be better and you'd be getting laid, right? No. Women are sharing the hot alphas is what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. How about we talk about that? You will never hear that from Dennis Prager. You will never hear that from Daily Wire. You will never have that correlation made because it is unflattering to female nature. And we all think that to, to solve men's problems is to pile on more and more responsibility for those guys without having any single, any authority in that as it is. But still, it points a really ugly finger at hypergamy being true. Here it is right here. It's not, it's not that these women want to fuck old dudes on yachts. They're fucking guys and they're sharing that guy. Yeah. So we're lean. And I, I, I made this point before we were talking about promiscuity and, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. where I, I did the show on, um, on Tim Burkhead's book. And I talked about this. I said, we're at a point, we're at a stage right now in society where women don't need men. They'll say this. Okay. Sure. I don't, we, I don't need no man. I make my own yeah. money. I'm, I'm walk like the boss and talk like the boss, you know? And they'll, they're will they very proud and very, uh, it's hubris is what it is. They get to that point and they say, I don't need no man, but I want a man. Okay, what kind of man do you want? I want the guy who looks like Andrew Tate. I want the guy who looks like Jason Momoa. I want the guy who's going to give me the, the, the highest, hottest fucking sex I can get, who is the apex alpha, and hopefully I'll be able to lock him down. But if I can't, I'm more than willing to share that guy, either directly or indirectly, whether I cop to it or I don't. And so what you're seeing right now is you're seeing a reversal and a sort of a return to polygamy, but it's not men that are doing it. It's women who have, see that as the only choice for the men they want to get with because they don't need those beta men who are in that 28% right there. They don't need those guys anymore for provisioning, protection, or parental investment yeah. because either they've got a college degree, they've got a business degree, they've got a business themselves. They're, they've pretty much settled or perceptually mm. they've settled the idea that I don't need a man for the beta buck side of hypergamy. So the only thing that's left is fucking Jason Momoa yeah. in the so, party. so let's talk about this. <laughs> Women are always shocked whenever I bring this up, right? The average North American male has had seven sexual partners mm -hmm. in his entire life. Mm -hmm. So let's just look, let's look at this from a statistical standpoint. We know that first 28% of men are at zero, mm -hmm. right? And then when we get to the average, the mean, we're at seven. So let's just, let's keep graphing this out. Mm -hmm. we're, we, now we're at seven. Let's just say this top 60th percentile, we have had seven sexual partners. Mm -hmm. Once we get to the 80th percentile, we're talking 400 sexual partners. Once we get right. to the 90th percentile, we're talking about like Bilzerian, we're talking about 1,400, 1,500 sexual partners. For men, it looks like a hockey stick. It literally goes like oh, flat, man. and then it's a little bit, and then once you get above this certain style where you're like in the mm -hmm. top 10% of earners, you're good looking, whatever, the number of sexual partners happens 
I'm not trying to be an asshole and I'm not trying to be arrogant. Let me tell you from firsthand experience, this is absolutely true because I've been on both sides of the scale. It is not, it's not, you don't get, have a few more partners. It is unbelievably, it's 10 to one difference. So, and so when you see this, when you see this, the spike that happens, I don't blame women for this. I, do, I understand what happens is look, let's look at Amazon. Remember back in 1985, we would go to the hardware store for our hardware. Mm -hmm. We would go to the diaper store. We would go to a different store. We'd go to the nursery mm -hmm. for our plant shit. We would go to different stores <laughs> for different things. And go to Blockbuster now, for our videos. Blockbuster <laughs> for our videos. Now we go to Amazon for everything. So we see mm -hmm. how the internet globalized purchasing. And now mm -hmm. we almost all go to one place for all of our mm -hmm. shit. Why do you think that was going to happen any differently with dating? Of course, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? I'm just, I'm telling you, I was talking to Bilzerian, he said like something like 50% of the women he's been with are in relationships. Currently in relationships when they have sex with him. Like this, uh, this mm -hmm. idea that like, it really is like what you said before. There is this group of men at the top that are having all the sexual access and then there's this group mm -hmm. of men at the bottom who aren't. And this is not a cultural thing. This has happened throughout it's history. Biological, it, evolutionary. It's evolutionary. Things. Mubarak the bloodthirsty, 888 <laughs> children. You know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 from Morocco, the, read about him. The, this whole idea, it, now here's the, here's the thing. Here's where well, I differ from a lot of guys, okay? Not all of them, but that 28%, my whole thing is don't hate the game. Get in the fucking gym. That, Get in the game. Be a player correct. and not an average correct. dude. Know that th if this top 10% is the one that's winning, do everything in your power short of death mm. to get there. How much does it mean to you to get in that top 10%? Nobody loves women more than me. I, women are the way they are. I, you can tell me women like status and like guys who are taller than shorter. Have I gone to a party, been, been with a hot girl, and she walks off with some dude who's a male stripper? Who's, of course it's happened to me. It sucks. Doesn't make mm. me hate women. It's just evolution. You got swooped on. I got swooped on. So you know what? I'm going to hit that motherfucking bench press next week. And I'm going to... Don't I'm gonna, wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Yeah, wish you were better. Mm. Don't wish it was easier because it's not easier. If you wish it easier, that's when I see these dudes, like I said mm. before, moving to Panama, moving to fucking Eastern Europe. And they're just... Mm. I don't, I don't want to... So, I don't, I don't want to give up. But you understand so what I'm that, saying? Yeah, exactly. And so as I was saying before, when you look... At, I, I've done several shows on the GSS study. When you look at those stats you have to correlate them against other stats that really like you say okay it was 2008 to 2018 what else happened during that time well if you look at how college enrollment rates have declined for men and have skyrocketed for women and by the way i think one of the big mistakes that we make right now is i always hear the stat of how it's 60 percent women and 40 percent men in college enrollment yes enrollment not in graduation enrollment and we're having this conversation now because uh biden decided he wanted to forgive like ten thousand dollars of student debt which of course two-thirds of that is owned by women okay but that's for graduation if you look at graduation rates my daughter just graduated from unlv right she's got a master's degree i went and i looked at the stats you know being me right <laughs> to see uh what the what the gender uh, differential was it was like 68 or almost 70 percent women and 30 percent guys were graduating with a master's or above like a doctorate as well and i thought well that kind of like puts things into a, a different perspective it's one thing if you're going in there and you're enrolling did you complete it it, well, there's 60 percent women and 40 percent men. All right. Did you go through it? Okay. You went through four years of college. So, you went through so eight men years are of college, dropping out. Are dropping out exactly. Wow. So there's you have to look at those stats and then compare that versus the same time period as we see an increase in guys not getting laid, right? And then you can also you have to uh, look at uh, other like sort of demographic cohort s studies that go along with that. Um, and this is straight out of Dr. David Buss's book. Okay. 80% of men are deemed unattractive by women online, on Hinge, Bumble, Tinder, seeking arrangements, what, you know, whatever the Ten, updated Top 10% of men on Tinder are getting 63% of the right swipes, mm -hmm. and I believe the top 20% were getting, oh, it eight, it's like something that. like a 78 or 80% oh. of the right swipes. The top 20% mm -hmm. were getting 80% of the right swipes on, mm -hmm. on so, Tinder. So the mistake is that this is, the, that we call this the Pareto principle, or the 80-20 rule, right? Okay, so the mistake is to think this, is that 20% uh, of guys are fucking 80% of the women. No, that's not it, dumbass. Okay, 100% of women want to get with the top 20% of guys. That leaves 80% of guys who are the invisible ones, who are the sandwich artists, who that they completely women are completely oblivious to because they are unattractive. They are not, hmm, maybe he'll do. They are, I, would never even, they, I wouldn't even recognize his existence, right? Yeah. So you've got 80% of guys who are never going to get swiped or never going to get a, you know, a, a, a call back or an interest or a wave back or whatever the fuck it is. 
Um, so you got 80, those are the 80 percenters. That's why I always say the 80 percenters, like the beta males are 80 percenters, right? So then you got the 20 percenters who are the maybe. He might, he's not unattractive, but he's not necessarily attractive. It's just like, I would like, he's interesting enough that I would want to go meet that guy. Let's see if he's got what it takes. Then there are the four and a half percent of guys that women will actually. Are you actively, talking about two standard deviations? Is that why you pick four and a half percent? No, one, no, I didn't pick it. This is actually straight out of David Buss's re you, research. You, and uh, Rob Henderson, Steve Stewart Williams, David Buss, and I can't remember who Do you else. remember the one standard deviation is 68.2 percent? Yeah. Two standard mm -hmm. deviations is 95.5 is percent, mm -hmm. which means outside of two standard deviations would be four and a half percent. So like four would, and a half percent of the population is also homosexual. Four and a half percent, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of, four and a half percent actually comes out to be a lot of different numbers in a normal mm -hmm. distribution. Four and a half percent of guys are hot enough that women want to swipe and initiate a conversation with them to possibly have sex or possibly have a relationship or get a date. They are the ones that women will initiate with. So you've got the 20 percenters and of the 20 percenters that might do, four and the four and a half percent are the guys that are hot enough for women to go, yeah, I want to fuck that guy. That's the top 20 percent of the top 20 percent. And that's what, the, the, so the four, yeah, of the, of the four and a half percent. Um, that's the Justin Wallers. That's the Andrew Tates. That's the guys who are like way up top at the ape. That's you. That's the ape no, at the ape. Bro, Justin the, Waller right, came out with me. Justin <laughs> Waller came out with me one time, bro. And I was hanging out with these girls. I was uh, talking, and they all just stopped and just stared at Justin Waller. Mm. Justin Waller looks like a tight end, bro. He is, they, they, He's but, tall as fuck. So I, I, I've been at restaurants with him and and uh, and watched like just the average women go like. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, your table's right yeah. over here. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I, I can tell you stories about Jay. Yeah. That he won't want me to, to make public. But, yeah. uh, but anyways, uh, but there's, so you have the four and a half percenters. And really, uh, when guys tell me, oh, I'm not in the 20 percent, I'll never. I'm like, it's worse than that, dude. They could, women aren't actually actively coming to seek you. That is a data point that correlates with the other studies, mm -hmm. right? So it also reinforces hypergamy. So when we were talking about the OK Cupid, uh, um, Studies that say you know women of at, at 23 years of age are the are the are the peak demographic, and for for women they're looking for a guy in the long term. They're looking for a guy who's anywhere between three to seven years older than them, right? Okay, we can see that from old data, but we can also sort of infer hypergamy from those numbers. We can infer hypergamy from uh, the GSS studies. We can also infer hypergamy from uh, well, I'll just say David Buss's research uh, for those percentages. But so we see that women are gravitating towards the top apex guys who the four and a half percenters. How is that affecting those guys in the GSS study who are 28 percent aren't getting laid? Well, we can. Can we infer that the guys who are getting, you know, the swipes of the four and a half percent? Can we infer that those are the guys that maybe the women have been fucking for the last 10 years? Instead of, oh, they must want to get with older, more mature guys who have, you know, are, are more emotionally available and make up some cock and bull rationale around that rather than just say, you know what, there's two sides to hypergamy. There's alpha fucks and beta bucks. Mm. And you want to know why I get frustrated with Buss or with Peterson or, or, uh, or anyone else, or certainly uh, Hector Garcia. Why do I get frustrated with them? Because they have this mount of fucking evidence and you, it points, all the data points to what I've been talking about for the last 20 years. And like, nope, uh, must be older guys, right? Because it fits in with the narrative. I don't want to lose my tenure. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to. I don't blame him. Alienate I, half I of need, my audience. But I need him on that wall. I yes. need Dr. Buss on that wall. Oh, I do too. And yeah. I was going to say, I, I, as, a, as a statistician, as research, I will always quote them. People have given me grief about quoting Pinker before in the past. Yeah. I'm like, I don't care what he does. I want to know what the, what the freaking data is. And I'm going to make those connections. Connections because what happens is when we have like the alpha fucks and the beta bucks, the other side of, the, of that, like when you have Peterson talking about intersexual dynamics, he'll talk about only one side exists. It's only the beta buck side. Yeah. Oh, women want men with status. They want men with money. They want guys who are good fathers who are going to be parentally invested in, uh, you know, reproductive uh, costs and everything like that. But meanwhile, Chad is fucking you know, all these dudes in the, in the, you know, phone, licking the fucking ice cream over here. And you just completely, you know, tunnel, you know, tunnel vision with blinders on. Don't want to see that your little girl wants to fuck the guy on spring break. Yeah, she yeah. wants that. That's but, part of the, that's, that's the other side of it that you want to ignore because if you were to address that, you would get canceled, yeah. which is but, what happened to for, Andrew. For, for those of you who don't know, like from the incel community, a Chad means a dude who just naturally is good. I know a Giga lot of Chad. Are, Giga yeah. Chad or Alpha Chad, male. Chad Thundercock or yes. whatever. Chad just means a guy who just Dan Bilzerian. Yeah, for, who just walks in yeah. and just nor normally has just uh, all these things going on. Dan Bilzerian is definitely a, a Giga Chad. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, so 
going back to what you said before, um, let's let's talk about this because I do want to 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 move over into this section. You have made uh, several uh, videos where you talked about Andrew Tate probably should have expected what happened, yes. right? So when Andrew Tate was doing like I. Uh, full disclosure, I like Andrew. We talk on a, a, a couple times. I do too. I just yeah. texted him before yeah, we went on. Sure. He's probably watching right for now. For sure. Um, the thing is, you know, when he says, you know, women are property. No, my mom is nobody's fucking property. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to stand up when he says that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want the 19th Amendment, amendment repealed. Me neither, and I, I and women pick me up in their cars. All the, I now have some female friends with really nice cars. They pick mm -hmm. me up in their cars and they drive the motherfuckers. I don't care. So I, it's a little different for me, uh, but I still. I like him, and the, the idea of canceling him is absurd. First off, let's, let's go over a couple things. When they canceled Alex Jones, it tripled his revenue on InfoWars. When they canceled Donald Trump, it, it, he became the most Google person in the world. When the right tried to cancel Colin Ka Kaepernick, he became a martyr and got a Nike campaign. Mm. Cancel culture doesn't work. <laughs> Hadn't taken an cancel, NFL snap in three years. Cancel, he got Nike on his side. <laughs> cancel culture. Do, dude, he's, got, he's on Madden. He's actually yeah. back yeah. on Madden. <laughs> He cancel culture. Listen to me. Cancel culture doesn't work. I, I don't have a lot of opinions and I don't pl plant my flag often. This is where I'm planting my flag. I will literally and figuratively die for this one. I support people's mm -hmm. uh, ability to, to uh, express themselves. I had flat earthers on. Of course, I don't agree with the fucking flat earthers, what they say. I'm not going to stop them from saying what they want to say. Freedom of speech has two sides to it. One side is the good, happy ideas, right? Mm -hmm. the, the idea of a free market economy or Charles Darwin's idea of evolution, right? This mm -hmm. is free speech. A lot of churches didn't like that, that idea. The religious mm -hmm. sect didn't like when, um, when Galileo was saying that we, the earth goes around the sun. Free speech has a good side to it. Free speech also has the part where idiots go up there and say stupid shit. Mm -hmm. I want to hear dumb people say oh, yeah. stupid shit. Mm -hmm. It makes my life easier. I know who to vote for and who to buy shit from. Mm -hmm. Let them talk. That's the thing. When you cancel them, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I, have, uh, I swore into the U.S. Uh, uh, military in uh, February, uh, in February 21st, 2004, and I said I, I swear to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The First Amendment of the Constitution says a, a right of freedom of assembly, freedom of expression. Uh, I don't, that, I will fucking die. When I talk to people who are like, mm -hmm. hey man, I want to change my gender. Motherfucker, I will kill someone to allow you to, if you want to change your gender, I support your ability to do that. People want to get married that are gay, I support your ability to do that. Because even when people were sitting there kneeling, I wouldn't have knelt if I was in the NFL, but I support their ability to do that. Mm -hmm. We can't, it's so crazy to me when I listen to female social media influencers who had their accounts taken away for no fucking reason mm. sitting there okay with this. Let me ask you a question. If you're a female influencer right now and they took your account away because you have boobs, you know who I'm talking to. Mm. There's hundreds of you watching this shit right now, thousands. When they took your account away, when they suspended you for animal cruelty and there were no animals on your account, you remember that? You know who I'm talking to. Did you think that it was cool when they took Andrew Tate's account away? Do you think Meta now has more power or less power. And let me ask you something. Since he didn't get due process, the next time they take your account away because you have a butt, do you think you're going to get due process now? <laughs> it's really funny, and it's fun to say, hey, you know what? Uh, Germany invaded Austria, but that's not my fucking problem. Well, then Germany invaded Poland. That's not my fucking problem. And Neville Chamberlain watches Germany invade France. Okay, maybe it's my fucking problem. Mm. And then they start bom bombing London. Now it's your fucking problem. Well, you know what? They got rid of Neville Chamberlain. That's essentially what happened. For those of you, read a book if you don't know about yeah, World War II. Please do. Please yes. read a book. Don't okay? listen to it. Read it. It's fun, <laughs> and it's fun to cancel people when they don't agree with you. But someday, mark my words, they're going to come for you. And when they do, who is going to be there to support you? I don't care if what you say is so fucking antithetical to what I believe. I will die to support your right to say it. And I will never ever support the right of anybody to cancel anybody for shit. Mm. When, I forget oh, whose who's quote that was. Like, I don't agree with what you have to say, but I would die for I, your I right would to die say. for your right I, to say. I, I forget the, the quote. But, yeah. uh, Alex Jones, when he said the mm. stuff about the, you know, the, the, uh, the Sandy Hook shit, when the, the people were all actors mm. or whatever, he had the right to say it. And then those families had the right to sue his ass. Mm -hmm. And he lost a defamation case. Both things can be true. I am not, I cannot, I happen, again, well, let me say this again. I happen to like Andrew. If I didn't like Andrew, I'm still co so completely against this idea that you cancel him. 
after he was canceled on uh, 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 Tristan Tate's channel, they used to get 20,000 people on a live stream, 130,000 oh, people more than on their live stream. It was actually 145,000 on Rumble. I was on it. That's why I watched How, uh, for an hour and 15 minutes. There's your, hey, cancel culture. <laughs> That's what you get. That's what you get. You can argue with me. You can tell me that I'm wrong. It doesn't make any fucking difference what you say. Cancel culture doesn't work. Cancel culture doesn't work. So this is where I take, you know, I don't, I don't like to express a lot of opinions on here. I like to, uh, I, I joke with my friends anymore. I don't have opinions anymore. I just have podcast segments. Yeah. <laughs> this is my opinion. This is not my opinion. Uh, this is a fact. This doesn't work. It's stupid. It's bad. And it sends it sends everything backwards. One more thing. Meta, I got news for you. You're not a champion for women. You, no one hates women more than you. You sit there and you give women the ability to make a living. Then when, they, when you say, well, this is too lascivious, you're being sexually suggestive. Then you take away their Instagram account. Okay, cool. You take away their Instagram account. Well, I'm going to go make money on OnlyFans. Oh, uh, no, you can't make money on OnlyFans either. Bro, what is that? You want to talk about grooming? What the fuck is that? They can't make money any. They can't make money with you. They can't make money with anyone else. Got it. Understand that. You're not a champion for women because you cancel Andrew Tate. You're a fucking hypocrite. Sorry. No, I was going to say, so I, I, uh, I was uh, asked, when was the last? Oh, I, I was on with Jedediah Bila, and we had this conversation. And I said, this is like, uh, like, that's the constitutional American, you know, this is why we have free speech, you know, but you got to remember, why is it? And where did that, where did that amendment, the First Amendment, right? Where did that come from? Well, King George the, was a I, motherfucker. The, yeah, was, that, yeah, that too. But it also comes from the idea, I want to say it's Hellenic, you know, Greece or some shit like that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I'm probably going to butcher this. But the idea is this, is that the, the only way to test the strength of an idea is in the crucible of open debate. Open debate. And if you do not have a crucible of open debate, you will never come to objective truth. So if somebody says something that's, you know, we never landed on the moon. Okay, I'm willing, you have the right to say that. I have the right to, I have the right to tell you you're full of shit. But if I can go and look at this or the sky is blue and it's not blue, right, whatever. You can go and say whatever the hell you want to say, and the fundamental right to do that is one thing. What you're expressing is the other thing. So, but you will never be able to come to uh, the idea of what objective truth is unless you can have that conversation in the first place. So, Andrew Tate is not the first one to get canceled. I remember when Milo Yiannopoulos got kicked off of Twitter because he said something about that that big big girl in uh, in Ghostbusters, uh, the big black girl in Ghostbusters. I, don't know. I can't remember yeah. who, what her name was. It was the all female version of Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. They kicked him off, um, and that was that was like sort of like my introduction. Hey, to let, it. let me say something. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with them making a female version of Ghostbusters, but don't get mad at me for not watching it. Or, those are those are those two things. How, are, about, how about this? Don't cancel me be, for being critical of for sure, that. For sure. Right. So, but then, okay. So now what we've done is we have subcontracted our free speech to big tech right now. Mm. That's why. So when you have the government that is in bed with big tech, that's how you get a full cancellation. Now he. Now that was just Milo. Then you got Roosh V also got canceled as as a result of that shit. Uh, Alex Jones got canceled because of that. Uh, to a lesser degree, I would say uh, Jordan Peterson did, but they kind of like mar ratioed him. They kind of marginalized him. Um, there's uh, has been uh, James Damore. When James Damore, do you know who James Damore is? James Damore was a tech at Google, and he uh, had put some memo out uh, just uh, addressing some facts about how men and women are biologically different. Get him out of here. And everybody had him on the talk show, whatever. Um, so there's, there's been this long history of big tech canceling people. Now, people, you never heard of James Damore before. I was because he was sort of in my sphere at that time. And I look at this and I go, those are just like sort of the Bush League guys that they can kind of, you know, uh, rash, uh, ratio or they can like cancel that guy. Now you've got an Andrew Tate who has an army. He's got a worldwide army for him. And they cancel him through, through YouTube, through Twitter, through TikTok through Instagram, uh, every major social media platform, they cancel him and he loses his Stripe and he loses his Gumroad uh, payment processors for his affiliate marketing thing. All on the same, all, well, all within the same like three days, two, Bro, two he, or three he days. He was talking about like literally watching apps disappear from his That's phone. That's coordination. It was insane. That is coordination. I, I was texting him. I was like, bro, like, because uh, mm -hmm. I had a friend at Meta and it was like, hey, my friends are trying to get your account back. He's like, don't bother. He's like, the people at Meta took my <laughs> shit away. TikTok preemptively banned him. Bro. He didn't have a TikTok account. They said, 
Andrew, if you're going to try to make one, fuck you. You hey, can't hey, have hey, one. One, <laughs> hey, one, one, one more thing. I want to make this absolutely clear. Mm. Andrew Tate did not break terms of service on Instagram. Call me on that. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell, show me where he posted one single thing on Instagram. Now, people mm. reposted his stuff from YouTube for sure. He didn't. He did not break terms of service one single time on Instagram, and Instagram got rid of him. If we're going to use that logic, why does OJ Simpson have a Twitter? I will, let me uh, hear uh, this. <laughs> people ask me this all the time. They say, do you have backups? Are you on Rumble? Yeah. I'm, getting, I'm pushing over to Rumble now, but I, also, I mirror this very podcast right now. I mirror to Odyssey right now. Okay. So I, I do have backups. I do have archives. I have Eclipse channel. I have um, you know, Shorts channel. There's ways to sort of back things up. All of my, you know, my blog posts are all backed up. Of course, my, bo my books and everything else. But that's the scary, even the scarier thing is like, uh, Amazon owns 87% of the self-publishing market, of, of the, really the publishing mm. market, period. If they want you to disappear on the same day as your, your YouTube account, they'll make you disappear. Mm. It's all coordinated. And that right there is, I think, the more dangerous lesson of, of uh, Andrew Tate with respect to free speech. Now, people will tell me, Rolo, well, they, they, they canceled him because of misogyny. They canceled him because of what he was saying. He was outspoken. He was, he's a, an outrage broker, right? He, and what he was saying was pissing off women and a lot of really sort of what I call allies, right? They're the cuttlefish, right? But I, the but I agree. He did say some stuff that I was like, oh, he holy did. shit. Absolutely. Women, are, women are lazy and that they're Absolutely. property. He but said they, those things. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And he did say those things, right? But that wasn't the reason. The reason was he owned the algorithm. That's why. Oh, for he sure. He was the first one that I've ever found who could successfully game the YouTube algorithm. What, on what he did was he had his army with separate channels create, and there are subcontractors, right? They're creating more and more of his, um, his uh, videos or their derivatives of his videos. And he, he was the first one who would successfully like spam the algorithm with his stuff. And then that transferred over onto Instagram, that transferred over onto uh, TikTok and all these other social medias. And really the fact that that was the easier way to go about it or the way to sort of subvert big tech is by getting an army to rebroadcast all of your all of your your messaging, that's kind of something that they can't tolerate. And I once I realized what exactly his uh, his marketing situation was, I'm like, I don't know how long this is going to last because they're going to get pissed off that he's exposing the he's he, he, the code in the matrix basically is what he's doing. And so as a result, I would say you know of course what he said they can just say well that's why we we he's it's hate speech right we got him off there. Really, it's because there's so many people because teachers had their kids talking, repeating Tate talking points in their, in their, in their schools. For sure. So that was like, that was something that was really like um, endemic in society out, off the, offline. Right. And so if that's the reach that he can get, then why would like, why would they want him to stay on there to be able to do that? And why, why? Okay. It's one thing to cancel him off of YouTube for free speech. Right. It's one thing we can talk about censorship. Why did Stripe and why did Gumroad cancel him at the well, same time? Do, do you know, it's funny. They did the same why? thing with RSD during the whole Julian yeah. thing. The exact same thing. I was talking to Owen about it when it happened. Mm -hmm. And they, they took away their Stripe accounts. They mm -hmm. took away several payment, people. Yeah. So what they're doing is what Roosh used to call taking away their bread. They took away Andrew's bread, mm. which is they, they cut off his oxygen supply. And now, if it was just about what he was saying online, that could be like, okay, well, we're not going to support you uh, on Instagram or Meta or whatever else. It's another thing to say, okay, Stripe and Gumroad, uh, payment processors, we want you to shut his ass down too on the same, within the same three days that we're doing this. That, again, is, I think that's the more dangerous aspect of this. Oh, it's, for sure. It's, it's, for sure. It's, it is absolutely coordinated. And I, I've, I've exp I was talking to Patrick Bet David about this, and I said, here's the uh, kind of like a, an example of what he did was, do you remember when all those investors got together and they, uh, they uh, did the, uh, the, the big, it was a short, I forget the name of the, what, what the buzzword is, but it's, they got all these guys online on like Reddit groups who are investors and they put money into GameStop and they put money into AMC Yeah, the, the meme stock stuff. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah exactly. Huge, for, huge to, stuff, to, stop, yeah. to stop that short, right? Because they were going to, they were going to short that in 2021. Mm -hmm. They got all these people to put money into it and t completely fucked over these, uh, the Wall Street it investors. Was a fundamentally good short. I mean, GameStop was going to go out of business yeah. eventually. And, so, and so what they did was they got enough people yes. together to fuck these guys over. No, and then to the point where 
uh, was it a uh, Robin Hood and some other, you know, was they, uh, so, they, yeah. they, so they, so okay. here's, here's essentially what happened. Cause I traded through the whole thing. What happens is when you short, when you go long a stock, it's great. If you want to get rid of it, you can just sell it, right? If it, if the stock collapses, you're generally going to, if the price goes low enough, somebody will buy it. If nobody will buy it, at least the market makers will buy it. Like, Ses, uh, like mm -hmm. BlackRock or Susquehanna mm -hmm. or something like that. When you short an, uh, uh, something, right? In this case, I believe they're actually shorting stock. I don't know if that was the Game, case. GameStop yeah. and AMC. So, so there's a limited amount of stock that you can short. So if you guys ever trade on a brokerage, you're going to see what's called NTB, which is none to borrow, or uh, HTB, which is hard to borrow. If you get to HTB or NTB, what happens? happens is the interest rate that you have to pay in order to borrow that stock starts to increase and it gets incredibly confiscatory. Like it gets ridiculously high after a while. The problem is this, if you're in a short position and the stock price goes up, you have to get out of the position mm -hmm. and that brokerage will charge you anything they want. They will literally, the slippage will be massive. You will be incredibly screwed. You won't just lose the 10% you lost on the, the rise of the price. You'll lose additional money because of the interest rate and because the, the, your broker now has to go source stock in order for you to replace the stock that you mm -hmm. shorted. Short Shorting is dangerous, the, but the the problem with it is like you need it to be able to short. Otherwise, you have these big uh, rises and falls that you see in cryptocurrency because mm -hmm. you can't short crypto. That's part of yeah. the that's part of the reason why there's an issue there. Um, and also with the with the stock options, it's the same kind of thing. Like you are on the hook, unlimited unlimited amount of if you short stock options. You're on the hook for that stock option until the until the whole thing expires, and there's no guarantee you can ever get out of it if there's no liquidity, especially in, in smaller. Which is why yeah. when all those guys got together and said, "Okay, everybody, we're going to get together, we're going to buy GameStop and we're going to buy buy AMC," mm -hmm. to the point where they were fucking these guys over so thoroughly that Robin Hood had to stop the trading for those those particular yes. stocks, stocks, right? Because they said, "Okay, well, they're gaming the system. They're playing by the fucking rules yes. that you put out there." They just got enough guys to come in here and game your algorithms. Yes. It's exactly what Tate did. Maybe he intentionally or unintentionally, but he had enough guys who said, we're all gonna play by the rules. We all are agreeing to play by the rules together and we're gonna, we're gonna game the algorithm. And, who, and just like Robin Hood, YouTube says, uh-uh, you, you're playing by the rules. You haven't broken any uh, terms, of, you know, terms of agreement uh, for, for Instagram, but we're still going to ban you anyways because you're gaming us and because uh, we're going to change the rules on you right now. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was a crazy thing mm -hmm. that happened there. I mean, those, those, I, I feel like those hedge funds got lazy and the, the, your mm -hmm. losses in, in short positions are unlimited. They're unlimited losses. You can really screw these people over. Mm -hmm. The problem, the thing that I thought was funny was afterwards they kept trying to make it happen again. Mm -hmm. and, I kept, and I kept telling my friends, I'm like, do you understand you have pissed off some of the largest financial institutions in the world. Mm -hmm. You think that you have this secret Reddit group that they're never going to mm -hmm. find out about. I promise you, half of that Reddit group now is full of bots and people that work at fucking BlackRock. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what's going on. And they are like the next time you try to do, they're gonna they're gonna try to fucking bait you into a pump and dump. At this point, they are not going to let you embarrass them again. I promise you, that won't ever happen again. Google has been. Quiet, well, quietly or not so quietly. I, the only reason I know about this is because they send me like you know notifications for my YouTube channel. But um, Google has been um, instituting new rules for affiliate marketing for their terms of uh, terms of use mm. uh, since I want to say March of this year. They have been rejiggering all of their affiliate marketing agreement side of things, and I don't know. I can't say for sure that it was sort of like you know prompted by some some something like what Andrew Tate's doing but like for instance if you ha are doing a product review they want to know that you actually have the product and you actually know what the sure. fuck you're talking about rather than just trying to pump you know pump something off on a, on on your own uh, social media um, for influencers but then they have been uh, rewriting the the rules for um, links in uh, aff affiliate marketing links like for instance yesterday I did a show with uh, uh, Troy Francis and James Tusk and they've got a new program out called the Edge and I had my, my affiliate link in there uh, in, as the very first one, and I'm getting flagged for that because they want to know that you've actually taken the course and you, you know mm. like, what you're talking about. And then you have, to go, you have to jump through some hoops. Now it's still back on there, you can go do that. But they're tightening the uh, the affiliate marketing. Oh, because of uh, what happened with War Room of and Hustle University. Yes, yeah, yes. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Uh, let me ask you your opinion about some other people that you, you know you sure. talk about. Let's often. go. Let's talk uh, shit about people. Uh, no, not talk <laughs> shit. But like, it's interesting because you seem <laughs> to have like a, a very cordial <laughs> relationship with Michaela Peterson and Jordan. Peterson. Cordial, yes. Yeah, but you, yes. But, but at the cordial. same time, you and you criticize somewhat Jordan Peterson. I, I don't. I don't know. I've just seen clips. What is your belief about Jordan Peterson? I think overall? cordial is a is a nice diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> I thought you, I, I kind of got the vibe that you guys liked each other. She's been sniping at me from behind a block from, uh, since about January. Oh, really? This year. Yes. Okay. Um, 
I have a real kind of uh, love-hate relationship with, with Michaela. I did a, uh, an interview with her back in December of last year, uh, which was a pre-record. And again, just like, you know how Andrew always says, you know, like people will take him out of context in these 30 second clips. Well, that's exactly what, that was my education in that, by the way. That's exactly what Michaela did was she just like mined that two hour long podcast for just buzz clips that would put her in the best light and put me in the worst light. And, um, there was a point where we got to, um, I think it was in, it was in April of last of this year. And, uh, she was, uh, trying to make a move, I guess, from Nashville to, to Miami. And she went on her Instagram account and she was petitioning just random people who followed her on Instagram to help her babysit Scarlett while she was there. And I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? And I'd, so I did this full, you know, it was almost an emergency podcast and I happened to be going to Miami at that time because I was doing Fresh and Fit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, where the fuck is your dad? Where the fuck is your soon to be husband? Where is the fuck is the baby daddy and all of this? You're out there petitioning random people on your Instagram for a babysitter because you want to go party in fucking Miami, which was ironic because it was exactly what I held her feet to the fire to back in November when I said it's the kill to party dynamic, which is, uh, you know, I'm not going to show uh, my kids on my Instagram because I don't want, want people to think I'm sure. a single mom. Right. Okay. So she was just one example of that. She lost her shit about that. And then I saw her like when she went and did the, uh, I, I don't know if she was drunk or what the fuck was going on, but she did like videos trying to uh, cover her ass on that thing. It's not that big a deal. And she's like, you know, by a pool somewhere in, in Fort Lauderdale or something. And so what I did is I did this show and I said, look, Michaela, I, I'm a father. I had a daughter. I said, I'm in Miami. Bring her to Panorama Towers at 9 a.m. and I will take care of your kid for you while you're out doing whatever the fuck it is that you're doing. I'll take her deep sea fishing. She'll have a great time with Uncle Rolo, you know. And of course, it, yeah, I was only half serious when I did that, but it was like, I was just like, why the fuck, why is this a good idea to you? I, like as a father myself, and when my daughter was like, say five years old, that would never have been a concept in my head to just like petition random people and say, hey, will you watch my daughter while I'm over here, you know, having a good time yeah. or doing whatever the fuck it is I need to do. But as far as Michaela's concerned, she's been riding uh, uh, her dad's coattails for a long time. She manages this account. Um, Peterson is not what he used to be. Um, and again, this is not to just talk shit about Peterson. I like a lot of what Peterson has had to say in the past. I disagree with a lot of the stuff that his takes on uh, intersexual dynamics because he's, again, one of these guys who only focuses on one aspect of, mm. of hypergamy. It's always the, the nice, safe beta buck side and not the alpha fuck side. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a history with him, but um, uh, the idea of me actually having a debate or an interview with Jordan Peterson is probably not going to happen in this lifetime. Okay, interesting. I mean, I, I want to like him more than I do. And it's not that I dislike him. It's just a, a function of when I read the book, the first chapter, I was like, wow, this is impressive. He's talking about serotonin levels in lobsters. Mm -hmm. And then it just feels like I'm reading Ulysses by James Joyce after that. It's just these run on sentences that I don't uh, understand. Okay. When he first came out, you got to remember that Jordan was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. When he had that uh, confrontation with his students where it was the gender pronoun. Sure. He was the hero we needed at that moment and everybody blew his ass up. And he went from being this kind of obscure uh, professor at uh, University of Ontario or whatever, making maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year doing that, to making eighty thousand dollars a month on Patreon, and mm. then having world tours, going out with uh, Dave Rubin, and becoming a multimillionaire off of basically what he'd been doing as a professor for a very long time. So he leaned into that. I always use him as an example of too much, too young, too fast, because you and I are in the engagement media business right now. And what happens is that there's a potential to make a lot of money and people are not prepared to sure. make a lot of money. For sure. I am a get rich slow guy, not a get rich fast guy. And that's not because I don't want a lot of money. I would, but there's a lot of lessons you have to learn along the way so that you can, so you don't, it's like too, you're familiar with too much, too young, too fast. Of course. Which is like, so you get a college athlete and you suddenly you get, you put him in the NFL and you give him like a $10 million contract and he's gone from the ghetto. And now suddenly he's, you know, driving around a Lamborghini. Mike Tyson, Antoine Walker, mm -hmm. and uh, what's his face? Allen Iverson, all blue through a hundred million dollars in their twenties. Yep. And it's so it's the same dynamic you take. A, and now granted, you know, Jordan Peters is not too young, but he's too young in the sense that he's just coming into this new media and does not know the, the ins and outs of it and does not have the, uh, the, I guess, depth of knowledge to realize that he's about to go from being 
uh, sort of naive about these things to making a whole shit ton of money doing this. And so what happens, you end up carrying over the, the habits you had from being, I'm not poor, but like, you know, from your old life into your new life. So it makes sense that when you look at like, like rock stars, when they die at 29, or Amy Winehouse, like when they die at 29 years old, it's usually because they're taking habits from their old life into their new life where they've got, where they're popular, famous, they got a yeah. lot of money and it follows them in there and you might end up in rehab. So, so the issue for me was, you, see, you hear the Richard Dawkins interview that he did? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, and the Sam uh, Harris okay, one so, too. So, so, so for all of us, <laughs> if we're all talking and there's a bunch of people talking, if Richard Dawkins starts talking, everybody needs to shut the fuck up if Richard Dawkins is talking. Okay, Richard Dawkins, when, when 500 years from now, they will still be talking about this man. Mm -hmm. It's different for him. Like this man is an evolutionary biologist. I wanted to hear what he had to say. I didn't hear a fucking word he had to say. All I heard was... Uh, Jordan Peterson consistently interrupting him. And I really appreciated when Richard Dawkins started talking about the two snakes curling around each other and how that looks like DNA. Mm -hmm. And Richard Dawkins was like, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like that's not, again, what I, what I like about Jordan Peterson is that there's this evolutionary psychology component and then he puts his emotion into it. And I'm yeah. like, woo -woo. we don't, he puts his magical yeah, thinking. We don't it's, need the woo woo emotional part. Like we can do yeah. that on our own. That was the part. It was like, I really want to like him more than I do. And then he does stuff like that. And I just don't know what to do because like, I want him to just, mm -hmm. I want a concise book where you as a professor and a PhD, give me stats on stats on stats. And then mm -hmm. at the end, if you want to have an interpretation or you can show me anecdotally how these things make sense, then I'll, then I'll do that. By the way, I have that. His name is Dr. David Buss. Mm -hmm. And that's which another reason why I like, I'm still mind blown. Do you know where Joe Rogan lives? Austin, Texas. Texas, yeah. Do you know where Dr. David Buss's laboratory is? Too? And literally mm -hmm. all of these guys, their foundation for so much of their work is because of this one man who lives less than five miles away from Joe mm -hmm. Rogan and Buss has never been on Joe Rogan. I was asking Dick Gatsad about that. By the way, Gatsad has been on Rogan more than anyone else. I really else. want to get Gatsad yeah, for sure. on. And, yeah. I, and I asked Gad, I was like, dude, why is Joe, what? like even Gatsad is like me. He's like, we we all, David Buss. Gatsad's like a character, yeah. man. I but, love but, that But guy. he he respects mm -hmm. Dr. Buss so much. Oh yeah. So do I. He was a student. He he actually yeah. took classes. Yeah, he from took from class. It, it, my whole thing is like, why don't we go to the source instead of like an in interviewing? Because there's only mm -hmm. two evolutionary psychologists that go on Joe Rogan, right? It's it's mm -hmm. Pinker and it's uh it's Gatsat. Is there anybody else? Oh, well, uh, uh, Peterson's been on Joe Rogan. But, but I don't think Peterson's an evolutionary psychologist. He has no, a he yeah, has a PhD yeah, I guess, I guess in he's uh, not really in the he's same a clinical class. is he a clinical psychologist. I can't remember, but he does not have he does not he talks a lot about evolutionary psychology. You want to you want to know why that's what? palatable? Yeah. Why 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 it's the like Jordan Peterson wants to add woo woo magic tea leaves and woo woo magical thinking to yeah. to like really practical, you know, the yeah. latent purpose kind of thing. It, it was explained. I use this as actually an analogy in sort of the last chapter of religion, and it, it was. I'm going to reference this cartoon that I once saw, and it's like this, this Tibetan monk, and he gets up to he, he, the first panel. And he's trying to get up to the top of the mountain to see the guru, the, the the divine master kind of thing. He says, "Oh, guru, teach me the ways of like combat. You know how to throw the perfect punch." And the the guru says, uh, or the uh, he says, uh, the guru originally says, "Don't try to hit the." The, you know, the target, you know, use your uh, peripheral vision or whatever. And, and then the monk says, oh, why, wise master? And then the guru says, well, because you're using implicit memory and not like, you know, uh, <laughs> cognitive memory. And it's like the prefrontal <laughs> cortex is, engages yeah. here. So essentially you're accessing the, t the, the wrong memory yeah. to, for muscle control and whatever like that. He gets this really like, you know, empirical diagnostic uh, description. And then the next panel is the monk. He's like, and he goes, can you put that in some like, you know, worldly wisdom kind of thing? And the thing, of the, and so then in the last panel, the guru is like, dwell within your inner inness. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And so what that I I got a lot out. It's funny as hell, but I got a lot out of that because it's some people want to hear astrology. They want to hear tarot card readings. They want to hear um, uh, alien landings. They want it's chick crack, right? They want to hear something that's a little more like spirit, worldly spiritual has kind of like that element to it that still teaches the same question or same, same data, but it's more palatable when you say, oh, well, this is, you know, it's this new uh, meditation technique, but it's really, there's actually some functional purpose to it. But people learn that because it's the, the, uh, there's an element of magical thinking that everybody has. And I'm, by the way, I think that's actually not a bad thing per se. It's a, it's a feature and oh, not a bug of human. Yeah. Is, is it responsible for the atrocities of humanity? Yes. 
yes. but it's also responsible for imagination and for the greatest achievements of human. Like what, what is possible yeah. is also part of that magical thinking. So it's a necessary element so that we don't get nihilistic and off ourselves because we want to believe in what is possible. So there has to be a module or something of our brain yes. that predisposes us to that. Now, when... When I talk about stuff on Fresh and Fit and I'm Mr. Wizard and I'm giving you evolutionary psychology reasons and everything and I'm telling these girls, well, here's why hypergamy is and here's the, you know, everything we've talked about for the last hour and a half here. Um, I'll be on there with Hotep Jesus and I'll explain this stuff to him. And then Hotep Jesus is like, you know, we just vibing. And, you know, he says the same <laughs> thing and he's like, he, get, he, he puts it in an emotional package, right? And the girls are like, Oh, oh, they, yeah. And they love, he's like, he's this, this dreadlock guru guy, and the, but he's saying the same thing. He's just doing it in a way where it's engaging the magical thinking and emotionalism. Do you, do you know what's so sad? Like you and I right now, I'm not even kidding. Right now we could create a product and it's called like dating for your Zodiac sign. Or how about this, a oh, di yeah. diet for your, the perfect diet for oh, your Zodiac man. sign. You're lucky we use our superpowers the, for good and not for evil. We could make <laughs> millions of dollars selling to all of you people <laughs> diet for your Zodiac sign. You would mm -hmm. all, the, the, you guys would all believe that. Dude, it's the you, latest you, thing. You know, my, one of my favorite studies is, and I, there was no need to do the study, but there was in, uh, in England, there was a speed dating thing they had with thousands of speed daters that went through there. And they started correlating the success of the speed dates with uh, astrological signs. Mm -hmm. And of course, you and I, without any question whatsoever, knew the results of the study. Mm -hmm. The study is, for those of you who are shocked by this, zero correlation. <laughs> there is no correlation between who you date and what your zodiac sign mm -hmm. is. There is no correlation. Ready for it? Some buttholes are going to clinch on this one. There is no correlation between your personality traits and your zodiac sign. Zero. Zero. If I'm wrong, find one single peer-reviewed study that shows an even 0.01% correlation. Mm -hmm. Nothing zero nothing when I tell people this story they just shut it out mm -hmm. they still like it's fine if you want to tattoo a Libra on your arm do it it's fine it's, like you mm -hmm. feel part of a clique of people that were born in October do it if you want to I know I'm a Libra there's a bunch of comments right now they're like that's exactly yeah. what a Libra would say yeah the reality the situation is Gemini. <laughs> we 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 it, it, here's the thing I'm gonna go back to this you want to believe in the zodiac sign and then when I have a discussion with you about evolution you don't want to listen like you know at some point you I think it's irresponsible that people still like fall into this 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 yeah. what well, was it's, that? Well, it's usually oh, I was just gonna say this yeah. is that like um when we when we're talking about magical thinking the the reason why I there's in my book religion in the fourth one I, I go into a little bit of detail here because I, I didn't want everybody to think I was shitting on religion and I didn't want people to think I was shitting on atheism as well yeah like like what you're like gonna God be, sad does yeah, that at the end of if, his book he gets brutal think, bro if you think that that book is is shitting on your religion and I don't I cover all religions not yeah. just Christianity. Or if you think that I'm going to be like trying to make a case for religion to atheists, you're going to be sorely disappointed because yeah. all I do is basically just give you the nuts and bolts of things. But during that part, like I, I, I was faced with the question, I think it was Einstein that says, you know, what's more important, um, imagination or knowledge? And of course, oh, imagination. No, I disagree. I think it's both. There has to be imagination for us to get to the knowledge, and there has to be knowledge for, for us sure. to ideate about the imagination. So the, it's kind of like back and forth with that. With that, but again, I don't see um, uh, uh, magical thinking as necessarily a net negative. Uh, it's just something. It's just part of the part of our nature. Have but, you read *Sapiens* by Yuval Noah? Yeah, I, I have kind of mixed. I've got mixed reviews on that one. But uh, but have you um have you heard? Uh, I don't. I think it was like. Was it Brett Weinstein who said this? I use this in book four. Do you know, are you familiar with the concept of metaphorical truth? No. Okay, so this was something that actually, I think it was Brett Weinstein, and he was moderating a debate between Jordan Peterson, and I can't remember who the other guy was, but he brought up the point of what uh, metaphor, metaphorical truth, and I use this in the book, is this. Um, stay away from porcupines because they can shoot their quills and those quills will get you in the arm and, and, uh, and they're very, very painful, mm. right? So give them like stay t you know, 30 yards away from a porcupine, right? They'll shoot their quills at you and they'll stick in your body, right? They'll tell children that, keep the dogs away from it, right? Because they're gonna, those flying quills, watch out for them, right? Porcupines can't actually shoot their fucking no, quills. No, they're scary okay. as shit, but they can't shoot quills. But you get a porcupine quill in you. I've had a dog that got a porcupine they quill. They run at it. you backwards, bro. That shit is crazy. Oh, and my they growl. Lord. They growl. Yes. Do porcupines growl? Yes. Well, they're scary. Most painful fucking thing in the world <laughs> is they get a porcupine quill in you. So, is it tr necessarily objectively true that porcupines can shoot their quills out of their body? No, no it's not. But it is, is it in our best interests 
to believe that they can so we stay away from porcupines so we don't get a quill in us. Yes, so that's what that's a, an example of metaphorical truth as opposed to like sort of objective truth, mm. and that is it teaches a lesson so that you will perform a behavior which is stay away from the fucking porcupine, right? Mm. Um, and then you take that and you extrapolate that into into memes, right? Into memetics is up from there. So, for instance, why is it that we have sort of this? species fear of bugs why do we have a revulsion to Reptiles. dead bodies why do we yeah. not want to be near snakes why do we have the why is the snake in the bible right why is that the most evil creature right well because the snake was sneaky and it could get in the crib and kill the baby and you wouldn't even know it was there and it would shock you unless you're completely vigilant all the time right so metaphorically speaking the the snake is the metaphor for the truth that is like watch out for fucking snakes they'll kill you yeah. right so there's the latent it's almost like a like when we have um Pros proscriptions against certain things to eat in like say you weren't allowed to like uh orthodox jews can't eat ham right mm. they can't eat pork yeah. no hoofed animals uh, or shellfish i think it's still i think muslims do the same thing right it's halal, halal versus haram food or whatever yeah. um well that used to have a real a real function back in the day which was if you eat pork you're gonna fucking die right you get trichinosis right well now we can make make it so you can have a good you know ham's freaking good right Bacon's, bacon's good. Yeah, you can, right? Yeah. But, uh, but so, um, so, but they had, those are, that's metaphorical truth. Don't eat the, God said, don't eat those things because you, you know, it's, it's haram, haram. And, uh, and so it, it, it benefited the, the people at that time. But now we know better. And the objective truth is that, you know, you cure pork, it's fucking good, right? Yeah. But, um, uh, but that was the that was the metaphorical truth. So when I, when I go into this part in the book, and by the way, I stole this re liberally stole this from uh, from Brett, Brett Weinstein. But uh, I thought it was true because it, it coincides with what you were saying about Jordan Peterson, how he like talk about like some nuts and bolts shit, and then he'll add some like flowery prose to it, and that's the metaphorical thing where he's trying to sort of sweeten the deal for people who don't want to sit there and the read we, we for four we, hours. The problem is we don't need that, right? So yeah. The, I made, yeah, yeah, in I, ways we don't. I yeah. made this show because I'm sick and tired of hearing, there's several reasons, but I'm sick and tired of hearing people saying like, yeah, man, people cheat because of this, people cheat because of this, and I'm like, stop, 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 stop. There's actual data on this. Spend 10 minutes and look it up. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's just this back and forth conversation about dating oh, yeah. or economics or what, or even real, I have real estate agents on here or whoever. There's these, there's these things that you can actually look up science for and people choose to not do that. If you actually did this, a lot of these dating shows would be a lot shorter, yeah. right? Yeah, well, I, I get into it also. I, one of the things I, I w I've been trying to tell Myron to do on the after hour shows with the girls is, Whenever he's confronted with this, because it happens all the time, mm -hmm. these girls are like 18, 19 years old, and mm -hmm. they're regurgitating, parroting back all of this 1970s Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, uh, you know, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle, that, that kind of yeah. rhetoric. Or um, they'll they'll rattle off you know uh, you know buzz terms like rape culture or bro culture or this culture or whatever um, or uh, w you know things that we can statistically and, and we have Myron and I statistically disproven on show after show after show and then on show after show after show more women show up more young ladies show up and they're still parroting back that same rhetoric that has been around really since the sexual revolution and so my i've been trying to encourage myron to do this and i i'm trying to do this myself it's like when i hear that now i stop i stop everything and i go where did you hear that yeah where did you where did you learn that you're 19 years old and you're repeating something Gloria steinem said back in 1972 where did you get that fucking message from was it mom was it your teachers what where are you getting this message so that the the meme never fucking dies you know yeah uh it's funny because uh you know some of my female friends are watching this right now this idea that you don't need a man you're right you don't need a man you technically do not need a man now if i come out and later and, I, and i'm like well you know there's these studies that show that if you're over the age of 40 you do not have any children and you're not married those women tend to be less happy that is a statistic. I am not give, making a moral judgment telling you to get married or telling you to get married at 23 or telling you not to have an orgy or telling you not to fuck th Chad Thundercock in the fucking uh, foam cannon party. Do whatever Champagne you want. Champagne room. Do whatever you want. <laughs> Just understand that like later on, you're going to come to me because I'm, I'm your friend and we're going to talk and you're going to be like, well, this, this, this and happened. And I'm like, do you remember we had this conversation before? Mm -hmm. You keep going back to this dude or you keep making this decision or you keep fucking the drug dealer with the better cocaine. And then you keep doing and then you keep telling me that you're not going to ever talk to this guy again. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to him. Just understand that it eventually, because of, like you said, social media footprint, there are repercussions for this downstream effects, but they're not 
my repercussions. They're not Rolo's repercussions. There you it, again. It, I, when I put, if you push somebody off a balcony, you don't sue Isaac Newton. Gravity. Mm-hmm. It's not Isaac Newton's repercussions. It's gravity. So that's that, that's so a the bigger problem with all that. And I 100% agree with you. But yeah. the bigger problem with that is that we we want to absolve women of their guilt and their sins and their their liability. You want to know why Fresh and Fit is so big a show? It's because it holds women accountable, even in the remo- even when it's just like team sports. Get her, get her, get her. You know, it's still at least raising awareness to exactly yeah. what you just said right there. And like I, I I put it this way. You remember Tinder Swindler, right? Yeah. When uh, what he he got like what two hundred fifty million or two hundred fifty thousand dollars out of that one girl f- over the course of like nine loans yeah. uh, for that one, and I'm watching this and I'm watching all three of these women who are the it, part of the documentary. There's probably more out there as well, right? And I'm looking at them and of course at the end of the show they're like, oh, we finally got this son of a bitch, and everybody's like, rah, yay. What they do though is they're still on the hook for two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars in those loans, and so what they do is they go to fucking crowdsource. So they try to get the Kickstarter, you know, uh, a thing to get to get men and women to pay for the mistakes that they legitimately made. He's not on the hook for it. She is because she's the one who took out the loans because that's what she was doing. Yeah, and then. That so they want to be absolved of that. Even in that show, even in a po- very popular next Netflix show, yeah. they want to be absolved of the responsibility of having got built by this guy in the first place by believing in the bullshit story of like I'm a Mossad agent or whatever that you know you know wanting to buy into that stuff. And then that one girl who was in the, the very beginning of it, she was like, uh, she met the guy on tin- Tinder Swindler, met him on Tinder Swindler, and was on his private plane within 45 minutes or an hour Bro, of meeting the dude. It's so crazy to me. And then, and then I'm like, like who, where is your dad? Where is the, like you said, yeah. they're going to come to you. Right. Yeah. And they're going to say like, Oh, uh, you know, I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm ass out right now because I made these bad decisions. Where the fuck is dad? Where's the brother? Where's the, the positive masculine influence in there? Who could said, you're going to get on a private plane with this guy. Oh no, you're not. I'm going to physically restrain you from fucking going and doing that. If I were to do that, or you were to do that, her dad or her brother were to do that, we'd say, he's a horrible misogynist. He doesn't believe in love. He doesn't believe that she, this could possibly be the one for her. Yeah. And it would be, you're being judgmental. You're being judgy by doing that. No, I'm being a responsible fucking male who's interested in your well-being, and I don't want you to get killed in fucking Bulgaria on this guy's you, private you, jet. You know what I say is uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's my job to, to protect them but not to save them. Because one of the things that's happened is when I go out with like large groups of girls, sometimes we'll go can't to parties. Save them all. I can't say like they'll, just, they'll sit there and they'll go, they're like, okay, I'm going to leave with this dude. And I'm like, okay, if that's what you want to do, I can't save them. But if they want to walk back to their car, I'm a 235 pound man. I'm going to walk you back to your car and nobody's going to lay a fucking finger on you. Mm -hmm. It's my job to protect you, but I can't save you. And that's one of the issues like, and this is actually, let's transition to this because most of when I ask people like what question they want me to ask you the most, this is the number one. Okay. I host, I I checked yesterday. I've hosted 45 bikini competitions in my life over the Mm -hmm. last 10 years. Um, I also do the recruiting for the Maxim parties, the night parties at Dan Bilzerian's house. I, get, I usually try to get about 100 girls to go with me. I'm the guy who likes to show up to a party with 70 girls, 70, 80 girls. It's not possible for me to do this unless I have female friends. Mm. And there's this thing that I've heard Andrew say, I've heard you say, and other people say, and I know what's a Steve Harvey had this thing, like you, men cannot be friends with females. Mm. I don't know how to rationalize this sometimes. Sometimes I do. I think most friend, men don't know how to be friends with females because mm-hmm. they get in the friend zone. I do mm-hmm. not ever let these women put me in the friend zone. Yeah. I understand my value and my worth. How mm-hmm. do you rationalize the whole female friend thing? Because like I told mm-hmm. you before, all of you out there, if Crystal Hefner wants to be your friend, you better say yes. She is an mm-hmm. amazing friend, right? She's a, a, a good person. So how do you, how do you rationalize who, this? Who is your best male friend right now? Uh, my best male friend, there's a couple of them. It's, it's probably the two execs that the other guy, the execs in my, my you, company. What, what do you do with, the, with him? Do you like hang we out play with basket, him? We play, play basketball. basketball. Like, what hobbies, what, what kind of like interests do you guys share? Um, basketball, uh, it's funny, we're always on the MOA calls together, uh, mm-hmm. watching football, this podcast making money making money is mm-hmm. probably the number one thing that's the same with justin waller mm-hmm. uh, he and i become friends really recently and it's like hey man i'm, I'm not interested in being your friend unless mm-hmm. we can make money together yes, yes. yeah so the way that men ha- uh create friendships between yeah. other men is yeah. entirely different i agree with that i agree and with the that. way women 
create friendships between women is entirely different as mm. well. So this idea that men and women can be sort of like these completely platonic friends, and that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. It's not necessarily a working, I work with lots of women. I work with Torsha, she might be in the thing. I work with a lot of, yeah. of women who uh, we have a shared project, and my relationship with them is more like it is with, uh, with a guy. I want to know, like, here's a project, here's what we're going to do, here's a problem we're going to solve, and that's, but I'm not going to see movies with them. I'm not going to yeah. the mall to hang out. So, We're not painting our toenails so this, together. So, this, this is, right? so, so the second one, you're correct. I don't paint toenails, mm -hmm. but I like to go to the movies with seven or eight girls with me. I mm -hmm. like, I love walking in nightclubs with 20 or 30 girls with me. Mm -hmm. I get comp dinners. My birthday is usually f me and 50 girls. Mm -hmm. I like that lifestyle, but I'm not woman-like. I still, you know what I take girls to go do? Play basketball and throw fucking axes. We don't go paint our mm -hmm. toenails. I take girls to go, you know, paintball or stuff like that. Or watch football. Do my ex, we just sit there and watch football. I'd still mm -hmm. do masculine things. The problem is, it's not that I'm looking to have more female friends. What I've found is that when I have a ton of female friends and I want to throw a charity event, I can raise another $100,000. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's for me, and maybe maybe the disconnect is first the word friend is the wrong word. Maybe that's maybe it's acquaintance or teammate is probably a better word. Okay, this is the first oh, thing. I see but, Torsha in the chat right now. You're my friend, Torsha. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> the, the other the other issue with me, and maybe this is a unique situation for me. I don't find 99% of women attractive. It's only one percent of women I find attractive. Well, yeah, especially considering the the environment you're Correct. in. Correct. Yeah. So. so this idea that like I can't be friends with women, you have no idea how many friends I, women I'm friends with. I don't find them attractive mm -hmm. at all, even though they're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I can tell you some girls that are models right now, and we talk, and I'm just like, I don't mm -hmm. need. I'm, I'm seeing somebody. I don't. Really Really need anything more from this. So I think that what a, the majority of guys do, like you're in a, definitely an outlier in that sense yeah. because you, and I, I, I hate to go me too as well, but like, I think I am kind of a little bit too, because I worked in the alcohol industry sure. for a long time and I had to, had to be the one selecting women to go to, like, yeah. you know, be booth candy. Right. Um, but when, uh, when I have said in the past, like men and women cannot be like friend friends, mm -hmm. But not, it's not necessarily that men and women can't be friends. It's just that the, the idea of what, what do we define as friendship between sure. a man and a man and a woman and a woman and yeah. then a man and a woman, right? So eventually, what, I mean, the, the way that it got started is this, is that eventually that chick that you're friends with is going to hook up with a guy and she's not going to be wanting to pursue and develop that friendship with another guy when she's already fucking this guy who she should be going with this guy yeah. and have genuine desire for. So, or, and maybe vice versa, you find a chick that you want to be with, right? So the idea of a platonic friendship between men and women is a very recent invention, I should say. Oh, for sure. It's, that it's, I it's a post-sexual revolution invention. Yeah. Like men in the, in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s, they weren't, it's not like, I'm going to go hang out with my good friend, you know, Kathy over here, and we're going to go down to the sock hot. No, that didn't, that wasn't, there was two different, you know, definitions of that. But the reason why I bring up, like, your, like, I asked you about your, your best male friend is because what we tend to do is we take the models of a friendship of, of our same sex friends and we try to apply them to an intersexual friendship. And so the things that like guys will put up with for a woman as a friend, mm. you would probably bust your friend in the mouth for, for doing pretty much the I, same. I wouldn't thing. bust them in the mouth, but I do treat them the same. Like if mm. you ever seen, have you seen the videos of me before the bikini competition mm. where I'm yelling at the girls like an offensive coordinator in football? Oh, well, because you yeah. work with them, yeah, too. But but so. no, but they're mm. my, those girls are there because they're my friends. Like the, mm. the, the the thing about it. So like I'll give you an example. C.J. Sparks. C.J. Sparks helps me make money. Mm. C.J. Sparks. I introduce her to guys she dates. She's introduced me to so many girls that I've ended up dating. Mm -hmm. She stays at my place in Vegas. I stay at her place in LA. We're just friends. And the thing about it is, I also know that CJ Sparks is a fucking playmate. When you see her, she's stunning. I know that most guys, when I introduce them to them, would have no chance. They're like, you're trying to get in there. Yeah, you're but, trying but, to be friends with her to get in But there. it's not even mm -hmm. that. It's like most guys, when I introduce them to CJ, there's no way they'd want to just be friends with them. I think the difference is this. When I'm with 70 or 80 girls, it's like, I can't, I'm not, I don't this sound like a douchey thing. I can't let me ask you this. Hypothetical, hypothetical. Yeah. You're, you're with CJ Sparks in, in LA. Or Kindly. Kindly is my other world. Okay, you're friend. spending the night there because you, you need a place to crash yeah. and whatever. You're yeah. doing something. She comes out to you in the middle of the night and she's just like stripped buck naked and she's like, you know what? I think we need to take our friendship yeah. to the next level. Do you fuck her? No, I would not. <laughs> You I love, I love you, I'm, I'm not I'm not lying. I love CJ. I would not. I would not. Because the problem is there's a cascade of issues that would happen from uh -huh. that point forward. There is a cas it's You were on this show and Justin was sitting in this fucking seat and you said if you had the option to go fuck these girls and you had that not, button but to hold, press hold that but you fuck that girl. But it was your dream girl. CJ <laughs> CJ is like my sister. It really does feel like she's my sister. Mm -hmm. We even look similar. She feels like she's my sister. Same thing with Kindly. Okay, so like, yeah, so let, let me let, I'll do fraternal, let, maternal. Let, yeah, let I me got let that. me do this other thing. Like with Kindly. Mm -hmm. Kindly is one of my other, probably one of my 
closest friends. Kylie is married. I respect her. I wanted to go to her wedding. We couldn't. It was during COVID. The, the, the amount of shit that would destroy in both of our lives if anything like that happened. Mm. The reason why I can think like that is because I am, not to sound douchey, I'm dating several girls you'd consider supermodels you right now. There's girls that I'm dating that are supermodels right now. And do you mm. know how I met these women? Through Kindly and CJ. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Social proof. This is so, mm. It's not just social proof. They literally introduced me to these girls. Mm. So for me, maybe it's a unique situation. The guys in MOA, they have the same unique situation. They're always around. I, I t teach mm. them, learn how to be the guy who shows up to the party with 60, 70 girls. That's one of the things I teach in my program. And so... I don't know, maybe it's just that we're in the, maybe outside of one standard deviation or outside of two standard deviations. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I do know it's possible if that's what you want. The thing for me is, I'm not going to be on, on uh, the Marquee Sky Deck and I don't get invited to the Playboy Mansion and I'm not on stage at the Maxim Party or hosting the red carpet of the Maxim Party if I don't have a ton of female friends. Mm -hmm. It would literally was Sierra Nowak who told the organizers at Swimsuit USA, Michael has to be our host because she's my friend. And I don't want to hook up with Sierra. And Sierra, mm -hmm. uh, Sierra has a type, and I'm not her type. So I'm not her type, she's not my type. And so we're just friends, even though she's gorgeous. But your she, friendship is based on- It's not based work, on her physical- Working with it, it, her, it, but, but it's based on common interests, which is what mm -hmm. most of her, like my, my friendship with uh, Justin is based on college football, the fact that we both like to make money together, we find each other funny, barbecue, mm -hmm. all these different things are our friendship. For women, I find the same thing. Here's, here's, here's what the, the difference. These women are so fucking beautiful that 99% of the men in their life can't see past the 800cc boob oh, job. Yeah. They can't. But I've just been with so many women like that that right. this physical attractiveness so does not affect you say, me. What you're saying is you're above the... You have so many options that you're above the need to pretend to be their friends and you can actually be I'm actually be their friends. friends. And, I, and <laughs> I know other dudes who can do this, but they, they're like club promoters in Most LA. Most guys cannot do that. There you go. I will tell I, you that I right agree, now. The I agree eight, with you. Certainly the 80% of guys. Now I'll explain to you why I, I've said this in the past as far as like men and women being platonic friends yes um if you're working with the, if there's a working situation i, I managed a strip club oh, let me say this also mm -hmm. i've managed a strip club for a while there's i'm not going to sleep with all the oh, girls yeah I, yeah yeah i mean it, but, again like i again i have worked with very beautiful women i've yeah. worked with very beautiful like guys i have to pick the guys to come into the to uh you know promotions and stuff yeah. as well we with thunder from down under right yeah. I, i've had to promote those shows before so it's not necessarily um it's not necessarily options so much as it is like i think guys have they bring a a model of their same-sex friendships over to the female friendships, but they're really uh, that they. But they I don't. Can't I don't, really I don't do think. That. I don't think they're motivated by the the same sex. I think they're motivated to be friends with these women because mm. the they like they shot their shot, they lost, and they're like, I will stay an orbiter in your life in the hopes and, that and, soon and hopes somehow, somehow, yeah, I'll wait for you, That's bro. What it I to, yeah. do not do that. That is not mm. what I do. What I do is I'm friends with all of them. My, a typical thing for me would be I have 100 female friends and I'm sleeping with eight of them. Okay. That's it. And by the way, the girls that I'm sleeping with, they're also my friends. Mm -hmm. Like you can't tell. If you ever hung out with me at a bikini competition, not a bikini, this is a bad example. Uh, the Maxim party, uh, you can't tell who I'm sleeping with. I do mm -hmm. not let anybody know. And so, you know what to talk about? The guy who doesn't count? Bro, mm -hmm. that's me. I'm definitely the guy who doesn't count. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's an issue, a situation where I just see this and it gets to the point where a lot of girls seek me out because of this, because they know I'm not going to treat them differently because they have boobies. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, the beauty doesn't affect you. It that's does, why. but it's not so, at it's all. Like the, so the superpower doesn't work on you. Correct. Got it, it. It, takes, it, it, it. it takes it takes a lot. One of my well, friends. So let me, let, me, well, yeah. let, me, look, let me just see if I can uh, add a little bit to yes. this. Because when I've said that in the past, like platonic friendships, the first thing is that it's, it's usually based on a guy who really wanted to get with the chick. Sure. She shot him down and said, can we just be friends? And the guy goes, yeah, okay. We friends are. Friends, yeah. It gets into the friend zone. We okay. agree on that. Okay, so friend zone is basically uh, all of the emotional support and all the emotional investment of a of a boyfriend with no sex. Yes. Fuck buddies are the opposite of that. So it's all the sex and no emotional investment on the guy's part. Mm. So they're really kind of like those are two parallels there. But when guys come into that and they think that they can be friends to the same degree they are with their guy friends with a woman friend. It's like, different. I'm not, see people, whenever I say, oh men, men and women can't be friends, I'm saying it in the sense that they can't be of the same character of For friendship sure. that you're friends with like Justin or you're friends with your best buddy, sure. right? It's gonna be, and by the way, women, same thing. You're never gonna have the same relationship with your girlfriends 
that you're going to have with like with your well certainly with your husband or with with a guy who's you know quote unquote your friend. Now again, every example you've given me up to this point has been women that you work with, sure. and maybe you're above it to the point where you're like, okay, it's no big deal to me. I don't. I've seen titties. I I worked in a strip club. I can actually be at least uh, uh, w to the point where our friendship is a working friendship. Great. Um, but what I'm talking about in the in those instances is guys will get into that point, and what they will do is they'll try to cater their interests and cater themselves so that they can be a better friend to that girl with, of course, the interest is, you know, was romantic. Maybe it's not, maybe it is. But the idea is this, is that when guys start relating to women on a friendship basis, they start to speak women's language. Mm. And so what happens is men and women speak completely different language. For sure. Men are overt. Men are uh, upfront. We, our language is, is, is blunt and to the point we are information based mm. and we are content based. Right now, everything you and I have been talking about has been we're relating information to one another. Women will get together just to talk because the feelings and the context of that conversation is what's important. And I should say is the priority of that conversation. So if you and your girlfriends want to get together, oh, hey, let's go catch up at Starbucks. That's that is an yeah. enjoyable experience for them. I'm not going to go, hey man, let's get together and go, you know, how the kids, right? I'm not going to do okay. that. We're going to get together. The reason why you like Justin is because immediately, because yes. the same reason I like Justin, immediately we have like this shared kinship, but it's also, how are we going to make some money? How are we going to yeah. make some money? And we talk about college football and stuff like that. Yeah. I will tell you this, man, and I know this may I may be unique in this. Do you remember Hank Moody, Californication? Yes, yes. That yes. is the biggest corollary to me. I love every woman. I, I love women. Even the ones I'm not attracted to, I think they're fucking amazing. I want to help. I like, you know, talking about protect them. Um, I love being friends with them. I love having them in my life. Now, it doesn't make me more woman-like. I still watch... I watch Texas Longhorn football, mm -hmm. Dallas Cowboys football. I'm in the gym seven days a week, and I eat fucking red meat. I, you know, I shoot guns. There's nothing about it that mm -hmm. changes my mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. And I do agree with you. I may be one, outside of one or two standard deviations in the uniqueness of the way it works. Mm -hmm. However, there's this other part of it. And that is when these girls are shit shows, bro. I laugh my fucking ass off, bro. I love it. And I'm a dick. Maybe I'm a dick, little bit of a well, drama. Be because you have no investment in not. Okay, doing so that. so this is yeah. this is the second part. Uh, uh, we, we talked about Rich Cooper earlier. You remember the 21 red flags? He mm -hmm. talks about it in his book. I remember reading those red flags and be like, God damn, that's hard. He's hard on these women. And then I started to realize, oh, yeah, I don't want to get married. That's why these don't seem like red flags to me. I, dude, sometimes I meet, there's a show called Inside OnlyFans, my friend mm -hmm. CJ, she hosts mm -hmm. it. Oh. And again, mm -hmm. so she hosts, CJ Sparks hosts his Inside OnlyFans, and girls come on there talking about cheating on their fucking boyfriends, dudes cream pieing them, and them fucking mm -hmm. some other dude, and I'm just like, oh, I'm laughing my ass off. I watch No Jumper, it's very similar. No Jumper is the same kind of way. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember Adam22, he was talking to Dan yes. Bilzerian, mm -hmm. and he starts saying, there was this one guy who's an intern, yes. And he's like, this intern became friends with the porn stars. Mm -hmm. And because he became friends with the porn stars, he got invited to all the porn parties. And he said he's from there, he's just been hooking up with girls left to right because he was friends with a couple of these girls. For me, it, part of it is also access that I think a lot of guys miss. The reason why I'm on stage mm -hmm. at nightclubs is because I'm with seven or eight women. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think that's another part that, so that a lot of people the miss. The greater narrative of that is this, is, and, and again, this is, uh, I think it's actually my first book, yep. uh, Confidence, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the things I really hate about like success porn hustlers is they're always trying to like hawk confidence. Confidence, confidence. women want confident men, yeah. right? They want confidence. Well, how do I get, Rolo, how do I get confidence? Where's the magical well of confidence that I can go and get? Well, confidence, com like objectively speaking, Confidence comes from options. It comes mm. from knowing that you've got another job so you can tell your current employer, hey, I got another job. Uh, he's going to pay me $10,000 more. You want a deal? No, fuck you. Bye. See you later. That, so it's like having the option to do so. It's a similar. That's why I always advocate guys spin more plates, right? Be, be date non-exclusively until you get to the point where you're a good judge of yeah. character. You say, okay, I want to get with this girl, right? But having those options is what generates confidence. And that's really where I think you're at right now because most men don't have options yeah. and they don't have the ability or they don't have the the history of having generated those options in the past so even if they're optionless they still don't have the experience of having generated them in the past so that they can create more in the future so when men do not have options they become necessitous for sure and necessitous men are never free so when you have um, when you have a guy who wants to be friends with a woman who, and he has no options, 
His oh, only option is to find some way to align himself and to find some sort of common ground and find some sort of compatibility with that woman to the point where he begins to relate to her and speak to her as one of her girlfriends. Mm. I've said this in the past. I will say it one more time. This is my show right now. So mm. um, women have boyfriends and girlfriends. Mm. If you're not fucking her, you're her girlfriend mm. because that's what most women will see when they when the guy wants to be her friend because you start talking to her and hanging out with her and doing the things that her girlfriends do with her because you're accommodating her from the perspective of how she feels her uh, how she relates with her other girlfriends if you start speaking the language of women your that women's hind brains or lizard brains are going to interpret you as, like a girlfriend, you sure. as an in, and so you will it's like you have you ever got to the point where like you, I have a million guys have said this to me uh, she says she sees me like a brother. Where she, 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 you know, interprets me like a brother. You know, she's you're nice. I, you're my best friend, but I see you as a brother. What that means is, is that she thinks of the idea of sex with you is That's incest. Gross. That is gross. Yeah, is incest. Uh, I, I will. So, I mean, literally yeah. down to the evolutionary perspective, you're so familiar, like you're a family member. Yeah, and. Generally, we don't want to have sex with yeah. our family members. Uh, I think I think where it started for me is when I used to work at this strip club. I remember the mm -hmm. girls that were like really hot, and then maybe mm -hmm. they were married. I would always ask them like, "Where'd you meet the guy that you ended up marrying?" And they would almost always say, "It was never cold approach pickup, and it was never cold mm -hmm. DMs. It was almost always uh, a girl introduced me to this dude." Mm -hmm. And so when I started hanging out, like most of the women I date, the women are introducing me to these to these women. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things. Like I'll go out. And I'll hang, and by the way, this is another thing. You, you, you'll see it someday. We'll go out sometime. Mm -hmm. I'll go up to the prettiest girl you've ever seen in your entire life and be like, what up, motherfucker? And we chest bump. I'm like, what up, motherfucker? And she'll be like, what up, bitch? She'll say this she to tries me. tries to get all bro with you. For yeah. sure, mm -hmm. because I don't change who I am based on that. And I do, and this is mm -hmm. just my, this is only time I'm going to express an opinion. I believe, that was fun, man, when I played football. When I was in a when I was in U, when I was in a flying squadron in the U.S. military, there was this fun camaraderie that we had mm -hmm. that I feel like some women wish they could have had, mm -hmm. and I give that to them a little bit because I don't treat you differently because you have boobs, and I do think there's a lot of girls who like hanging out with me because of that. Here's another thing that happens when you talk about the whole brother thing. I don't really get that very often. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they start having a crush on me. That mm -hmm. happens a lot, like a lot more than to the point to sometimes it gets kind of uncomfortable, where I'll have like 20, 30 girls with me. And then all of a sudden a girl like just out of nowhere just expresses that she's interested in me. And part of that, I got that from Bilzerian, like watching Bilzerian. Mm. Bilzerian had two girls. One of them uh, was named, um, and quote me on this, it's, uh, fuck, one of them is Masha Diduk and the other one is, uh, she lives in Florida. I can't remember what her name is right now. Bianca Gezi. Bianca Gezi used mm. to have a, a podcast called uh, The Shit Show. And those girls, okay, the, now, now you're talking their about. only mm -hmm. job was to book models for Dan and his trips. Mm -hmm. And Dan wasn't sleeping with these girls. They were friends. They were female friends who brought more girls to Dan. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. It's funny. Also, when I talk to girls who are bisexual, we have one thing in common, Rolo. <laughs> we, we both like we, chicks. We both like <laughs> chicks. I have, whenever I'm hanging out with girls who are bisexual, we have mm -hmm. a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. A lot of times. Sometimes I'll be sitting there with a girl who's bisexual, and she's just going over game. Like game, mm -hmm. game. Like real get the girl home game. And I'll sit there talking to her, and it's like very interesting. But I still, I'll go with you on this. I still think it's outside of two standard deviations. Most mm -hmm. men can't do this. I just know that my life empirically, mm -hmm. there's no way I could live without having a ton of female friends. Like I'm, I'm hosting a party Saturday mm -hmm. night and I've, I've got 45 girls coming there with me. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so that, that's the only thing. The other thing is like, they help me build my business. My business is a networking business. It, you know, and so the, if you saw, you saw my copy, right? You saw my oh, ads. Yeah. My ads are full of these girls that love the oh, shit out of me. Just look at your Instagram. Yeah. By the way, go look at his yeah. Instagram. Yeah. I love these girls and these girls love me. And I'm never going to tell you which ones I'm sleeping with. Mm -hmm. It's enough. But that's that's the thing. Maybe my my view on this is unique. But mm -hmm. I just I feel like definitely. I, I mean, you're definitely an, an apex outlier in that respect. I mean, it'd be like it's also like uh, you know, talking about this with Dan Bilzerian or somebody who's like really super high level. But I will say is um, going back to the options thing. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, you were on here. Uh, you were with uh, with Justin, and you probably have covered this on in other shows as well. Where uh, it, it was either Kevin Samuels or it was Myron of Fr Myron on Fresh and Fit, or if it was uh, Andrew Tate, where they're talking about how a high value man should cheat. 
right? He should have a, a well, option. Or it's, le it's less of a big deal. It's a, no, what I said, what a I said, what I said yeah. was it's mm -hmm. a bigger deal if women cheat mm -hmm. because of Dr. David Buss's okay. study about 78. So yeah. let me, let me relate that to options. Okay. So in, in my past work, in my, I think it was in book two, I talk about this. I said, when it comes to cheating, when it comes to infidelity, you're breaking a contract first and foremost. So it's like, I agree not to fuck anybody else. You, are you good with that? Cool. Okay. So that's our agreement, right? So you're breaking that contract first and foremost. The other thing is this, is that for cheating, for infidelity to occur, two things have to be there. There has to be options and there has to be a reason to cheat, okay? So most men, the 80% of men out there, the guys who wanna be your friend, who wanna be women's friends and all that, they don't have options. Sure. That's why they're trying to be friends with somebody because they think they can get in there. They have no options. Most men, especially, and then once they get married, they have no options. In fact, one of the rarest things for married men to be able to do is to generate pre-selection or-, or uh, It's to tough. Yeah, because they, they're not, like when I talk about how uh, married men or guys who are in relationships need to at least have some form of passive dread. They think that that's horrible because they, they might, it's fear of missing out or it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. They don't want to even experiment with that because they don't want their wives who are their only source of sex or their girlfriends to, to think that they would ever, you know, be unfaithful or whatever, because those guys don't have any options. Most men have no options. So when they do cheat, they're cheating with a hooker. They're cheating with like a, an escort or something like that. It wasn't that the girl really wanted to fuck him. He just wanted to generate an option through having $500 at the fucking you know, cat house and then he can go get laid. It's right? $500? I didn't know that. Well, whatever. Was. It depends on the, know, depends yeah. on the girl, right? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I, I don't would, really know I, those I, things. I know, I know um, but so he, the most men have no options. Sure. So. Um, then there are the guys who have, but they have all the reason in the world, right? They're in this sexless marriage. They're like jerking off to porn. 68% of Christian guys admit to having a porn addiction. That's incredible. Right? That's incredible. So, but, but so, you know, I brought that up with Ruslan and, and it was like, um, it was like, you know, crickets, of course, but it's like the reason I, I didn't get to do, say this, but like the reason for that is because those guys have no options. And that's why their only option for unlimited access to unlimited sexuality is pornography, it's the virtual experience. Right. So they have no options, but they have a reason to go jerk off to porn because the wifey put on, you know, too many, too much poundage and, you know, she's too fat. And now he's like not getting what he thinks he should get. It creates you know, problems in the marriage because he sees what other people are getting and he's not getting anything like that. So therefore it causes a lot of uh, marriage discord, let's just say, but he has no options. He has reasons, all kinds of reasons to leave and, and to, to cheat on his wife, but he's got, there's ain't nobody wants to suck his dick. Okay. Then you've got the guys who are, have options such as yourself, tons and tons of options, but you got no reason to cheat. If you're with a girlfriend like that, you're like, I can, I can get with any one of these girls right here. I have all kinds of options. And I honestly, I think that's almost a healthier position to be in. I have no reason to because my wife takes care of me before I go on every trip. She, lo she, she knows what, and maybe it's passive dread. Maybe it's just like, you know, appreciation for like what it is, who I am as a man, whatever. But it's, I don't have any reason to cheat. And that's why when like, um, when I'm, I'm confronted with Myron Fresh or I'm confronted with Andrew or, or even Justin or whatever, it's like that when I hear them talking about this, it's like, I've been faithful to my wife for 26 years. Mm. I don't have a, because I don't have a reason to cheat. Yes. And when Richard Cooper asked me, how did you vet Mrs. Tomasi? And I said, I didn't vet her. I vetted myself first. Mm. I needed to know that this is a person, this is a woman that I could be faithful for because I've seen me, I, I've seen sure. me do it. I know me, I've seen me do it, right? And I'm like, I'm a good dog, but you gotta pet me to keep me on the porch, right? So, but I, I, I saw that and once I settled that question in my mind, I said, hell yeah, I can. And that's from there, it was, it, you know, okay, well, she would make a great mother. She has a lot of, well, a lot of value added that goes along with that. She wants, she expected me to be in the driver's seat. She puts me into the position. She expects an alpha male. She expects me to be the head of the household, which she was the first woman who to ever want to, like I would, I was, the women that I'd had before that, it was always this egalitarian, like sort of pretense to everything. But, um, but options, in working in casino marketing, working in alcohol, being a you know, semi-pro rock star for a, for a while. Like all the options were there, but I got no reason to cheat on her. And so, as I said before, options m imply um, confidence. That's number one. So that's gonna, that's gonna relate to that. But in an optionless man is a necessitous man. Yes. So the guy who's cheating because he has no options, he wants to like go sleep with a hooker, he's a necessitous what, guy what? because he has all these reasons to, but he's not actually doing that. So you've got 
a necessitous man and necessitous men are never free. Do you remember what Justin said? He goes, I'm not afraid of a bad man. I'm afraid of a desperate man. Yeah. Right. So I agree with you on that. I think, mm-hmm. I think what happens is my, the, a part of my program is you, 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 it's a lifestyle where there, you have so many options that these guys have an easier time of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go, let's go to this. Cause I have a bunch of questions. We've been going three and a half. I hours. know we've been right. going good. Right. Here we go. Uh, a couple <laughs> oh, and shout out to Ned. I already got a super chat for Ned for Ned's college fund. Beautiful. Keep, keep any, keeping your boy off Beautiful. the, off of only Let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to do a question. And if there's questions on there, you want to pull up. So can, I, 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 they've been, they've been sailing by. I, sorry guys. I can't get to super chats on this because I'm not on Streamyard. I'm actually in the studio right yeah. now. But uh, I will get back to you on your, thank you. I appreciate every single one of your super chats, by the way. All right, so let's do this. Uh, how do you overcome, this is from Reddit, how do you overcome the initial nihilism that happens when so many guys, after they take the red pill? I have also had mm. a sim- similar issue in MOA, where a guy goes through like the first three weeks, one of the, the I make them read, the, the, I make them read um, your book, I make them read the, the setup by Bulzerian, I make them read a bunch of books about this. And when they do, a lot of times the response is like anger. Like they're like, I can't believe that this fucking happened to me. I can't believe I've been lied to about this. How do you get them to not take that into red pill? First off, you have to clarify terms here because a lot of people think that uh, that all I'm about is like uh, it's truthful anger. Oh, what he says is true, but don't let it like destroy your you know precious soul. You know. And I'm like, no, it's just, it's just the truth and how you go and how you process that. And most guys have a real tough time with that, particularly when they are this side of a divorce or they're in a position in their life where had they known about this stuff, had they read my book prior, that's why I wrote Preventive Medicine, had they known this stuff, they would have made different decisions, right? And so they kick themselves and they're not mad at women. And I want to stress that point when guys go through red pill rage, it seems like they're misogynistic and they're just there. They're going to go and be uh, like uh, what Alex Manazian or Elliot Rogers. And they're just going to go take matters into their own hands and do a mass shooting or something. That's not what the red pill rage is. It's anger at themselves for having invested themselves so long in a game that was completely ineffective because no one was playing that game. They were, they were playing by a different set of rules. It's not the anger at women. It's anger that they, it's a loss of investment. It's a loss of, of time. It's a loss of effort that they could have been, they maxed out the wrong character stats in their RPG of life, right? <laughs> and so they get really pissed off at that. But the problem is you have to get over that and you have to get over that nihilism because a lot of people will say, there's a, I, I have a, an essay and I think I put it in positive masculinity and it's called the five stages of unplugging. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, it's in the very first book. The five stages of unplugging, which are like this five stages of grief, like denial and and acceptance and and you know uh, you know optimism, whatever whatever those five stages are. And the reason why I use that as sort of an analogy for guys unplugging from the matrix is because it's similar to killing off your old personality yeah. and you're mourning your old personality. And the problem is, is guys get stuck in the anger phase and they get stuck in the mourning phase of who they used to be because they really, really want that blue pill idealistic uh, goals that they were sold since the time they were five years old. They really want those to be true. But now they realize it's uh, the, 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 the setup was bullshit and nobody's playing by those rules. And now they lack the creativity and they lack the the optimism and they lack the ingenuity to really see the opportunity that once you are red pill aware, dude, fucking sky's the limit. Cause yeah. now you know the fucking game. You, you also are responsible for knowing the game as well, but it's, it's like now you know this shit and now you can make better decisions and now you can live a better and, and life. And you're also responsible That's for how that. you get over it. You're responsible for that. It never turns off. That's another mm-hmm. question it's I get the bitter often. Pa- it's the bitter taste. Uh, yeah, you never take, once you put the red pill lens on, you cannot take and, them and, off. And, and there's like, even if you don't believe that you're having to perform, you're still performing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, get, get used to, I, I get this all the time, dancing monkey stuff. Oh, you shouldn't want to do things for women, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know what? If you're going to play the game, if, if you, you can decide to it's go... It's not just for women either. Nah, yeah, you can, get, you can decide to go live in a shack in the middle of some you know, remote place, or you can get in the game and you can be a player. And that's exactly how I start the, the fifth book, the Player's Handbook. Um, I've talked to... Uh, I've heard uh, Andrew talk about this, and I've heard um, Myron talk about this, the demise of the West. <laughs> okay, so now... Follow I, the West! I, Degeneracy! I, I, I'm just... Be honest yes. with you. I, now, maybe I'm biased. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm from Texas... 
I uh, went to UT Austin and I joined the U.S. military. I do not believe in the demise of the West. People ask me, what, does, what backs up the U.S. dollar? I'll tell you. The F-14, the F-18, the F-15, the F-16, the F-22, <laughs> the F-35, the Los Angeles-class submarines, the Ohio-class submarines, <laughs> the Blue Water Navy, the Global Positioning System, no. the KC-135, the KC-10, the uh, Bradley Fighting Vehicle, and the M1 Abrams tank. That's what backs up the fucking U.S. dollar. But anyway, mm -hmm. go to what you're saying. I, I felt like it was a little bit of an exaggeration as far as... I've uh, been hearing that that since well, like I've been doing this for 20 years I think I've probably been hearing that for at least the past 17 years where uh, it's moral degeneracy and uh oh what is it uh what is it uh weak men create hard times hard times create uh strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men and then let's continue yep. the cycle around okay got you thank you very much everybody wants to think in terms of cycles and circles and predictable we there's nothing more that, that human beings want is predictability in an unpredictable, chaotic world, okay? So when people that tell me like, Rolo, when do you think that the pendulum is going to swing back and we're going to go back to the good old days of 1950s masculinity and women are going to you know, respect men for being men and women are going to be women and men are going to be men, I'm going, never. It's not going to happen. There is no pendulum. We, only go, we don't swing backwards. We <laughs> go forwards, right? And so when I'm, when I'm having this conversation with these guys, I, it, it's actually a, a quote from uh, the book Dune, is you cannot back up into the future. Yeah. You cannot back the car into the fucking future. You have to take the lessons of the past. You have to understand what was good back then. And if you want to take those and put them into a new context in the future, more power to you. You're red pill. Go for it, man. Do, uh, you know, build something new with that. But don't think that you're going to back yourself into a better life by backing yourself into the future. I said this is, you know, Tradcons do not want the red pill. Matt Walsh, Candace Owens, Ben Shapiro don't want the red pill. They want a fucking time machine. Mm -hmm. They want to go back in time to some golden era that they romanticize about that never fucking existed. Here's the good news, though. I am on board with you. I've said that. In fact, I've talked, had this conversation with Aaron Clary, of all people. Um, I don't believe in, in this sort of enjoy the decline thing. It's like, well, enjoy the decline because it's all going to go to hell and, and uh, we're going to just uh, fall into moral degeneracy and we're gonna, it's the fall of Rome, right? Well, yeah, if you don't fucking get off your ass and fucking do but something, Rome, there's more Rome opportunity not, hold on, hold on, hold on. than Rome did before. not fall because of degeneracy. Rome fell because barbarians were motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. that's, like, that's the problem. Like, well, the problem, see, the problem, they want to the see that cycle. They want to see that predictability that well, the, well, the America's falling. It must be the fall of Rome, too. No, dude, we live in 2022, not freaking ancient Rome. Well, I mean, the problem is like, who are then the barbarians? Because I got news for you. The United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the planet's GDP. Mm -hmm. like, we have the only, yeah, like, you remember they were worried about Russia? I don't think Russia, I'm going to say this right now, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for this. I don't think Russia has <laughs> one single functioning ICBM. Not one. I don't think they have one intercontinental. <laughs> you have no idea how expensive those things are to maintain. They, you saw what happened with Chernobyl. I do not fucking believe they have one. There's no other country in the what, people in the chat already putting links. Yeah, here's one. Here's yeah, one. Yeah, like, <laughs> they're, like literally, like we spend more money on defense than all the other countries provided. We have all of the world's liquidity, and we have the most prime farmland on the planet. I do not see this. Like I don't. It's not saying it could never happen. I'm saying we have such a lead right now. It's mm -hmm. So we're a long way from the actual decline. Now, maybe the problem is I'm thinking of literal civil war and literal decline. And people are talking about moral decay, yeah. meaning we have a trans person as president. If we have a trans person as president. I'm still going to be a multimillionaire. I don't give a fuck. I really don't. Now, Let's enjoy the yeah, decline. I'm, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Like, I just don't care. Mm -hmm. Like that's the, that's the issue. I don't think when I think of decline, I'm literally thinking of apocalypse. Maybe that's where, maybe that, that's, yeah, that's what's probably going where the, that's the difference there. Yeah. Now I always point out, I try to make this, uh, this, I'm probably going to butcher this too, but I make this illustration whenever somebody says like, when's the pendulum going to swing back? Right. I think about this. I watched this, I forget which movie it was, but it was about world war one. And it was a documentary about like, uh, it was on Netflix. It wasn't Dan Carlin's thing. It was something else. But anyways, the, I, so I'm watching this, this documentary and this historical on, uh, on World War I. And in the beginning of World War I, they thought it was the war was going to be done in like you know, a yeah. year. And all these guys were like, all these young men were like, yeah, we could finally fight in a war. I'm bitching, man. It's going to be cool. Have you read Guns of August? Have you read that book? No, the best no, World but, War book um, ever. But there's, I, when they were, because it was, I think it might have been on the anniversary of, of the end of World War I. But anyway, so what they were thinking was that it was going to be, the war was going to be fought 
as wars had been fought before, you yeah. know, on horseback with a with a saber and you know all that kind of they stuff. They weren't even getting guns. There were there were cavalry mm -hmm. units that refused yeah. to learn how to use firearms. Yes. yes. And then the moment they experienced a 50 caliber machine gun yeah. and death on an industrial scale, that's when shit changed. Yes. So when I think about like people say, well, you, do you think we're headed for World War Three? I was like, well, I will tell you this. If we're headed for World War III, it will be something we do not expect in the same way that the young men in 1914 weren't expecting when they saw their first 50 caliber machine gun that yeah. mowed down entire regiments like it would, like they were on an assembly or, line. Or the way the Iraqi, or the people in Baghdad all of a sudden didn't see anything in the sky and then mm. their buildings were on fire. Yes. So what I was going to say, so think about it in those terms. When I think about how our expectations are of... A, a declining Western civilization are built upon our old order, our 20th century way of thinking about what's ideal. I will tell you this, if we do go into some sort of like, you know, moral panic or some sort of like degeneracy or some sort of chaos or whatever like that, it will be far worse than anything your 20th century imagination Interesting. could think of it being just like those poor kids in 1940 or 1914 who faced their first machine gun. So it will be war on an industrial scale. I think we, I think we are getting to a point where if we're going to talk about like war, uh, we're beyond like conventional warfare. I mean, we're, after, we're talking after, about, after, we, we, don't, we won't do it like we have done it in After the watching Russia trip on their own dicks mm -hmm. trying to invade Ukraine, Stop telling me about war. Right. Well, there is no country on the planet. It is literally like playing an NBA team versus a fucking peewee team. Mm -hmm. There is no country on the planet that even has a blue water navy, much less mm -hmm. functioning ICBMs. Uh, one country on the planet has stealth technology. One. Just one. Now we're selling those F-35s to the, the Europeans. But like mm -hmm. we are so far and away. That's why when I hear this decline of the West, I'm like, I don't care what you think about Joe Biden. He's still got his finger on the button. And it's a pretty big goddamn mm -hmm. button. So I think maybe the problem is whenever I hear civil war, I'm like, man, you guys should read about what the civil war was actually like. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're ever going to get to that point. But I do think that like... Well, we with, did, it will be destroyed from within before that. Okay, so that, that, then that may be the issue, which mm -hmm. goes back to... 4% of millennials think the earth is flat. That's how I think you destroy us from the inside. You know what's funny? Flat earth. You destroy the world with TikTok. Yeah. Flat, <laughs> you, you know, flat earth came around 2015. And that's when the Russians started using, uh, creating those Facebook groups mm -hmm. to like misinform people. Mm -hmm. It's like so funny that a lot of these people who have these conspiracy theories, they have conspiracy theories about the deep mm -hmm. state. They're literally reading conspiracy theories that they learned from Russian bots that mm -hmm. created Facebook groups back in 2015 before the election that caused them to have these beliefs. It's insanity. Like they're, they're literally like, well, I'm the only one know, who gets it. Do you know what, um, do you know what, um, uh, direct energy weapons are. Yeah, of course. DEWs of course I do. Are. Yeah. So I had no idea what a DEW was yeah. until 2020 when the wildfire season started in California. Now, I live in Reno, Nevada. Whenever there's a wildfire in Northern California, all that fucking smoke, just like right now, yeah. just goes right into the Washoe Valley. And nothing pisses me off more because I know goddamn well it's some Californian arsonist who decided to set his fucking fire, set, set something on fire, right? 2020, there were more wildfires in California than ever before. 2021, more than ever before. And all of them, next to all of them, were set deliberately. And if you see, uh, there was actually a, uh, a roster of the people they arrested for setting these fires, and they are all like these Antifa, you know, super liberal, uh, you know, militant, you know, uh, progressive leftists, right? And I'm looking, or they, if, if they are weren't exactly like that, they certainly looked the fuck, you know, sure. looked the part, right? And so what I'm hearing is people are going, oh, it was lightning strikes. There was no fucking storms for a lightning strike to happen. Then they'd be like, oh, it was. Um, uh, a, a campfire or somebody flicked a cigarette or some shit like that. No, because you could see the pattern of the fires going along. Then people said, it's direct energy weapons that are setting the fires. <laughs> That's right now. I'm like, no, yeah. motherfucker. It's, 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 like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like arson. A, it's, like a laser, it's like a laser. It's these direct sons energy of bitches yeah. are setting it deliberately. So funny. Yeah, direct I energy weapon. You know, the, you know that, little, that little Bic lighter that you use to light the candles? <laughs> That's a direct energy weapon. Yeah. That's the That's thing that they're using. I'm like, why would they bother with shit like that when they got these guys out there ready to just go create you know, havoc by arson? Um, let me ask you about this because I thought this was really interesting. So mm -hmm. I have my own theory about this. You know, I'm, I've been open about this on 
them on TRT. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that yeah. a, a, a decline in men's testosterone, which we can talk about the reasons why. I know that people talk about pesticides and the, the food that we eat and all this kind of stuff. But there is a decline. And the decline, I think, and also we, there's, there's studies that show when men have children and have get married, that their testosterone declines oh, at yeah. an even more rapid rate. And when they get divorced, Correct. it goes back up. It goes back up. Now, here's mm -hmm. the thing. I will tell you, when I was 38, like my sex drive dropped off, uh, my muscle mass mm -hmm. in my upper body just fell off, I got fatter. And I started, I got on TRT, I was four years of me just like wandering in the woods, bro. I was mm -hmm. at, I couldn't put on any muscle. I was just like, I, just, I had no goals in life. I was just, mm -hmm. it was depressing. And then about 42, I started taking TRT and it was like the world became colorful again. Mm -hmm. They were like the same time I started this podcast, the world became colorful again. And, I, and I, my interest in women was just exactly like it was when I was 19. I wanted to get them, my levels back to about 800 uh, uh, total tests back when I was 18. And when I did this, I started to think about these men who felt hopeless and were suffering from depression. Mm -hmm. And I can't prove this. And I do believe that if somebody actually did a study on this, someone would say it's immoral. But if they were to take all these men in their 50s, late 40s and early 50s who are committing suicide, mm -hmm. which there are a lot of them deaths now. Deaths of desperation. Yeah, le deaths of desperation. And we were able to correlate that to total testosterone levels, I think we would find a shocking mm -hmm. correlation. And you would also find a correlation to obesity rates as well. Well, well here's so, the thing, but yeah. obesity rates, what does that do? It aromatizes testosterone right. and turns it into estrogen. We talked about this before. Mm -hmm. If you are carrying around all this weight, the older you get, you are double fucked. Your body, <laughs> your body now is taking that testosterone. Mm -hmm. You're fat. People don't know this. Where does estrogen come from in the males? It comes from testosterone going into your body fat, being aromatized, look that word up, and it turns it into estrogen. You can get men who are so fat, their estrogen levels are higher than their testosterone levels. Man boobs, you guys remember man boobs? You've seen those things before? That's where it comes from. So we're starting to see these men, and they're overweight. This overweightness is causing higher estrogen levels, lower mm -hmm. testosterone levels in men that are 50. Now you're 50. Now you don't have any upward uh, financial mobility. You don't have upward mobility sexually because you've mm -hmm. put on all this weight. Literally, no it, upward mobility. No, no upward mobility because <laughs> you're fat. You physically can't sit up, right? All these things. And now we have this level of depression and then we have this, yeah. the suicide has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. It has to come from something. So I, my hypothesis, and I look forward to anybody trying to disprove my hypothesis, I'm open to it, is that a decline in testosterone levels is almost, I'm talking 99% correlated with this epidemic of suicide. I would say so. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. Also, you have to, um, you have to look at the, uh, the social situation that we're in right now. It's, well, nobody cares if somebody, if a guy kills himself, nobody, nobody, nobody gives a rat's ass about that. Um, when, we, when you look at the suicide rate for men right now, depending on whose numbers you use, it's either three and a half to five times the rate of women killing, successfully killing themselves. Mm. If it were women with that rate, we would have a special month dedicated to Women's Suicide Awareness Month, and yeah. we'd be wearing we have purple bands or whatever the fuck we wear on the NFL, right? Um, so we simp because men are the disposable sex and women are the vulnerable sex and we live in a if there is a separate standard of justice for men than there is for women for women than there is for men um so having said that i 100 percent agree with you uh, i think that uh, testosterone levels i have actually done interviews with uh with <laughs> with reporters about um t uh, trt um, about declining sperm count yeah. too. There's, so you have, to, you have to take that into consideration so it's not just testosterone it's also declining sperm count which you will hear you go on YouTube and you, there's nothing but articles about that right now. But um, so that coincides with like phytoestrogens that coincides with TR, you know, declining testosterone, which also declines with uh, the idea that we have been essentially gelding the last three or four generations of men so that they become self-loathing of their own masculinity to be a man is to be insecure, or to be shameful or to be like, you know, it's responsibility without authority. We have the responsibility to live up to a masculine ideal, but you have no authority to actually affect that responsibility in the first place. It is the gelding of, of well, Western men that has been going on, really, I would argue, since the, uh, since the uh, 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 sexual revolution at that yeah. time. But, uh, but it definitely comes down to that. I have, okay, so let me just answer the question really quickly here, because I get this shit all the time. When I'm on my show, you can see me from about here up, okay? When I go on Fresh and Fit and I'm wearing a tank top and, that, and I'm, I, I, I look like this, right? Or I do a photo shoot or something. And people go, oh man, Swolo Tomasi. He's, yeah, I can't, Swolo, Rolo lift. And I'm, 
Like, dude, okay, so I am, this is no secret, I'm 54 years old. I have always lifted weights. I've always been athletic. I've always been com competitive. I've never taken TRT, okay? Because the next thing out of anybody's mouth is, well, it looks like TRT's work. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's well, I, don't, like, I don't care. Why can I not own this? Do, 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 why do, can do, I not do, just do, have done this naturally? Do, 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 do you want to you know why I, did, I never mm -hmm. cared about that? Mm -hmm. Do you remember Mar? I don't uh, care about do, it. Do you remember? Do you remember uh, what's her name? Margot Robbie in yeah. uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Oh yeah. You remember they don't or Eddie Falco in The Sopranos. They don't mm -hmm. care where the money came from. Mm -hmm. They don't give a shit that you were doing illegal shit. I know hundreds of dudes who took <laughs> anabolic steroids, and I know thousands of women that those dudes fucked, and not one time, not one time, have I ever heard a woman be like, "Oh, those big muscles you have." Oh, you took steroids? I'm not going to fuck you anymore. Not no one cares. time. Because yep. you want to know why? Because they don't care about your struggle. They wait at the no, finish line and they fuck the winners. I did a uh, I did a, a live stream last Saturday with my. I play in a band called Trial of Ascension. We just put out an EP on uh, on spot. Our, our third EP actually is now available on Spotify. You guys already know this, but I did a, a live stream with uh, first time I ever did this with my bandmates, and uh, we were in the rehearsal studio, and I had a tank top on. <laughs> What do you think they they didn't talk about the music? They didn't, the questions weren't about like you know like hey what do you you know how are you who are your influences as a guitarist? No no, uh, what, what what supplements are you taking? Like what's it, what's your workout like? Was, well it's Amazi. I can't believe you're not on TRT. Uh, the squat I, rack the that's my TRT. There you go squat. By the way, actually if you do squats, it actually increases your. Um, HGH levels. You should go. It increases growth hormone. Um, so let's talk about this, man. We are almost at uh, four hours now. Yeah. So I got one last question for you. Here we go. Uh, what do you think is most misunderstood about your work? Oh gosh, where can we start? Um, I think that a lot of the stuff. I the most the thing that's most misunderstood. I think is people who want to cast me in a particular mold because it fits their ideological bent, right? Or they would like to take my work or take like little snippets of, like Andrew Tate was talking about, you know, take a 30 second snippet and sure. they want to make that the whole, the sum whole. They we're gonna dismiss you because of this one 30 second thing. Uh, the same thing kind of happened to uh, Myron and Fresh when they were doing that interview with uh, DJ Academics and, uh, and Brittany Renner. Uh, a minute and a half uh, short is all anybody cares because they just want to see people get their comeuppance. And um, I think that's kind of tragic right now because we live in the TLDR generation, the TikTok generation, where we're used to a 45 second clip and that is, becomes the sum total of whoever that person is. I have 20 years doing this. I have mm. five books. So when people go and they go, Rolo, you don't have any receipts. Show me the hot bitches you're for. Rolo Tomasi don't get no hoes, man. You know, like, yeah, I, that's one of my intros. And, and um, like, so when I hear that stuff, I have to laugh. I have to own it now because I have to laugh at that. They, so show me your receipts. Show me your receipts. Okay, well, my receipts are, uh, let's see, I've got a 40 plus notch count. I, I have been in, uh, I was in the metal scene of the late, in late 80s, early what? 90s. I've, I've got all of the, I've got a, a lifetime worth of receipts. I've got five books that are receipts. I've been in this for 20 years as receipts. And it's like, show me the hot bitch with the big titties. So, so here's, <laughs> here's the issue, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I do have a few of them and uh, those girls. And uh, I will tell you that if you were saying something that was incorrect academically or, or empirically, like myself or Justin Waller would tell you it was wrong. But mm -hmm. it's not. The thing is, at some point, the, high, the, the, the scientific method does not work. Here's my hypothesis. Let's prove my hypothesis. The scientific method is, here's my hypothesis. Now disprove my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So what should happen is somebody should read the, the rational mail and say, well, and then I put mm -hmm. this into practice and then I had terrible, deleterious results. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why. Like, I don't care that you've been married 26 years. It doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. But like, that's the, that's the reason why. But if mm -hmm. you were saying something that was empirically untrue, I would know. Right. I, trust me, bro. I would tell you, and it's mm -hmm. not. I well, not I usually, I usually get into like people will always say, "Rolo, you need to debate Destiny. You need to debate Ruslan. You need to debate this guy or that guy or whoever else." And I'm like, "Okay, well, what are we going to debate about? If you're going to sick, if you want me to come on your show or you want me to do something, you, we're going to talk about whether I'm a good guy or a bad guy. That's not a debate. That's a that's opinion. That's belief, right? So what you're saying makes you an evil person. I don't have, like." Is what I say true? Did, like, where am I wrong? Oh, you got long hair and a ponytail. Where am I wrong? You know, where am I? Get, I the, the scientific method. Show me what, where, show me yeah. what, show me. Okay, so, oh, here, okay. So here's what, what really throws me off is this. When you do algebra, when you do calculus, mm -hmm. when you do trigonometry, it's not enough to get the right answer. You have to show your work. 
Yes. Right. You can't. You can't just because you could just easily just say, oh, it "Looks like this is it right here." You could just stumble into the right answer. But the teacher wants to show, "How did you work this formula out? Show me your work." I go to the point where I go and I show the work, I show the studies, I show my route. This is how I got from point A to point B. And this is why I say men and women can't be friends. This is why I say the alpha widow is a thing. This is why I say war brides, right? But all they hear and all they see is the answer. All they see is the, 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 and they disagree with the answer, right? War brides, this soulmate, that, what, you know, all these things that I've been known for over the years, but they never check the work. They never go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what the fuck this guy is actually talking about. Because when they do, then suddenly they go, okay, maybe he's got a point, right? And so it's usually ignorance. And I can excuse stupidity. There's a difference between stupidity and ignorance, okay? There are a lot of people who are, are very smart people, but they're, very, they're ignorant because they simply don't know the fact. I'm ignorant of a lot of things, right? I'm a very smart guy, but I'm ignorant of certain things. The difference is I don't go popping off about things I don't know about, right? right? And then there's stupidity, which means you just simply don't have the mental you know, faculties to process, the, you know, understand what, what, what we're even talking about in the first place. I can excuse stupidity because you don't have the, the, the raw material to work out the problem. What I can excuse is ignorance, especially when you're trying to make a buck off of your, your confident ignorance about what you think I have said over the course of 20 fucking years yeah. that I know is empirically false and is statistically, factually, and even if you watch my show, false because I've never said these things or I have said other things. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. That's crazy. Yeah, I get this a lot when I, when I post statistics. Mm-hmm. I'll get to these guys in the comments, stop trying to push your ideology on other people, and I'm like, you don't understand what statistics means. I'm not pushing my ideology on you. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's an issue. I, I, that, that's the thing. Like, what I want to do different, what I wanted to do with this show is mm-hmm. I don't want to have arbitrary arguments where at the end we, Feels before we, we, we feel mm-hmm. good about what I said. It should, the ends of my show should feel fucking uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You should have learned something that bothers you a great deal. And that means you probably got some truth. And I probably mm-hmm. won't grow, my, my YouTube probably won't grow that fast. But mm-hmm. I'm, I would way, way rather, because I, some uh, of these questions I have, have a, answers. I have a, uh, uh, this is actually God Sod, and I kind of, mm-hmm. I stole this from God Sod. Sorry, God. I have an, uh, an obligation to objective truth. There you go. And that's what, that's what he would say. I think he said that to Rugged, so fuck your feelings. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that episode. Um, you said something interesting to me when we were at barbecue. And you said, I can say there's an 80% chance of rain tomorrow. And if it doesn't rain, that doesn't mean that I was wrong. It means that there actually was an 80% chance of rain. Correct. But it didn't rain. It just happened to be the 20% this time, and it didn't actually rain. So that, that, I wasn't wrong when I said that. Empirically, yeah. everything I said was 100%, but the outcome might have not have been what that, was yeah, predicted. That's one thing we had to do when Dr. Buss was on here, because he talks about whenever he makes these statements, he has to say in general. He has to say this, because that's yeah. how statistics work. People do mm-hmm. not know how to... Most people, especially on the on social media, if you have a, a, a shorter attention span, you have a binary type of thinking instead of a nuanced way of and thinking. And that's part of the TLDR generation. Correct. They want to make a decision and move on to the next Correct, clip. correct. So if I say something and you're like, oh, no, I found this man and everything you said was wrong and I do porn and uh, he accepts me for the way that I am. And I'm like, okay, that's awesome. You are outside of two standard deviations. Mm-hmm. I do, I, by the way, I'm not mad at you. You didn't prove me wrong. You uh, just you proved the statistics are correct. You asked me about uh, Michaela Peterson in that that whole situation. And there yep. was a time, I think I was on, a, I was on with Fresh and Fit and I, I mentioned this. I said, look, at the end of that, like she, t- she oh no, she was on Fresh and Fit and she was was asked like, what, what was it like to go on with Rolo Tomasi kind of thing? And she's like, well, you know, we talked about these things. It's just some wishy-washy bullshit. But at the end of the, at the end of the thing, she was like, but I didn't really feel, I didn't get a good feeling with Rolo afterwards. Yeah. Like after the thing, I'm like, good, good. Uh, and I, I thought about that and I'm like, was that the function? Was that the purpose? Were you hoping to feel good and have some good warm, fuzzy moment afterwards? I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just trying to like educate. I'm trying to give tools. I'm trying to like equip you with information. Sometimes that information is not going to make you feel good at the end of that goddamn thing but if your if your point is if your purpose is to feel good afterwards you're not going to like an interview with me yeah if you guys are if you guys are watching this and you want to run a seven or eight figure business if you want a happy relationship if you want a happy marriage uh if you want to have kids and and have them grow up healthy uh if you want to live a healthy life and and be incredibly fit fuck your feelings (laughs) fuck your feelings 
there is objective truths on how to accomplish those things. And if you work on those objective truths, that is the way you're going to find success. And for those of you who have not found success, if I give you a technique or Robert Kiyosaki gives you a technique, or you read something from Gail, Dale Carnegie, or if you read something from, uh, from you know, whoever, from Brad Lee or listen to Rolo Tomasi, by definition, if you have not had success and I tell you to do a thing, by definition, it's not going to feel comfortable. It's going to feel awkward. Success is going to feel awkward if you have not been successful, always. Mm -hmm. In every instance, when I take, when you don't do bench press and I take you to do bench press, your chest is gonna hurt like a motherfucker the next day because it is awkward. Success is always going to feel awkward. Mm -hmm. So once, one more time, I love you all. Fuck your feelings. Your the feelings. Truth, the truth will set you free, there but you it does not absolve you of the responsibility of knowing that truth. It does not absolve, it's not gonna feel good. It's a, the truth is not always, it's setting you free, but it may not be, it may not taste good. It may not be some, it, you have a responsibility to that truth once you have it. And sometimes that would, sometimes that's more than most people can really handle. Beautiful. Four hours and five minutes. It's, wow. the, new, it's the new record. Is this the new record, Chase? That's for a, me, yeah. That's, it, a, that's it, average for sound, me. <laughs> I, think, I think with the Flat Earthers, that's a you've had gone yeah, five, six hours. Yeah, no, no. Flat Earthers was 348. <laughs> this is four. This is, we're at 406. Hey, awesome. we're going to do this again. For sure, for yes. sure. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be doing a lot of things together uh, soon. I do have a plan on going on Fresh and Fit later on this year. Mm -hmm. uh, def de definitely plan on doing more stuff with you. Mm -hmm. Justin and I have become like BFFs. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I, he's Louisiana and I'm Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, so we definitely going to do stuff like that. I have, hopefully I have Tristan Tate coming on at the end of this month. Excellent. Uh, I've been talking to Sterling Cooper, a bunch of people like that. And I'm going to tell you something else. I have some feminists that are coming on that I'm friends with, That's that I love. People that I care about deeply in my life. I don't have to agree with everything they say. And I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to ask that they be canceled or that anything that they say be subdued. And I will always give them an opportunity on this show to expound their point of view. And I will always listen to what they have to say with respect. And I hope that the rest of you feel the same way. But if you don't, and you're part of council culture, you're not going to want to debate me. You're just going to cancel me. And I will tell you you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, guys, thank you so much uh, for checking us out. Once again, man, I thank you for the 100,000 downloads on Spotify. Yeah. And, um, and, on, uh, and on Spotify and on, on Apple. Thank you guys for the millions of impressions that we've been getting on Instagram. Obviously, Instagram has been growing the biggest like with yeah. the impressions and TikTok. I thought that my podcast was going to be, I thought that my it, social media was going to promote my podcast. Bro, it's the opposite. Yeah, my, yeah. my podcast yes. has been promoting my the mm -hmm. clips on my social media yep. have been what's growing the biggest. So I want to say thank you. The opportunity to to in interview some of my favorite authors has been just absolutely incredible. Some of my favorite musical artists are going to be coming on the show. So I, I cannot express to you guys enough how grateful I am. Man, even if you disagree with me, I'm still grateful that you guys at least watch and know who I am and talk shit about me on YouTube. By the way, I, I meant to tell you this mm -hmm. uh, what you, with the haters. Mm -hmm. It's oh, really, yeah, let's it's, do that. It's, it's really unhe <laughs> unhealthy that I do this. Mm -hmm. Before I go to the gym every day, mm -hmm. I go on my YouTube <laughs> and I go on Telegram and, good, and I look for people who talk shit oh. about me and I just go hard on them, bro. I am mm -hmm. bad. I was, listen, I grew up in East, I may look like this. I grew up in East Dallas. Mm -hmm. I will talk bad about that. And I get so fucking amped and then I go to the then gym. Go to the gym I, I got to stop doing very, the energy. very yes. unhealthy uh, thing that I do. Anyway, guys, yeah. thank you so much for checking us out. We will, you will be seeing definitely more Rolo Rolo. Where, where yeah. can we find you? Uh, of course, you can find me on the channel you're watching right now um, and on uh, this channel, all channels. Uh, and also, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I, of course, have my show, which, by the way, I'll still be doing my Sunday show. Uh, it's uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, which I do in Reno, Nevada. And um, I'll be making a lot more trips down here in, in the immediate future. We've been working on some stuff together, and I've got some, uh, got some plans with Miguel as well. So we got, there's big things afoot right now. I definitely want to come down for the, the when you get Tate down here. Beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, I was just going to say, as uh, uh, let, I think that's it. I, oh, I'm also doing video work with uh, Kevin Savo right now. So. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, one more time, because he's got five books. I would recommend you check them out. It'll definitely re read mm -hmm. the first book. It was definitely paradigm shifting for me. So it was something, mm -hmm. it was actually one of these things where I had seen these truths when I worked at a gentleman's club and then mm -hmm. I'd never seen anybody write it down like that. It's and available I, on Amazon. Yeah, Go yeah. To, oh, and also, I also uh, have an NFT. It's the Red Pill Lions NFT right Beautiful. now where we take the funds and the money from that and we fund things like uh, independent films and documentaries that are Red Pill oriented. It's called Red Pill Lions. I love it. I love it, man. Thank you guys so much for checking us out, and we will see you all next week.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>